The Dark Cosmos presents The Last Man, Volume 2, written by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. This classic apocalyptic slash dystopian tale was first published in 1826. Sit back, relax, and unwind for the next few hours with this classic sci-fi story that features a protagonist that faces an existential struggle to find meaning in a desolate world. As hope dwindles, the question lingers, will he be the last man standing? Are you ready, dear cosmonauts? Let's continue our journey. Chapter 1 During this voyage, when on calm evenings we conversed on deck, watching the glancing of the waves and the changeful appearances of the sky, I discovered the total revolution that the disasters of Raymond had wrought in the mind of my sister. Were they the same waters of love, which, lately cold and cutting as ice, repelling as that, now loosened from their frozen chains, flowed through the regions of her soul in gushing and grateful exuberance? She did not believe that he was dead, but she knew that he was in danger, and the hope of assisting in his liberation, and the idea of soothing by tenderness the ills that he might have undergone, elevated and harmonized the late jarring element of her being. I was not so sanguine as she as to the result of our voyage. She was not sanguine, but secure, and the expectation of seeing the lover she had banished, the husband, friend, heart's companion from whom she had long been alienated, wrapped her senses in delight, her mind in placidity. It was beginning life again. It was leaving barren sands for an abode of fertile beauty. It was a harbor after a tempest, an opiate after sleepless nights, a happy waking from a terrible dream. Little Clara accompanied us. The poor child did not well understand what was going forward. She heard that we were bound for Greece, that she would see her father, and now, for the first time, she prattled of him to her mother. On landing at Athens, we found difficulties increase upon us, nor could the storied earth or balmy atmosphere inspire us with enthusiasm or pleasure while the fate of Raymond was in jeopardy. No man had ever excited so strong an interest in the public mind. This was apparent even among the phlegmatic English, from whom he had long been absent. The Athenians had expected their hero to return in triumph. The women had taught their children to lisp his name joined to thanksgiving. His manly beauty, his courage, his devotion to their cause made him appear in their eyes almost as one of the ancient deities of the soil descended from their native Olympus to defend them. When they spoke of his probable death and certain captivity, tears streamed from their eyes. Even as the women of Syria sorrowed for Adonis, did the wives and mothers of Greece lament our English raiment, Athens was a city of mourning. All these shoes of despair struck Perdita with affright. With that sanguine but confused expectation which desire engendered while she was at a distance from reality, she had formed an image in her mind of instantaneous change when she should set her foot on Grecian shores. She fancied that Raymond would already be free, and that her tender attentions would come to entirely obliterate even the memory of his mischance. But his fate was still uncertain. She began to fear the worst, and to feel that her soul's hope was cast on a chance that might prove a blank. The wife and lovely child of Lord Raymond became objects of intense interest in Athens. The gates of their abode were besieged, audible prayers were breathed for his restoration. All these circumstances added to the dismay and fears of Perdita. My exertions were unremitted. After a time I left Athens and joined the army stationed at Kishan in Thrace. Bribery, threats and intrigue soon discovered the secret that Raymond was alive, a prisoner, suffering the most rigorous confinement and wanton cruelties. We put in movement every impulse of policy and money to redeem him from their hands. The impatience of my sister's disposition now returned on her, awakened by repentance, sharpened by remorse. The very beauty of the Grecian climate, during the season of spring, added torture to her sensations. The unexampled loveliness of the flower-clad earth, the genial sunshine and grateful shade, the melody of the birds, the majesty of the woods, the splendor of the marble ruins, 
the clear effulgence of the stars by night, the combination of all that was exciting and voluptuous in this transcending land, by inspiring a quicker spirit of life and an added sensitiveness to every articulation of her frame, only gave edge to the poignancy of her grief. Each long hour was counted, and he suffers was the burthen of all her thought. She abstained from food, she lay on the bare earth, and by such mimicry of his enforced torments, endeavoured to hold communion with his distant pain. I remembered in one of her harshest moments a quotation of mine had roused her to anger and disdain. Perdita, I had said, some day you will discover that you have done wrong in again casting Raymond on the thorns of life. When disappointment has sullied his beauty, when a soldier's hardships have bent his manly form, and loneliness made even triumph bitter to him, then you will repent, and regret for the irreparable change will move in hearts all rocky now the late remorse of love. The stinging remorse of love now pierced her heart. She accused herself of his journey to Greece, his dangers, his imprisonment. She pictured to herself the anguish of his solitude. She remembered with what eager delight he had in former days made her the partner of his joyful hopes, with what grateful affection he received her sympathy in his cares. She called to mind how often he had declared that solitude was to him the greatest of all evils, and how death itself was to him more full of fear and pain when he pictured to himself a lonely grave. My best girl, he had said, relieves me from these fantasies. United to her, cherished in her dear heart, never again shall I know the misery of finding myself alone. Even if I die before you, my Perdita, treasure up my ashes till yours may mingle with mine. It is a foolish sentiment for one who is not a materialist, yet, methinks, even in that dark cell, I may feel that my inanimate dust mingles with yours, and thus, have a companion in decay. In her resentful mood, these expressions had been remembered with acrimony and disdain. They visited her in her softened hour, taking sleep from her eyes, all hope of rest from her uneasy mind. Two months passed thus, when at last we obtained a promise of Raymond's release. Confinement and hardship had undermined his health. The Turks feared an accomplishment of the threats of the English government if he died under their hands. They looked upon his recovery as impossible. They delivered him up as a dying man, willingly making over to us the rites of burial. He came by sea from Constantinople to Athens. The wind, favourable to him, blew so strongly in shore that we were unable, as we had at first intended, to meet him on his watery road. The watchtower of Athens was besieged by inquirers, each sail eagerly looked out for, till on the 1st of May the gallant frigate bore in sight, freighted with treasure more invaluable than the wealth which, piloted from Mexico, the vexed Pacific swallowed, or that was conveyed over its tranquil bosom to enrich the crown of Spain. At early dawn the vessel was discovered bearing in shore. It was conjectured that it would cast anchor about five miles from land. The news spread through Athens, and the whole city poured out at the gate of the Piraeus, down the roads, through the vineyards, the olive woods and plantations of fig trees, towards the harbour. The noisy joy of the populace, the gaudy colours of their dress, the tumult of carriages and horses, the march of soldiers intermixed, the waving of banners and sound of martial music added to the high excitement of the scene. While round us reposed in solemn majesty the relics of antient time. To our right the Acropolis rose high, spectatress of a thousand changes, of ancient glory, Turkish slavery, and the restoration of dear-bought liberty. Tombs and cenotaphs were strewed thick around, adorned by ever-renewing vegetation. The mighty dead hovered over their monuments and beheld in our enthusiasm and congregated numbers a renewal of the scenes in which they had been the actors. Perdita and Clara rode in a close carriage. I attended them on horseback. At length we arrived at the harbour. It was agitated by the outward swell of the sea. 
The beach, as far could be discerned, was covered by a moving multitude, which, urged by those behind toward the sea, again rushed back as the heavy waves with sullen roar burst close to them. I applied my glass and could discern that the frigate had already cast anchor, fearful of the danger of approaching nearer to a lee shore. A boat was lowered. With a pang I saw that Raymond was unable to descend the vessel's side. He was let down in a chair and lay wrapped in cloaks at the bottom of the boat. I dismounted and called to some sailors who were rowing about the harbour to pull up and take me into their skiff. Perdita at the same moment alighted from her carriage. She seized my arm. Take me with you, she cried. She was trembling and pale. Clara clung to her. You must not, I said. The sea is rough. He will soon be here. Do you not see his boat? The little bark to which I had beckoned had now pulled up. Before I could stop her, Perdita, assisted by the sailors, was in it. Clara followed her mother. A loud shout echoed from the crowd as we pulled out of the inner harbour, while my sister at the prow had caught hold of one of the men who was using a glass, asking a thousand questions, careless of the spray that broke over her, deaf, sightless to all, except the little speck that, just visible on the top of the waves, evidently neared. We approached with all the speed six rowers could give. The orderly and picturesque dress of the soldiers on the beach, the sounds of exulting music, the stirring breeze and waving flags, the unchecked exclamations of the eager crowd, whose dark looks and foreign garb were purely eastern, the sight of temple-crowned rock, the white marble of the buildings glittering in the sun and standing in bright relief against the dark ridge of lofty mountains beyond, the near roar of the sea, the splash of oars and dash of spray all steeped my soul in a delirium, unfelt, unimagined in the common course of common life. Trembling, I was unable to continue to look through the glass with which I had watched the motion of the crew when the frigate's boat had first been launched. We rapidly drew near, so that at length the number and forms of those within could be discerned. Its dark sides grew big, and the splash of its oars became audible. I could distinguish the languid form of my friend as he half raised himself at our approach. Perdita's questions had ceased. She leaned on my arm, panting with emotions too acute for tears. Our men pulled alongside the other boat. As a last effort, my sister mustered her strength, her firmness. She stepped from one boat to the other, and then with a shriek she sprang towards Raymond, knelt at his side, and gluing her lips to the hand she seized, her face shrouded by her long hair, gave herself up to tears. Raymond had somewhat raised himself at our approach, but it was with difficulty that he exerted himself even thus much. With sunken cheek and hollow eyes, pale and gaunt, how could I recognize the beloved of Perdita? I continued awe-struck and mute. He looked smilingly on the poor girl. The smile was his. A day of sunshine falling on a dark valley displays its before hidden characteristics. And now this smile, the same with which he first spoke, love to Perdita, with which he had welcomed the protectorate, playing on his altered countenance, made me in my heart's core feel that this was Raymond. He stretched out to me his other hand. I discerned the trace of manacles on his bared wrist. I heard my sister's sobs and thought, Happy are women who can weep, and in a passionate caress disburthen the oppression of their feelings. Shame and habitual restraint hold back a man. I would have given worlds to have acted as in days of boyhood, have strained him to my breast, pressed his hand to my lips, and wept over him. My swelling heart choked me. The natural current would not be checked. The big rebellious tears gathered in my eyes. I turned aside and they dropped in the sea. They came fast and faster. Yet I could hardly be ashamed, for I saw that the rough sailors were not unmoved, and Raymond's eyes alone were dry from among our crew. He lay in that blessed calm which convalescence always induces, enjoying in secure tranquility his liberty and reunion with her whom he adored. Perdita at length subdued her burst of passion and rose. She looked round for Clara. 
The child, frightened, not recognizing her father and neglected by us, had crept to the other end of the boat. She came at her mother's call. Perdita presented her to Raymond. Her first words were, Beloved, embrace our child. Come hither, sweet one, said her father. Do you not know me? She knew his voice and cast herself in his arms with half bashful but uncontrollable emotion. Perceiving the weakness of Raymond, I was afraid of ill consequences from the pressure of the crowd on his landing. But they were awed as I had been at the change of his appearance. The music died away, the shouts abruptly ended, the soldiers had cleared a space in which a carriage was drawn up. He was placed in it. Perdita and Clara entered with him, and his escort closed round it. A hollow murmur, akin to the roaring of the near waves, went through the multitude. They fell back as the carriage advanced, and fearful of injuring him. They had come to welcome. By loud testimonies of joy, they satisfied themselves with bending in a low salaam as the carriage passed. It went slowly along the road of the Piraeus, passed by antique temple and heroic tomb beneath the craggy rock of the citadel. The sound of the waves was left behind, that of the multitude continued at intervals, suppressed and hoarse, and though in the city the houses, churches and public buildings were decorated with tapestry and banners, though the soldiery lined the streets and the inhabitants in thousands were assembled to give him hail, the same solemn silence prevailed, the soldiery presented arms, the banners veiled. Many a white hand waved a streamer and vainly sought to discern the hero in the vehicle, which, closed and encompassed by the city guards, drew him to the palace allotted for his abode. Raymond was weak and exhausted, yet the interest he perceived to be excited on his account filled him with proud pleasure. He was nearly killed with kindness. It is true, the populace retained themselves, but there arose a perpetual hum and bustle from the throng round the palace, which added to the noise of fireworks, the frequent explosion of arms, the tramp to and fro of horsemen and carriages, to which effervescence he was the focus, retarded his recovery. So we retired a while to Eleusis, and here rest and tender care added each day to the strength of our invalid. The zealous attention of Perdita claimed the first rank in the causes which induced his rapid recovery, but the second was surely the delight he felt in the affection and goodwill of the Greeks. We are said to love much those whom we greatly benefit. Raymond had fought and conquered for the Athenians. He had suffered on their account peril, imprisonment and hardship. Their gratitude affected him deeply and he inly vowed to unite his fate forever to that of a people so enthusiastically devoted to him. Social feeling and sympathy constituted a marked feature in my disposition. In early youth, the living drama acted around me, drew me heart and soul into its vortex. I was now conscious of a change. I loved, I hoped, I enjoyed, but there was something besides this. I was inquisitive as to the internal principles of action of those around me, anxious to read their thoughts justly and forever occupied in divining their inmost mind. All events, at the same time that they deeply interested me, arranged themselves in pictures before me. I gave the right place to every personage in the group, the just balance to every sentiment. This undercurrent of thought often soothed me amidst distress and even agony. It gave ideality to that, from which, taken in naked truth, the soul would have revolted. It bestowed pictorial colors on misery and disease, and not unfrequently relieved me from despair in deplorable changes. This faculty, or instinct, was now roused. I watched the reawakened devotion of my sister, Clara's timid but concentrated admiration of her father, and Raymond's appetite for renown, and sensitiveness to the demonstrations of affection of the Athenians. Attentively perusing this animated volume, I was the less surprised at the tale I read on the new turned page. The Turkish army were at this time besieging Rodosto, and the Greeks, hastening their preparations and sending each day reinforcements, were on the eve of forcing the enemy to battle. Each people looked on the coming struggle as that which would be to a great degree decisive 
as, in case of victory, the next step would be the siege of Constantinople by the Greeks. Raymond, being somewhat recovered, prepared to reassume his command in the army. Perdita did not oppose herself to his determination. She only stipulated to be permitted to accompany him. She had set down no rule of conduct for herself, but for her life she could not have opposed his slightest wish or do other than acquiesce cheerfully in all his projects. One word, in truth, had alarmed her more than battles or sieges, during which she trusted Raymond's high command would exempt him from danger. That word, as yet it was not more to her, was plague. This enemy to the human race had begun early in June to raise its serpent head on the shores of the Nile. Parts of Asia, not usually subject to this evil, were infected. It was in Constantinople, but as each year that city experienced a like visitation, small attention was paid to those accounts which declared more people to have died there already than usually made up the accustomed prey of the whole of the hotter months. However it might be, neither plague nor war could prevent Perdita from following her lord or induce her to utter one objection to the plans which he proposed. To be near him, to be loved by him, to feel him again her own was the limit of her desires. The object of her life was to do him pleasure. It had been so before, but with a difference. In past times, without thought or foresight, she had made him happy, being so herself, and in any question of choice, consulted her own wishes as being one with his. Now she sedulously put herself out of the question, sacrificing even her anxiety for his health and welfare to her resolve not to oppose any of his desires. Love of the Greek people, appetite for glory, and hatred of the barbarian government under which he had suffered even to the approach of death stimulated him. He wished to repay the kindness of the Athenians, to keep alive the splendid associations connected with his name, and to eradicate from Europe a power which, while every other nation advanced in civilization, stood still, a monument of antique barbarism. Having effected the reunion of Raymond and Perdita, I was eager to return to England. But his earnest request added to awakening curiosity and an indefinable anxiety to behold the catastrophe now apparently at hand in the long-drawn history of Grecian and Turkish warfare induced me to consent to prolong until the autumn, the period of my residence in Greece. As soon as the health of Raymond was sufficiently re-established, he prepared to join the Grecian camp near Kishan, a town of some importance, situated to the east of the Hebrus, in which Perdita and Clara were to remain until the event of the expected battle. We quitted Athens on the 2nd of June. Raymond had recovered from the gaunt and pallid looks of fever. If I no longer saw the fresh glow of youth on his matured countenance, if care had besieged his brow, and dug deep trenches in his beauty's field, if his hair, slightly mingled with grey, and his look, considerate even in its eagerness, gave signs of added years and past sufferings, yet there was something irresistibly affecting in the sight of one, lately snatched from the grave, renewing his career, untamed by sickness or disaster. The Athenians saw in him not as heretofore, the heroic boy or desperate man who was ready to die for them, but the prudent commander who for their sakes was careful of his life and could make his own warrior propensities second to the scheme of conduct policy might point out. All Athens accompanied us for several miles. When he had landed a month ago, the noisy populace had been hushed by sorrow and fear, but this was a festival day to all. The air resounded with their shouts. Their picturesque costume and the gay colours of which it was composed flaunted in the sunshine. Their eager gestures and rapid utterance accorded with their wild appearance. Raymond was the theme of every tongue, the hope of each wife, mother or betrothed bride, whose husband, child or lover, making a part of the Greek army, were to be conducted to victory by him. Notwithstanding the hazardous object of our journey, it was full of romantic interest as we passed through the valleys and over the hills of this divine country. Raymond was inspirited by the intense sensations of recovered health. 
He felt that in being general of the Athenians, he filled a post worthy of his ambition. And, in his hope of the conquest of Constantinople, he counted on an event which would be as a landmark in the waste of ages, an exploit unequalled in the annals of man. When a city of grand historic association, the beauty of whose site was the wonder of the world, which for many hundred years had been the stronghold of the Moslems, should be rescued from slavery and barbarism, and restored to a people illustrious for genius, civilization, and a spirit of liberty, Perdita rested on his restored society, on his love, his hopes and fame, even as a Sybarite on a luxurious couch. Every thought was transport, each emotion bathed, as it were, in a congenial and balmy element. We arrived at Kaishan on the 7th of July. The weather during our journey had been serene. Each day, before dawn, we left our night's encampment, and watched the shadows as they retreated from hill and valley and the golden splendor of the sun's approach. The accompanying soldiers received, with national vivacity, enthusiastic pleasure from the sight of beautiful nature. The uprising of the star of day was hailed by triumphant strains, while the birds, heard by snatches, filled up the intervals of the music. At noon, we pitched our tents in some shady valley or embowering wood among the mountains, while a stream prattling over pebbles induced grateful sleep. Our evening march, more calm, was yet more delightful than the morning restlessness of spirit. If the band played, involuntarily they chose airs of moderated passion. The farewell of love, or lament at absence, was followed and closed by some solemn hymn, which harmonized with the tranquil loveliness of evening, and elevated the soul to grand and religious thought. Often all sounds were suspended, that we might listen to the nightingale, while the fireflies danced in bright measure, and the soft cooing of the Aziolo spoke of fair weather to the travellers. Did we pass a valley? Soft shades encompassed us, and rocks tinged with beauteous hues. If we traversed a mountain, Greece, a living map, was spread beneath her renowned pinnacles cleaving the ether, her rivers threading in silver line the fertile land. Afraid almost to breathe, we English travellers surveyed with ecstasy this splendid landscape, so different from the sober hues and melancholy graces of our native scenery. When we quitted Macedonia, the fertile but low plains of Thrace afforded fewer beauties, yet our journey continued to be interesting. An advanced guard gave information of our approach, and the country people were quickly in motion to do honour to Lord Raymond. The villages were decorated by triumphal arches of greenery by day and lamps by night. Tapestry waved from the windows, the ground was strewed with flowers, and the name of Raymond, joined to that of Greece, was echoed in the vive of the peasant crowd. When we arrived at Kishan, we learnt that on hearing of the advance of Lord Raymond and his detachment, the Turkish army had retreated from Rodosto, but meeting with a reinforcement, they had retrod their steps. In the meantime, Argyropilo, the Greek commander-in-chief, had advanced so as to be between the Turks and Rodosto. A battle, it was said, was inevitable. Perdita and her child were to remain at Kishan. Raymond asked me if I would not continue with them, now by the fells of Cumberland, I cried, by all of the vagabond and poacher that appertains to me, I will stand at your side, draw my sword in the Greek cause, and be hailed as a victor along with you. All the plain, from Kishan to Rodosto, a distance of sixteen leagues, was alive with troops, or with the camp followers, all in motion at the approach of a battle. The small garrisons were drawn from the various towns and fortresses, and went to swell the main army. We met baggage wagons, and many females of high and low rank returning to Ferry or Kishan, there to wait the issue of the expected day. When we arrived at Rodosto, we found that the field had been taken, and the scheme of the battle arranged. The sound of firing early on the following morning informed us that advance posts of the armies were engaged. Regiment after regiment advanced, their colours flying and bands playing. 
They planted the cannon on the tumuli, sole elevations in this level country, and formed themselves into column and hollow square, while the pioneers threw up small mounds for their protection. These, then, were the preparations for a battle, nay, the battle itself, far different from anything the imagination had pictured. We read of centre and wing in Greek and Roman history. We fancy a spot, plain as a table, and soldiers small as chessmen, and drawn forth so that the most ignorant of the game can discover science and order in the disposition of the forces. When I came to the reality and saw regiments file off to the left far out of sight, fields intervening between the battalions, but a few troops sufficiently near me to observe their motions, I gave up all idea of understanding, even of seeing a battle, but attaching myself to Raymond attended with intense interest to his actions. He shewed himself collected, gallant and imperial. His commands were prompt, his intuition of the events of the day to me miraculous. In the meantime the cannon roared, the music lifted up its enlivening voice at intervals, and we on the highest of the mounds I mentioned, too far off to observe the fallen sheaves which death gathered into his storehouse, beheld the regiments, now lost in smoke, now banners and staves peering above the cloud, while shout and clamour drowned every sound. Early in the day, Argyropilo was wounded dangerously, and Raymond assumed the command of the whole army. He made few remarks till, on observing through his glass the sequel of an order he had given, his face, clouded for a while with doubt, became radiant. The day is ours, he cried. The Turks fly from the bayonet. And then swiftly, he dispatched his aide-de-camp to command the horse to fall on the routed enemy. The defeat became total. The cannon ceased to roar. The infantry rallied, and horse pursued the flying Turks along the dreary plain. The staff of Raymond was dispersed in various directions to make observations and bear commands. Even I was dispatched to a distant part of the field. The ground on which the battle was fought was a level plain, so level that from the tumula you saw the waving line of mountains on the wide-stretched horizon. Yet the intervening space was unvaried by the least irregularity, save such undulations as resembled the waves of the sea. The whole of this part of Thrace had been so long a scene of contest that it had remained uncultivated and presented a dreary, barren appearance. The order I had received was to make an observation of the direction which a detachment of the enemy might have taken from a northern tumulus. The whole Turkish army, followed by the Greek, had poured eastward. None but the dead remained in the direction of my side. From the top of the mound I looked far round. All was silent and deserted. The last beams of the nearly sunken sun shot up from behind the far summit of Mount Athos. The Sea of Marmara still glittered beneath its rays, while the Asiatic coast beyond was half hid in a haze of low cloud. Many a cask and bayonet and sword, fallen from unnerved arms, reflected the departing ray. They lay scattered far and near. From the east, a band of ravens, old inhabitants of the Turkish cemeteries, came sailing along towards their harvest. The sun disappeared. This hour, melancholy yet sweet, has always seemed to me the time when we are most naturally led to commune with higher powers. Our mortal sternness departs, and gentle complacency invests the soul. But now, in the midst of the dying and the dead, how could a thought of heaven or a sensation of tranquility possess one of the murderers? During the busy day, my mind had yielded itself a willing slave to the state of things presented to it by its fellow beings. Historical association, hatred of the foe, and military enthusiasm had held dominion over me. Now I looked on the evening star, as softly and calmly it hung pendulous in the orange hues of sunset. I turned to the coarse-strewn earth and felt ashamed of my species. So perhaps were the placid skies, for they quickly veiled themselves in mist, and in this change assisted the swift disappearance of twilight usual in the south. Heavy masses of cloud floated up from the southeast, and red and turbid lightning shot from their dark edges. The rushing wind disturbed the garments of the dead, 
and was chilled as it passed over their icy forms. Darkness gathered round. The objects about me became indistinct. I descended from my station, and with difficulty guided my horse so as to avoid the slain. Suddenly, I heard a piercing shriek. A form seemed to rise from the earth. It flew swiftly towards me, sinking to the ground again as it drew near. All this passed so suddenly that I with difficulty reined in my horse, so that it should not trample on the prostrate being. The dress of this person was that of a soldier, but the bared neck and arms, and the continued shrieks discovered a female thus disguised. I dismounted to her aid while she, with heavy groans and her hand placed on her side, resisted my attempt to lead her on. In the hurry of the moment I forgot that I was in Greece, and in my native accents endeavoured to soothe the sufferer. With wild and terrific exclamations did the lost, dying Evadna, for it was she, recognise the language of her lover. Pain and fever from her wound had deranged her intellects, while her piteous cries and feeble efforts to escape penetrated me with compassion. In wild delirium she called upon the name of Raymond. She exclaimed that I was keeping him from her, while the Turks with fearful instruments of torture were about to take his life. Then again she sadly lamented her hard fate, that a woman with a woman's heart and sensibility should be driven by hopeless love and vacant hopes to take up the trade of arms and suffer beyond the endurance of man privation, labour and pain. The while her dry, hot hand pressed mine and her brow and lips burned with consuming fire. As her strength grew less, I lifted her from the ground. Her emaciated form hung over my arm, her sunken cheek rested on my breast. In a sepulchral voice she murmured, this is the end of love, yet not the end. And frenzy lent her strength as she cast her arm up to heaven. There is the end. There we meet again. Many living deaths have I borne for thee, O Raymond, and now I expire thy victim. By my death I purchase thee. Lo, the instruments of war, fire, the plague are my servitors. I dared, I conquered them all till now. I have sold myself to death with the sole condition that thou shouldst follow me. Fire and war and plague unite for thy destruction. O oh, my Raymond, there is no safety for thee. With an heavy heart I listened to the changes of her delirium. I made her a bed of cloaks, her violence decreased, and a clammy dew stood on her brow as the paleness of death succeeded to the crimson of fever I placed her on the cloaks. She continued to rave of her speedy meeting with her beloved in the grave, of his death nigh at hand. Sometimes she solemnly declared that he was summoned. Sometimes she bewailed his hard destiny. Her voice grew feebler, her speech interrupted. A few convulsive movements and her muscles relaxed. The limbs fell, no more to be sustained. One deep sigh and life was gone. I bore her from the near neighborhood of the dead, Wrapped in cloaks, I placed her beneath a tree. Once more I looked on her altered face. The last time I saw her she was eighteen, beautiful as poet's vision, splendid as a sultana of the East. Twelve years had passed, twelve years of change, sorrow and hardship. Her brilliant complexion had become worn and dark. Her limbs had lost the roundness of youth and womanhood. Her eyes had sunk deep, crushed and o'erworn, the hours had drained her blood and filled her brow with lines and wrinkles. With shuddering horror, I veiled this monument of human passion and human misery. I heaped over her all of flags and heavy accoutrements I could find to guard her from birds and beasts of prey until I could bestow on her a fitting grave. Sadly and slowly, I stemmed my course from among the heaps of slain, and guided by the twinkling lights of the town, at length reached Rodosto. Chapter 2 On my arrival, I found that an order had already gone forth for the army to proceed immediately towards Constantinople, and the troops which had suffered least in the battle were already on their way. The town was full of tumult. The wound and consequent inability of our Gyropolo caused Raymond to be the first in command. He rode through the town, visiting the wounded, 
and giving such orders as were necessary for the siege he meditated. Early in the morning, the whole army was in motion. In the hurry, I could hardly find an opportunity to bestow the last offices on Evadna. Attended only by my servant, I dug a deep grave for her at the foot of the tree, and without disturbing her warrior shroud, I placed her in it, heaping stones upon the grave. The dazzling sun and glare of daylight deprived the scene of solemnity. From Evadne's low tomb, I joined Raymond and his staff, now on their way to the Golden City. Constantinople was invested, trenches dug and advances made. The whole Greek fleet blockaded it by sea. On land from the river Kiat Kabana, near the sweet waters, to the Tower of Marmora, on the shores of the Propontis, along the whole line of the ancient walls, the trenches of the siege were drawn. We already possessed Pera, the Golden Horn itself, the city, bastioned by the sea, and the ivy-mantled walls of the Greek emperors was all of Europe that the Mahometans could call theirs. Our army looked on her as certain prey. They counted the garrison. It was impossible that it should be relieved. Each sally was a victory, for even when the Turks were triumphant, the loss of men they sustained was an irreparable injury. I rode one morning with Raymond to the lofty mound, not far from the top Kapu, Cannon Gate, on which Mahmud planted his standard and first saw the city. Still the same lofty domes and minarets towered above the verdurous walls where Constantine had died and the Turk had entered the city. The plain around was interspersed with cemeteries, Turk, Greek and Armenian, with their growth of cypress trees, and other woods of more cheerful aspect diversified the scene. Among them, the Greek army was encamped, and their squadrons moved to and fro, now in regular march, now in swift career. Raymond's eyes were fixed on the city. I have counted the hours of her life, said he. One month, and she falls. Remain with me till then. Wait till you see the cross on St. Sophia, and then return to your peaceful glades. You then, I asked, still remain in Greece. Assuredly, replied Raymond. Yet, Lionel, when I say this, believe me I look back with regret to our tranquil life at Windsor. I am but half a soldier, I love the renown, but not the trade of war. Before the Battle of Rodosto I was full of hope and spirit. To conquer there, and afterwards to take Constantinople, was the hope, the born, the fulfilment of my ambition. This enthusiasm is now spent, I know not why. I seem to myself to be entering a darksome gulf. The ardent spirit of the army is irksome to me, the rapture of triumph null. He paused and was lost in thought. His serious mien recalled, by some association, the half-forgotten Evadna to my mind, and I seized this opportunity to make inquiries from him concerning her strange lot. I asked him if he had ever seen among the troops anyone resembling her, if since he had returned to Greece he had heard of her. He started at her name. He looked uneasily on me. Even so, he cried, I knew you would speak of her. Long, long I had forgotten her. Since our encampment here, she daily, hourly visits my thoughts. When I'm addressed, her name is the sound I expect. In every communication, I imagine that she will form a part. At length, you have broken the spell. Tell me what you know of her. I related my meeting with her. The story of her death was told and retold. With painful earnestness, he questioned me concerning her prophecies with regard to him. I treated them as the ravings of a maniac. No, no, he said. Do not deceive yourself. Me, you cannot. She has said nothing but what I knew before, though this is confirmation. Fire, the sword, and plague, they may all be found in yonder city. On my head alone may they fall. From this day, Raymond's melancholy increased. He secluded himself as much as the duties of his station permitted. When in company, sadness would in spite of every effort steal over his features, and he sat absent and mute among the busy crowd that thronged about him. Perdita rejoined him, and before her he forced himself to appear cheerful, for she, even as a mirror, changed as he changed, 
and if he were silent and anxious, she solicitously inquired concerning and endeavoured to remove the cause of his seriousness. She resided at the Palace of Sweetwaters, a summer seraglio of the Sultan, the beauty of the surrounding scenery, undefiled by war, and the freshness of the river made this spot doubly delightful. Raymond felt no relief, received no pleasure from any show of heaven or earth. He often left Perdita to wander in the grounds alone, or in a light shallop he floated idly on the pure waters, musing deeply. Sometimes I joined him. At such times his countenance was invariably solemn, his air dejected. He seemed relieved on seeing me and would talk with some degree of interest on the affairs of the day. There was evidently something behind all this, yet when he appeared about to speak of that which was nearest his heart, he would abruptly turn away and with a sigh endeavour to deliver the painful idea to the winds. It had often occurred that when, as I said, Raymond quitted Perdita's drawing room, Clara came up to me and gently drawing me aside said, Papa is gone, shall we go to him? I dare say he will be glad to see you. And, as accident permitted, I complied with or refused her request. One evening a numerous assembly of Greek chieftains were gathered together in the palace. The intriguing Pali, the accomplished Karaza, the warlike Ypsilanti, were among the principal. They talked of the events of the day, the skirmish at noon, the diminished numbers of the infidels, their defeat and flight. They contemplated, after a short interval of time, the capture of the Golden City. They endeavoured to picture forth what would then happen, and spoke in lofty terms of the prosperity of Greece, when Constantinople should become its capital. The conversation then reverted to Asiatic intelligence and the ravages the plague made in its chief cities. Conjectures were hazarded as to the progress that disease might have made in the besieged city. Raymond had joined in the former part of the discussion. In lively terms he demonstrated the extremities to which Constantinople was reduced, the wasted and haggard, though ferocious, appearance of the troops. Famine and pestilence was at work for them, he observed, and the infidels would soon be obliged to take refuge in their only hope, submission. Suddenly, in the midst of his harangue, he broke off, as if stung by some painful thought. He rose uneasily, and I perceived him at length quit the hall, and through the long corridor seek the open air. He did not return, and soon Clara crept round to me, making the accustomed invitation. I consented to her request, and taking her little hand, followed Raymond. We found him just about to embark in his boat, and he readily agreed to receive us as companions. After the heats of the day, the cooling land breeze ruffled the river and filled our little sail. The city looked dark to the south, while numerous lights along the near shores and the beautiful aspect of the banks reposing in placid night, the waters keenly reflecting the heavenly lights, gave to this beauteous river a dower of loveliness that might have characterized a retreat in paradise. Our single boatman attended to the sail. Raymond steered. Clara sat at his feet, clasping his knees with her arms and laying her head on them. Raymond began the conversation somewhat abruptly. This, my friend, is probably the last time we shall have an opportunity of conversing freely. My plans are now in full operation, and my time will become more and more occupied. Besides, I wish at once to tell you my wishes and expectations, and then never again to revert to so painful a subject. First, I must thank you, Lionel, for having remained here at my request. Vanity first prompted me to ask you, vanity I call it, yet even in this I see the hand of fate. Your presence will soon be necessary. You will become the last resource of Perdita, her protector and consoler. You will take her back to Windsor. Not without you, I said. You do not mean to separate again? Do not deceive yourself, replied Raymond. The separation at hand is one over which I have no control. Most near at hand, is it? The days are already counted. May I trust you? For many days I have longed to disclose the mysterious presentiments that weigh on me, although I fear that you will ridicule them. Yet do not, my gentle friend, for all childish and unwise as they are, they have become a part of me, 
and I dare not expect to shake them off. Yet how can I expect you to sympathize with me? You are of this world, I am not. You hold forth your hand, it is even as a part of yourself, and you do not yet divide the feeling of identity from the mortal form that shapes forth Lionel. How then can you understand me? Earth is to me a tomb, the firmament a vault, shrouding mere corruption. Time is no more, for I have stepped within the threshold of eternity. Each man I meet appears a course, which will soon be deserted of its animating spark on the eve of decay and corruption. His accent was mournful, he sighed deeply. A few months ago, he continued, I was thought to be dying, but life was strong within me. My affections were human, hope and love were the day stars of my life. Now, they dream that the brows of the conqueror of the infidel faith are about to be encircled by triumphant laurel. They talk of honorable reward, of title, power and wealth. All I ask of Greece is a grave. Let them raise a mound above my lifeless body, which may stand even when the dome of St. Sophia has fallen. Wherefore do I feel thus? At Rodosto I was full of hope, but when first I saw Constantinople, that feeling, with every other joyful one, departed. The last words of Evadne were the seal upon the warrant of my death, yet I do not pretend to account for my mood by any particular event. All I can say is that it is so. The plague, I am told, is in Constantinople. Perhaps I have imbibed its effluvia. Perhaps disease is the real cause of my prognostications. It matters little why or wherefore I am affected. No power can avert the stroke, and the shadow of fate's uplifted hand already darkens me. To you, Lionel, I entrust your sister and her child. Never mention to her the fatal name of Evadna. She would doubly sorrow over the strange link that enchains me to her, making my spirit obey her dying voice, following her, as it is about to do, to the unknown country. I listened to him with wonder, but that his sad demeanour and solemn utterance assured me of the truth and intensity of his feelings, I should with light derision have attempted to dissipate his fears. Whatever I was about to reply was interrupted by the powerful emotions of Clara, Raymond had spoken, thoughtless of her presence, and she, poor child, heard with terror and faith the prophecy of his death. Her father was moved by her violent grief. He took her in his arms and soothed her, but his very soothings were solemn and fearful. Weep not, sweet child, said he, the coming death of one you have hardly known. I may die, but in death I can never forget or desert my own Clara. In after sorrow or joy, Believe that you, Father's spirit is near to save or sympathize with you. Be proud of me and cherish your infant remembrance of me. Thus, sweetest, I shall not appear to die. One thing you must promise, not to speak to anyone but your uncle of the conversation you have just overheard. When I am gone, you will console your mother and tell her that death was only bitter because it divided me from her that my last thoughts will be spent on her. But while I live, promise not to betray me, promise my child." With faltering accents, Clara promised, while she still clung to her father in a transport of sorrow. Soon we returned to shore, and I endeavoured to obviate the impression made on the child's mind by treating Raymond's fears lightly. We heard no more of them. For, as he had said, the siege, now drawing to a conclusion, became paramount in interest, engaging all his time and attention. The empire of the Mahometans in Europe was at its close. The Greek fleet blockading every port of Stamboul prevented the arrival of succor from Asia. All aggress on the side towards land had become impracticable except to such desperate sallies as reduced the numbers of the enemy without making any impression on our lines. The garrison was now so much diminished that it was evident that the city could easily have been carried by storm, but both humanity and policy dictated a slower mode of proceeding. We could hardly doubt that if pursued to the utmost, its palaces, its temples and store of wealth would be destroyed in the fury of contending triumph and defeat, 
Already the defenseless citizens had suffered through the barbarity of the Janissaries, and in time of storm, tumult and massacre, beauty, infancy and decrepitude would have alike been sacrificed to the brutal ferocity of the soldiers. Famine and blockade were certain means of conquest, and on these we founded our hopes of victory. Each day the soldiers of the garrison assaulted our advanced posts and impeded the accomplishment of our works. Fireboats were launched from the various ports, while our troops sometimes recoiled from the devoted courage of men who did not seek to live, but to sell their lives dearly. These contests were aggravated by the season. They took place during summer, when the southern Asiatic wind came laden with intolerable heat, when the streams were dried up in their shallow beds, and the vast basin of the sea appeared to glow under the unmitigated rays of the solstitial sun. Nor did night refresh the earth. Dew was denied, herbage and flowers there were none, the very trees drooped, and summer assumed the blighted appearance of winter as it went forth in silence and flame to abridge the means of sustenance to man. In vain did the eye strive to find the wreck of some northern cloud in the stainless Empyrean which might bring hope of change and moisture to the oppressive and windless atmosphere. All was serene, burning, annihilating. We the besiegers were in the comparison little affected by these evils. The woods around afforded us shade, the river secured to us a constant supply of water, nay, detachments were employed in furnishing the army with ice, which had been laid up on Hemus and Athos and the mountains of Macedonia, while cooling fruits and wholesome food renovated the strength of the labourers and made us bear with less impatience the weight of the unrefreshing air. But in the city, things wore a different face. The sun's rays were refracted from the pavement and buildings, the stoppage of the public fountains, the bad quality of the food, and scarcity even of that, produced a state of suffering which was aggravated by the scourge of disease, while the garrison arrogated every superfluity to themselves, adding by waste and riot to the necessary evils of the time. Still, they would not capitulate. Suddenly, the system of warfare was changed, we experienced no more assaults, and by night and day we continued our labours unimpeded. Stranger still, when the troops advanced near the city, the walls were vacant, and no cannon was pointed against the intruders. When these circumstances were reported to Raymond, he caused minute observations to be made as to what was doing within the walls. And when his scouts returned, reporting only the continued silence and desolation of the city, he commanded the army to be drawn out before the gates. No one appeared on the walls. The very portals, though locked and barred, seemed unguarded. Above, the many domes and glittering crescents pierced heaven. While the old walls, survivors of ages, with ivy-crowned tower and weed-tangled buttress, stood as rocks in an uninhabited waste, from within the city neither shout nor cry nor aught except the casual howling of a dog broke the noonday stillness. Even our soldiers were awed to silence, the music paused, the clang of arms was hushed. Each man asked his fellow in whispers the meaning of this sudden peace, while Raymond from an height endeavoured, by means of glasses, to discover and observe the stratagem of the enemy. No form could be discerned on the terraces of the houses. In the higher parts of the town, no moving shadow bespoke the presence of any living being. The very trees waved not, and mocked the stability of architecture with like immovability. The tramp of horses, distinctly heard in the silence, was at length discerned. It was a troop sent by Caraza, the admiral. They bore dispatches to the Lord General, the contents of these papers were important. The night before, the watch, on board one of the smaller vessels anchored near the Seraglio wall, was roused by a slight splashing as of muffled oars. The alarm was given. Twelve small boats, each containing three Janizaries, were descried endeavouring to make their way through the fleet to the opposite shore of Scutari. When they found themselves discovered, they discharged their muskets and some came to the front to cover the others, 
whose crews, exerting all their strength, endeavoured to escape with their light barks from among the dark hulls that environed them. They were in the end all sunk, and with the exception of two or three prisoners, the crews drowned. Little could be got from the survivors, but their cautious answers caused it to be surmised that several expeditions had preceded this last, and that several Turks of rank and importance had been conveyed to Asia. The men disdainfully repelled the idea of having deserted the defence of their city, and one, the youngest among them, in answer to the taunt of a sailor, exclaimed, Take it, Christian dogs! Take the palaces, the gardens, the mosques, the abode of our fathers! Take plague with them! Pestilence is the enemy we fly! If she be your friend, hug her to your bosoms! The curse of Allah is on Stambul, share ye her fate. Such was the account sent by Karaza to Raymond, but a tale full of monstrous exaggerations, though founded on this, was spread by the accompanying troop among our soldiers. A murmur arose, the city was the prey of pestilence, already had a mighty power subjugated the inhabitants, death had become lord of Constantinople. I have heard a picture described wherein all the inhabitants of earth were drawn out in fear to stand the encounter of death. The feeble and decrepit fled, the warriors retreated, though they threatened even in flight. Wolves and lions and various monsters of the desert roared against him, while the grim unreality hovered, shaking his spectral dart, a solitary but invincible assailant. Even so was it with the army of Greece. I am convinced that had the myriad troops of Asia come from over the Propontis and stood defenders of the Golden City, each and every Greek would have marched against the overwhelming numbers and have devoted himself with patriotic fury for his country. But here no hedge of bayonets opposed itself, no death-dealing artillery, no formidable array of brave soldiers, the unguarded walls afforded easy entrance, the vacant palaces luxurious dwellings, but above the dome of St. Sophia, the superstitious Greek saw pestilence and shrunk in trepidation from her influence. Raymond was actuated by far other feelings. He descended the hill with a face beaming with triumph, and pointing with his sword to the gates, commanded his troops to down with those barricades, the only obstacles now to completest victory. The soldiers answered his cheerful words with aghast and awe-struck looks. Instinctively they drew back and Raymond rode in the front of the lines. By my sword I swear, he cried, that no ambush or stratagem endangers you. The enemy is already vanquished. The pleasant places, the noble dwellings and spoil of the city are already yours. Force the gate, enter and possess the seats of your ancestors, your own inheritance. An universal shudder and fearful whispering passed through the lines. Not a soldier moved. Cowards! exclaimed their general, exasperated. Give me an hatchet. I alone will enter. I will plant your standard, and when you see it wave from yon highest minaret, you may gain courage and rally round it. One of the officers now came forward. General, he said, we neither fear the courage nor arms, the open attack nor secret ambush of the Moslems. We are ready to expose our breasts, exposed ten thousand times before, to the balls and scimitars of the infidels, and to fall gloriously for Greece. But we will not die in heaps, like dogs poisoned in summertime by the pestilential air of that city. We dare not go against the plague. A multitude of men are feeble and inert, without a voice, a leader. Give them that, and they regain the strength belonging to their numbers. Shouts from a thousand voices now rent the air. The cry of applause became universal. Raymond saw the danger. He was willing to save his troops from the crime of disobedience, for he knew that contention once begun between the commander and his army, each act and word added to the weakness of the former and bestowed power on the latter. He gave orders for the retreat to be sounded and the regiments repaired in good order to the camp. I hastened to carry the intelligence of these strange proceedings to Perdita, and we were soon joined by Raymond. He looked gloomy and perturbed. My sister was struck by my narrative. How beyond the imagination of man, 
she exclaimed, are the decrees of heaven, wondrous and inexplicable. Foolish girl, cried Raymond angrily, are you like my valiant soldiers, panic-struck? What is there inexplicable, pray tell me, in so very natural an occurrence? Does not the plague rage each year in Stamboul? What wonder that this year, when as we are told its virulence is unexampled in Asia, that it should have occasioned double havoc in that city? What wonder then, in time of siege, want, extreme heat and drought, that it should make unaccustomed ravages? Less wonder far is it that the garrison, despairing of being able to hold out longer, should take advantage of the negligence of our fleet to escape at once from siege and capture. It is not pestilence by the God that lives. It is not either plague or impending danger that makes us, like birds in harvest time, terrified by a scarecrow, abstain from the ready prey. It is base superstition. And thus, the aim of the valiant is made the shuttlecock of fools, the worthy ambition of the high-souled, the plaything of these tamed hares. But yet Stamboul shall be ours. By my past labours, by torture and imprisonment, suffered for them, by my victories, by my sword, I swear, by my hopes of fame, by my former deserts, now awaiting their reward, I deeply vow with these hands to plant the cross on yonder mosque. Dearest Raymond, interrupted Perdita in a supplicating accent. He had been walking to and fro in the marble hall of the Seraglio. His very lips were pale with rage, while, quivering, they shaped his angry words. His eyes shot fire. His gestures seemed restrained by their very vehemence. Perdita, he continued impatiently, I know what you would say. I know that you love me, that you are good and gentle. But this is no woman's work, nor can a female heart guess at the hurricane which tears me. He seemed half afraid of his own violence and suddenly quitted the hall. A look from Perdita shewed me her distress and I followed him. He was pacing the garden. His passions were in a state of inconceivable turbulence. Am I forever? he cried to be the sport of fortune. Must man, the heaven-climber, be forever the victim of the crawling reptiles of his species? Were I as you, Lionel, looking forward to many years of life, to a succession of love-enlightened days, to refined enjoyments and fresh springing hopes, I might yield, and breaking my general staff, seek repose in the glades of Windsor. But I am about to die. Nay, interrupt me not. Soon I shall die. From the many-peopled earth, from the sympathies of man, from the loved resorts of my youth, from the kindness of my friends, from the affection of my only beloved Perdita, I am about to be removed. Such is the will of fate. Such the decree of the High Ruler from whom there is no appeal, to whom I submit. But to lose all, to lose with life and love, glory also, it shall not be. I, and in a few brief years, all you, this panic-struck army, and all the population of fair Greece, will no longer be. But other generations will arise, and ever and forever will continue to be made happier by our present acts, to be glorified by our valour. The prayer of my youth was to be one among those who render the pages of Earth's history splendid, who exalt the race of man, and make this little globe a dwelling of the mighty. Alas, for Raymond, the prayer of his youth is wasted, the hopes of his manhood are null. From my dungeon in yonder city I cried, Soon I will be thy lord. When Evadne pronounced my death, I thought that the title of victor of Constantinople would be written on my tomb, and I subdued all mortal fear. I stand before its vanquished walls, and dare not call myself a conqueror. So shall it not be. Did not Alexander leap from the walls of the city of the Oxydracae to show his coward troops the way to victory, encountering alone the swords of its defenders? Even so will I brave the plague, and though no man follow, I will plant the Grecian standard on the height of Saint Sophia. Reason came unavailing to such high-wrought feelings. 
In vain I shewed him that when winter came, the cold would dissipate the pestilential air and restore courage to the Greeks. Talk not of other season than this, he cried. I have lived my last winter, and the date of this year, 2092, will be carved upon my tomb. Already do I see, he continued, looking up mournfully, the born and precipitate edge of my existence, over which I plunge into the gloomy mystery of the life to come. I am prepared, so that I leave behind a trail of light so radiant that my worst enemies cannot cloud it. I owe this to Greece, to you, to my surviving Perdita, and to myself, the victim of ambition. We were interrupted by an attendant, who announced that the staff of Raymond was assembled in the council chamber. He requested me in the meantime to ride through the camp, and to observe and report to him the dispositions of the soldiers. He then left me. I had been excited to the utmost by the proceedings of the day, and now more than ever by the passionate language of Raymond. Alas, for human reason. He accused the Greeks of superstition. What name did he give to the faith he lent to the predictions of Evadna? I passed from the palace of sweet waters to the plain on which the encampment lay, and found its inhabitants in commotion. The arrival of several with fresh stories of marvels from the fleet, the exaggerations bestowed on what was already known, tales of old prophecies, of fearful histories of whole regions which had been laid waste during the present year by pestilence, alarmed and occupied the troops. Discipline was lost. The army disbanded itself. Each individual, before a part of a great whole, moving only in unison with others, now became resolved into the unit nature had made him, and thought of himself only. They stole off at first by ones and twos, then in larger companies, until unimpeded by the officers, whole battalions sought the road that led to Macedonia. About midnight I returned to the palace and sought Raymond. He was alone, and apparently composed. Such composure at least was his as is inspired by a resolve to adhere to a certain line of conduct. He heard my account of the self-dissolution of the army with calmness, and then said, You know, Verney, my fixed determination not to quit this place, until in the light of day, Stamboul is confessedly ours. If the men I have about me shrink from following me, others, more courageous, are to be found. Go you before break of day, bear these dispatches to Caraza, add to them your own entreaties that he send me his marines and naval force. If I can get but one regiment to second me, the rest would follow, of course. Let him send me this regiment, I shall expect your return by tomorrow noon. Methought this was but a poor expedient, but I assured him of my obedience and zeal. I quitted him to take a few hours' rest. With the breaking of morning I was accoutred for my ride. I lingered a while, desirous of taking leave of Perdita, and from my window observed the approach of the sun. The golden splendour arose, and weary nature awoke to suffer yet another day of heat and thirsty decay. No flowers lifted up their dew-laden cups to meet the dawn. The dry grass had withered on the plains. The burning fields of air were vacant of birds. The cicale alone, children of the sun, began their shrill and deafening song among the cypresses and olives. I saw Raymond's coal-black charger brought to the palace gate. A small company of officers arrived soon after. Care and fear was painted on each cheek and in each eye unrefreshed by sleep. I found Raymond and Perdita together. He was watching the rising sun, while with one arm he encircled his beloved's waist. She looked on him, the sun of her life, with earnest gaze of mingled anxiety and tenderness. Raymond started angrily when he saw me. Here still, he cried. Is this your promised zeal? Pardon me, I said, but even as you speak, I am gone. Nay, pardon me, he replied. I have no right to command or reproach, but my life hangs on your departure and speedy return. Farewell. His voice had recovered its bland tone, but a dark cloud still hung on his features. I would have delayed. I wished to recommend watchfulness to Perdita, but his presence restrained me. I had no pretense for my hesitation, and on his repeating his farewell, I clasped his outstretched hand. 
it was cold and clammy. Take care of yourself, my dear lord, I said. Nay, said Perdita, that task shall be mine. Return speedily, Lionel. With an air of absence he was playing with her auburn locks while she leaned on him. Twice I turned back, only to look again on this matchless pair. At last, with slow and heavy steps, I had paced out of the hall and sprung upon my horse. At that moment Clara flew towards me. Clasping my knees, she cried, Make haste back, uncle. Dear uncle, I have such fearful dreams. I dare not tell my mother. Do not be long away. I assured her of my impatience to return, and then, with a small escort, rode along the plain towards the Tower of Marmora. I fulfilled my commission. I saw Caraza. He was somewhat surprised. He would see, he said, what could be done, but it required time, and Raymond had ordered me to return by noon. It was impossible to effect anything in so short a time. I must stay till the next day, or come back after having reported the present state of things to the general. My choice was easily made. A restlessness, a fear of what was about to betide, a doubt as to Raymond's purposes, urged me to return without delay to his quarters. Quitting the Seven Towers, I rode eastward towards the Sweet Waters. I took a circuitous path, principally for the sake of going to the top of the mount before mentioned, which commanded a view of the city. I had my glass with me. The city basked under the noonday sun, and the venerable walls formed its picturesque boundary. Immediately before me was the top kapu, the gate near which Mahomet had made the breach by which he entered the city. Trees gigantic and aged grew near. Before the gate, I discerned a crowd of moving human figures. With intense curiosity, I lifted my glass to my eye. I saw Lord Raymond on his charger. A small company of officers had gathered about him, and behind was a promiscuous concourse of soldiers and subalterns, their discipline lost, their arms thrown aside. No music sounded, no banners streamed. The only flag among them was one which Raymond carried. He pointed with it to the gate of the city. The circle round him fell back. With angry gestures he leapt from his horse, and seizing a hatchet that hung from his saddle-bow, went with the apparent intention of battering down the opposing gate. A few men came to aid him, their numbers increased. Under their united blows the obstacle was vanquished, gate, portcullis and fence were demolished, and the wide, sunlit way leading to the heart of the city now lay open before them. The men shrank back. They seemed afraid of what they had already done, and stood as if they expected some mighty phantom to stalk in offended majesty from the opening. Raymond sprung lightly on his horse, grasped the standard, and with words which I could not hear, but his gestures, being their fit accompaniment, were marked by passionate energy, he seemed to adjure their assistance and companionship. Even as he spoke, the crowd receded from him. Indignation now transported him. His words, I guessed, were fraught with disdain. Then turning from his coward followers, he addressed himself to enter the city alone. His very horse seemed to back from the fatal entrance. His dog, his faithful dog, lay moaning and supplicating in his path. In a moment more, he had plunged the rowels into the sides of the stung animal, who bounded forward, and he, the gateway past, was galloping up the broad and desart street. Until this moment, my soul had been in my eyes only. I had gazed with wonder, mixed with fear and enthusiasm. The latter feeling now predominated. I forgot the distance between us. I will go with thee, Raymond, I cried. But my eye removed from the glass, I could scarce discern the pygmy forms of the crowd, which about a mile from me surrounded the gate. The form of Raymond was lost. Stung with impatience, I urged my horse with force of spur and loosened reins down the acclivity, that before danger could arrive, I might be at the side of my noble, godlike friend. A number of buildings and trees intervened, when I had reached the plain, hiding the city from my view. But at that moment a crash was heard. Thunder-like it reverberated through the sky, while the air was darkened. A moment more, and the old walls again met my sight, while over them hovered a murky cloud. 
Fragments of buildings whirled above, half seen in smoke, while flames burst out beneath, and continued explosions filled the air with terrific thunders. Flying from the mass of falling ruin which leapt over the high walls and shook the ivy towers, a crowd of soldiers made for the road by which I came. I was surrounded, hemmed in by them, unable to get forward. My impatience rose to its utmost. I stretched out my hands to the men. I conjured them to turn back and save their general, the conqueror of Stamboul, the liberator of Greece. Tears, I, tears in warm flow gushed from my eyes. I would not believe in his destruction. Yet every mass that darkened the air seemed to bear with it a portion of the martyred Raymond. Horrible sights were shaped to me in the turbid cloud that hovered over the city, and my only relief was derived from the struggles I made to approach the gate. Yet when I effected my purpose, all I could discern within the precincts of the massive walls was a city of fire. The open way through which Raymond had ridden was enveloped in smoke and flame. After an interval, the explosion ceased, but the flames still shot up from various quarters. The dome of St. Sophia had disappeared. Strange to say, the result perhaps of the concussion of air occasioned by the blowing up of the city, huge white thunderclouds lifted themselves up from the southern horizon and gathered overhead. They were the first blots on the blue expanse that I had seen for months, and amidst this havoc and despair they inspired pleasure. The vault above became obscured, lightning flashed from the heavy masses, followed instantaneously by crashing thunder. Then the big rain fell. The flames of the city bent beneath it, and the smoke and dust arising from the ruins was dissipated. I no sooner perceived an abatement of the flames than, hurried on by an irresistible impulse, I endeavoured to penetrate the town. I could only do this on foot, as the mass of ruin was impracticable for a horse. I had never entered the city before, and its ways were unknown to me. The streets were blocked up, the ruins smoking. I climbed up one heap, only to view others in succession, and nothing told me where the centre of the town might be, or towards what point Raymond might have directed his course. The rain ceased, the clouds sunk behind the horizon. It was now evening, and the sun descended swiftly the western sky. I scrambled on until I came to a street whose wooden houses, half burnt, had been cooled by the rain and were fortunately uninjured by the gunpowder. Up this I hurried, until now I had not seen a vestige of man, yet none of the defaced human forms which I distinguished could be Raymond, so I turned my eyes away while my heart sickened within me. I came to an open space, a mountain of ruin in the midst, announced that some large mosque had occupied the space, and here, scattered about, I saw various articles of luxury and wealth, singed, destroyed, but showing what they had been in their ruin, Jewels, strings of pearls, embroidered robes, rich furs, glittering tapestries, and oriental ornaments seem to have been collected here in a pile destined for destruction. But the rain had stopped the havoc midway. Hours passed, while in this scene of ruin I sought for Raymond. Insurmountable heaps sometimes opposed themselves. The still burning fires scorched me. The sun set, the atmosphere grew dim, and the evening star no longer shone companionless. The glare of flames attested the progress of destruction, while during mingled light and obscurity, the piles around me took gigantic proportions and weird shapes. For a moment, I could yield to the creative power of the imagination, and for a moment was soothed by the sublime fictions it presented to me. The beatings of my human heart drew me back to blank reality. Where? in this wilderness of death, art thou, O Raymond, ornament of England, deliverer of Greece, hero of unwritten story, wherein this burning chaos are thy dear relics strewed. I called aloud for him, through the darkness of night, over the scorching ruins of fallen Constantinople, his name was heard, no voice replied, echo even was mute. I was overcome by weariness, the solitude depressed my spirits. The sultry air impregnated with dust, the heat and smoke of burning palaces, 
palsied my limbs. Hunger suddenly came acutely upon me. The excitement which had hitherto sustained me was lost, as a building whose props are loosened and whose foundations rock, totters and falls, so when enthusiasm and hope deserted me, did my strength fail. I sat on the sole remaining step of an edifice, which even in its downfall was huge and magnificent. A few broken walls, not dislodged by gunpowder, stood in fantastic groups, and a flame glimmered at intervals on the summit of the pile. For a time, hunger and sleep contended till the constellations reeled before my eyes and then were lost. I strove to rise, but my heavy lids closed, my limbs overwearied, claimed repose. I rested my head on the stone, I yielded to the grateful sensation of utter forgetfulness, and in that scene of desolation, on that night of despair, I slept. Mike. Chapter 3 The stars still shone brightly when I awoke, and Taurus, high in the southern heaven, shewed that it was midnight. I awoke from disturbed dreams. Methought I had been invited to Timon's last feast. I came with keen appetite, the covers were removed, the hot water sent up its unsatisfying steams, while I fled before the anger of the host, who assumed the form of Raymond. While to my diseased fancy, the vessels hurled by him after me were surcharged with fetid vapour, and my friend's shape, altered by a thousand distortions, expanded into a gigantic phantom, bearing on its brow the sign of pestilence. The growing shadow rose and rose, filling, and then seeming to endeavour to burst beyond, the adamantine vault that bent over, sustaining and enclosing the world. The nightmare became torture. With a strong effort, I threw off sleep and recalled reason to her wonted functions. My first thought was Perdita. To her I must return. Her I must support, drawing such food from despair as might best sustain her wounded heart. Recalling her from the wild excesses of grief, by the austere laws of duty and the soft tenderness of regret. The position of the stars was my only guide. I turned from the awful ruin of the Golden City, and after great exertion succeeded in extricating myself from its enclosure. I met a company of soldiers outside the walls. I borrowed a horse from one of them and hastened to my sister. The appearance of the plain was changed during this short interval. The encampment was broken up. The relics of the disbanded army met in small companies here and there. Each face was clouded. Every gesture spoke astonishment and dismay. With an heavy heart, I entered the palace and stood fearful to advance, to speak, to look. In the midst of the hall was Perdita. She sat on the marble pavement, her head fallen on her bosom, her hair disheveled, her fingers twined busily one within the other. She was pale as marble, and every feature was contracted by agony. She perceived me and looked up inquiringly. Her half-glance of hope was misery. The words died before I could articulate them. I felt a ghastly smile wrinkle my lips. She understood my gesture. Again, her head fell. Again, her fingers worked restlessly. At last, I recovered speech, but my voice terrified her. The hapless girl had understood my look, and for worlds she would not that the tale of her heavy misery should have been shaped out and confirmed by hard, irrevocable words. Nay, she seemed to wish to distract my thoughts from the subject. She rose from the floor. Hush, she said, whisperingly. After much weeping, Clara sleeps. We must not disturb her. She seated herself then on the same ottoman where I had left her in the morning resting on the beating heart of her raiment. I dared not approach her, but sat at a distant corner, watching her starting and nervous gestures. At length, in an abrupt manner, she asked, Where is he? Oh, fear not, she continued. Fear not that I should entertain hope. Yet tell me, have you found him? To have him once more in my arms, to see him, however changed, is all I desire. Though Constantinople be heaped above him as a tomb, yet I must find him. Then cover us with the city's weight, with a mountain piled above. I care not, so that one grave hold Raymond and his Perdita. Then weeping, 
she clung to me. Take me to him, she cried. Unkind Lionel, why do you keep me here? Of myself I cannot find him, but you know where he lies. Lead me thither. At first these agonizing plaints filled me with intolerable compassion, but soon I endeavored to extract patience for her from the ideas she suggested. I related my adventures of the night, my endeavors to find our lost one, and my disappointment. Turning her thoughts this way, I gave them an object which rescued them from insanity. With apparent calmness, she discussed with me the probable spot where he might be found and planned the means we should use for that purpose. Then hearing of my fatigue and abstinence, she herself brought me food. I seized the favorable moment and endeavored to awaken in her something beyond the killing torpor of grief. As I spoke, my subject carried me away. Deep admiration, grief, the offspring of truest affection, the overflowing of a heart bursting with sympathy for all that had been great and sublime in the career of my friend, inspired me as I poured forth the praises of Raymond. Alas, for us, I cried, who have lost this latest honor of the world, beloved Raymond, he is gone to the nations of the dead. He has become one of those who render the dark abode of the obscure grave illustrious by dwelling there. He has journeyed on the road that leads to it and joined the mighty of soul who went before him. When the world was in its infancy, death must have been terrible, and man left his friends and kindred to dwell, a solitary stranger in an unknown country. But now, he who dies finds many companions gone before to prepare for his reception. The great of past ages people it, the exalted hero of our own days is counted among its inhabitants, while life becomes doubly the desart and the solitude. What a noble creature was Raymond, the first among the men of our time. By the grandeur of his conceptions, the graceful daring of his actions, by his wit and beauty, he won and ruled the minds of all. Of one only fault he might have been accused, but his death has cancelled that. I have heard him called inconstant of purpose when he deserted for the sake of love, the hope of sovereignty, and when he abdicated the protectorship of England, men blamed his infirmity of purpose. Now his death has crowned his life, and to the end of time it will be remembered that he devoted himself, a willing victim, to the glory of Greece. Such was his choice. He expected to die. He foresaw that he should leave this cheerful earth, the lightsome sky, and thy love, Perdita. Yet he neither hesitated or turned back, going right onward to his mark of fame. While the earth lasts, his actions will be recorded with praise. Grecian maidens will in devotion strew flowers on his tomb and make the air around it resonant with patriotic hymns in which his name will find high record. I saw the features of Perdita soften, the sternness of grief yielded to tenderness. I continued, Thus to honor him is the sacred duty of his survivors, to make his name even as an holy spot of ground, enclosing it from all hostile attacks by our praise, shedding on it the blossoms of love and regret, guarding it from decay, and bequeathing it untainted to posterity. Such is the duty of his friends. A dearer one belongs to you, Perdita, mother of his child. Do you remember in her infancy with what transport you beheld Clara, recognizing in her the united being of yourself and Raymond, joying to view in this living temple a manifestation of your eternal loves? Even such is she still. You say that you have lost Raymond? Oh, no, yet he lives with you and in you there. From him she sprung, flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, and not, as heretofore, are you content to trace in her downy cheek and delicate limbs an affinity to Raymond, but in her enthusiastic affections, in the sweet qualities of her mind, you may still find him living, the good, the great, the beloved. Be it your care to foster this similarity, be it your care to render her worthy of him, so that, when she glory in her origin, she take not shame for what she is. I could perceive that when I recalled my sister's thoughts to her duties in life, 
She did not listen with the same patience as before. She appeared to suspect a plan of consolation on my part, from which she, cherishing her newborn grief, revolted. You talk of the future, she said, while the present is all to me. Let me find the earthly dwelling of my beloved. Let us rescue that from common dust, so that in times to come men may point to the sacred tomb and name it his, then to other thoughts and a new course of life, or what else fate in her cruel tyranny may have marked out for me. After a short repose, I prepared to leave her, that I might endeavour to accomplish her wish. In the meantime, we were joined by Clara, whose pallid cheek and scared look shewed the deep impression grief had made on her young mind. She seemed to be full of something to which she could not give words, but seizing an opportunity afforded by Perdita's absence, she preferred to me an earnest prayer that I would take her within view of the gate at which her father had entered Constantinople. She promised to commit no extravagance, to be docile, and immediately to return. I could not refuse, for Clara was not an ordinary child. Her sensibility and intelligence seemed already to have endowed her with the rights of womanhood. With her, therefore, before me on my horse, attended only by the servant who was to reconduct her, we rode to the top kapu. We found a party of soldiers gathered round it. They were listening. They are human cries, said one. More like the howling of a dog, replied another. And again, they bent to catch the sound of regular distant moans, which issued from the precincts of the ruined city. That, Clara, I said, is the gate that the street which yestermorn your father rode up. Whatever Clara's intention had been in asking to be brought hither, it was balked by the presence of the soldiers. With earnest gaze, she looked on the labyrinth of smoking piles which had been a city, and then expressed her readiness to return home. At this moment, a melancholy howl struck on our ears. It was repeated. Hark! cried Clara. He is there. That is Florio, my father's dog. It seemed to me impossible that she could recognize the sound, but she persisted in her assertion till she gained credit with the crowd about. At least it would be a benevolent action to rescue the sufferer, whether human or brute, from the desolation of the town. So, sending Clara back to her home, I again entered Constantinople. Encouraged by the impunity attendant on my former visit, several soldiers who had made a part of Raymond's bodyguard, who had loved him and sincerely mourned his loss, accompanied me. It is impossible to conjecture the strange enchainment of events which restored the lifeless form of my friend to our hands. In that part of the town where the fire had most raged the night before, and which now lay quenched, black and cold, the dying dog of Raymond crouched beside the mutilated form of its lord. At such a time, sorrow has no voice. Affliction, tamed by its very vehemence, is mute. The poor animal recognized me, licked my hand, crept close to its lord, and died. He had been evidently thrown from his horse by some falling ruin which had crushed his head and defaced his whole person. I bent over the body and took in my hand the edge of his cloak, less altered in appearance than the human frame it clothed. I pressed it to my lips, while the rough soldiers gathered around, mourning over this worthiest prey of death, as if regret and endless lamentation could re-illumine the extinguished spark, or call to its shattered prison house of flesh the liberated spirit. Yesterday, those limbs were worth an universe. They then enshrined a transcendent power, whose intents, words, and actions were worthy to be recorded in letters of gold. Now the superstition of affection alone could give value to the shattered mechanism which, incapable and clod-like, no more resembled Raymond than the fallen rain is like the former mansion of cloud in which it climbed the highest skies, and gilded by the sun, attracted all eyes, and satiated the sense by its excess of beauty. Such as he had now become, such as was his terrene vesture, defaced and spoiled, we wrapped it in our cloaks, and lifting the burthen in our arms, bore it from this city of the dead. The question arose as to where we should deposit him. In our road to the palace, we passed through the Greek cemetery. 
Here on a tablet of black marble I caused him to be laid. The cypresses waved high above, their death-like gloom accorded with his state of nothingness. We cut branches of the funereal trees and placed them over him, and on these again his sword. I left a guard to protect this treasure of dust and ordered perpetual torches to be burned around. When I returned to Perdita, I found that she had already been informed of the success of my undertaking. He, her beloved, the sole and eternal object of her passionate tenderness, was restored her. Such was the maniac language of her enthusiasm. What though those limbs moved not, and those lips could no more frame modulated accents of wisdom and love? What though like a weed flung from the fruitless sea, he lay the prey of corruption? Still, that was the form she had caressed, those the lips that, meeting hers, had drank the spirit of love from the commingling breath. That was the earthly mechanism of dissoluble clay she had called her own. True, she looked forward to another life. True, the burning spirit of love seemed to her unextinguishable throughout eternity. Yet at this time, with human fondness, she clung to all that her human senses permitted her to see and feel to be a part of Raymond. Pale as marble, clear and beaming as that, she heard my tale and inquired concerning the spot where he had been deposited. Her features had lost the distortion of grief, her eyes were brightened, her very person seemed dilated, while the excessive whiteness and even transparency of her skin and something hollow in her voice bore witness that not tranquility but excess of excitement occasioned the treacherous calm that settled on her countenance. I asked her where he should be buried. She replied, at Athens, even at the Athens which he loved. Without the town, on the acclivity of Hymettus, there is a rocky recess which he pointed out to me as the spot where he would wish to repose. My own desire certainly was that he should not be removed from the spot where he now lay, but her wish was of course to be complied with, and I entreated her to prepare without delay for our departure. Behold, now the melancholy train crossed the flats of Thrace and wind through the defiles, and over the mountains of Macedonia, coast the clear waves of the Peneus, cross the Larician plain, past the straits of Thermopylae, and ascending in succession Erta and Parnassus, descend to the fertile plain of Athens. Women bear with resignation these long-drawn ills, but to a man's impatient spirit the slow motion of our cavalcade the melancholy repose we took at noon, the perpetual presence of the pall, gorgeous though it was, that wrapped the rifled casket which had contained Raymond, the monotonous recurrence of day and night, unvaried by hope or change, all the circumstances of our march were intolerable. Perdita, shut up in herself, spoke little. Her carriage was closed, and when we rested, she sat leaning her pale cheek on her white, cold hand, with eyes fixed on the ground, indulging thoughts which refused communication or sympathy. We descended from Parnassus, emerging from its many folds, and passed through Livadia on our road to Attica. Perdita would not enter Athens, but reposing at Marathon on the night of our arrival, conducted me on the following day to the spot selected by her as the treasure house of Raymond's dear remains. It was in a recess near the head of the ravine to the south of Hymettus. The chasm, deep, black and hoary, swept from the summit to the base. In the fissures of the rock, myrtle underwood grew and wild thyme, the food of many nations of bees. Enormous crags protruded into the cleft, some beetling over, others rising perpendicularly from it. At the foot of this sublime chasm, a fertile laughing valley reached from sea to sea, and beyond was spread the blue Aegean, sprinkled with islands, the light waves glancing beneath the sun. Close to the spot on which we stood was a solitary rock, high and conical, which, divided on every side from the mountain, seemed a nature-hewn pyramid. With little labour, this block was reduced to a perfect shape, the narrow cell was scooped out beneath in which Raymond was placed, and a short inscription carved in the living stone recorded the name of its tenant, the cause and error of his death. 
Everything was accomplished with speed under my directions. I agreed to leave the finishing and guardianship of the tomb to the head of the religious establishment at Athens, and by the end of October prepared for my return to England. I mentioned this to Perdita. It was painful to appear to drag her from the last scene that spoke of her lost one, but to linger here was vain, and my very soul was sick with its yearning to rejoin my Idris and her babes. In reply, my sister requested me to accompany her the following evening to the tomb of Raymond. Some days had passed since I had visited the spot. The path to it had been enlarged, and steps hewn in the rock led us less circuitously than before to the spot itself. The platform on which the pyramid stood was enlarged, and looking towards the south, in a recess overshadowed by the straggling branches of a wild fig tree, I saw foundations dug and props and rafters fixed, evidently the commencement of a cottage. Standing on its unfinished threshold, the tomb was at our right hand, the whole ravine and plain and azure sea immediately before us. The dark rocks received a glow from the descending sun, which glanced along the cultivated valley and dyed in purple and orange the placid waves. We sat on a rocky elevation, and I gazed with rapture on the beauteous panorama of living and changeful colours which varied and enhanced the graces of earth and ocean. Did I not do right, said Perdita, in having my loved one conveyed hither? Hereafter this will be the cynosure of Greece. In such a spot death loses half its terrors, and even the inanimate dust appears to partake of the spirit of beauty which hallows this region. Lionel, he sleeps there, that is the grave of Raymond, he whom in my youth I first loved, whom my heart accompanied in days of separation and anger, to whom I am now joined forever. Never, mark me, never will I leave this spot. Methinks his spirit remains here as well as that dust, which, uncommunicable though it be, is more precious in its nothingness than aught else widowed earth clasps to her sorrowing bosom. The myrtle bushes, the thyme, the little cyclamen, which peep from the fissures of the rock, all the produce of the place, bear affinity to him. The light that invests the hills participates in his essence, and sky and mountains, sea and valley are imbued by the presence of his spirit. I will live and die here. Go you to England, Lionel. Return to sweet Idris and dearest Adrian. Return and let my orphan girl be as a child of your own in your house. Look on me as dead, and truly, if death be a mere change of state, I am dead. This is another world from that which late I inhabited, from that which is now your home. Here I hold communion only with the has-been and to come. Go you to England and leave me where alone I can consent to drag out the miserable days which I must still live. A shower of tears terminated her sad harangue. I had expected some extravagant proposition and remained silent a while, collecting my thoughts that I might the better combat her fanciful scheme. You cherish dreary thoughts, my dear Perdita, I said. Nor do I wonder that for a time your better reason should be influenced by passionate grief and a disturbed imagination. Even I am in love with this last home of Raymond's. Nevertheless, we must quit it. I expected this, cried Perdita. I supposed that you would treat me as a mad, foolish girl, but do not deceive yourself. This cottage is built by my order and here I shall remain until the hour arrives when I may share his happier dwelling. My dearest girl, and what is there so strange in my design? I might have deceived you. I might have talked of remaining here only a few months. In your anxiety to reach Windsor, you would have left me, and without reproach or contention, I might have pursued my plan. But I disdained the artifice, or rather, in my wretchedness, it was my only consolation to pour out my heart to you, my brother, my only friend. You will not dispute with me. You know how willful your poor, misery-stricken sister is. Take my girl with you, wean her from sights and thoughts of sorrow. Let infantine hilarity revisit her heart and animate her eyes. So could it never be were she near me. It is far better for all of you that you should never see me again. For myself, 
I will not voluntarily seek death, that is, I will not, while I can command myself, and I can hear. But drag me from this country, and my power of self-control vanishes, nor can I answer for the violence my agony of grief may lead me to commit. You clothe your meaning, Perdita, I replied, in powerful words, yet that meaning is selfish and unworthy of you. You have often agreed with me that there is but one solution to the intricate riddle of life, to improve ourselves and contribute to the happiness of others. And now, in the very prime of life, you desert your principles and shut yourself up in useless solitude. Will you think of Raymond less at Windsor, the scene of your early happiness? Will you commune less with his departed spirit while you watch over and cultivate the rare excellence of his child? You have been sadly visited, nor do I wonder that a feeling akin to insanity should drive you to bitter and unreasonable imaginings. But a home of love awaits you in your native England. My tenderness and affection must soothe you. The society of Raymond's friends will be of more solace than these dreary speculations. We will all make it our first care, our dearest task, to contribute to your happiness." Perdita shook her head. If it could be so, she replied, I were much in the wrong to disdain your offers. But it is not a matter of choice. I can live here only. I am a part of this scene. Each and all its properties are a part of me. This is no sudden fancy. I live by it. The knowledge that I am here rises with me in the morning and enables me to endure the light. It is mingled with my food, which else were poison. It walks, it sleeps with me, forever it accompanies me. Here I may even cease to repine, and may add my tardy consent to the decree which has taken him from me. He would rather have died such a death, which will be recorded in history to endless time, than have lived to old age unknown, unhonored. Nor can I desire better than having been the chosen and beloved of his heart, here in youth's prime, before added years can tarnish the best feelings of my nature to watch his tomb and speedily rejoin him in his blessed repose. So much, my dearest Lionel, I have said, wishing to persuade you that I do right. If you are unconvinced, I can add nothing further by way of argument, and I can only declare my fixed resolve. I stay here. Force only can remove me. Be it so. Drag me away. I return. Confine me. Imprison me. Still I escape, and come here. Or would my brother rather devote the heartbroken Perdita to the straw and chains of a maniac than suffer her to rest in peace beneath the shadow of his society, in this my own selected and beloved recess? All this appeared to me, I own methodized madness. I imagined that it was my imperative duty to take her from scenes that thus forcibly reminded her of her loss. Nor did I doubt that in the tranquility of our family circle at Windsor, she would recover some degree of composure, and in the end, of happiness. My affection for Clara also led me to oppose these fond dreams of cherished grief. Her sensibility had already been too much excited her infant heedlessness too soon exchanged for deep and anxious thought. The strange and romantic scheme of her mother might confirm and perpetuate the painful view of life which had intruded itself thus early on her contemplation. On returning home, the captain of the steam packet with whom I had agreed to sail came to tell me that accidental circumstances hastened his departure, and that, if I went with him, I must come on board at five on the following morning. I hastily gave my consent to this arrangement, and as hastily formed a plan through which Perdita should be forced to become my companion. I believe that most people in my situation would have acted in the same manner. Yet this consideration does not, or rather did not in after time, diminish the reproaches of my conscience. At the moment, I felt convinced that I was acting for the best, and that all I did was right and even necessary. I sat with Perdita and soothed her by my seeming assent to her wild scheme. She received my concurrence with pleasure and a thousand times over thanked her deceiving, deceitful brother. 
As night came on, her spirits, enlivened by my unexpected concession, regained an almost forgotten vivacity. I pretended to be alarmed by the feverish glow in her cheek. I entreated her to take a composing draught. I poured out the medicine, which she took docilely from me. I watched her as she drank it. Falsehood and artifice are in themselves so hateful that though I still thought I did right, a feeling of shame and guilt came painfully upon me. I left her and soon heard that she slept soundly under the influence of the opiate I had administered. She was carried thus unconscious on board. The anchor weighed, and the wind being favourable, we stood far out to sea. With all the canvas spread and the power of the engine to assist, we scudded swiftly and steadily through the chafed element. It was late in the day before Perdita awoke, and a longer time elapsed before recovering from the torpor occasioned by the laudanum, she perceived her change of situation. She started wildly from her couch and flew to the cabin window. The blue and troubled sea sped past the vessel and was spread shoreless around. The sky was covered by a rack, which in its swift motion shewed how speedily she was borne away. The creaking of the masts, the clang of the wheels, the tramp above, all persuaded her that she was already far from the shores of Greece. Where are we? she cried. Where are we going? The attendant whom I had stationed to watch her replied, To England. And my brother? Is on deck, madam. Unkind! Unkind! exclaimed the poor victim, as with a deep sigh she looked on the waste of waters. Then, without further remark, she threw herself on her couch, and closing her eyes remained motionless so that but for the deep sighs that burst from her, it would have seemed that she slept. As soon as I heard that she had spoken, I sent Clara to her, that the sight of the lovely innocent might inspire gentle and affectionate thoughts. But neither the presence of her child nor a subsequent visit from me could rouse my sister. She looked on Clara with a countenance of woeful meaning, but she did not speak. When I appeared, she turned away, and in reply to my inquiries only said, You know not what you have done. I trusted that this sullenness betokened merely the struggle between disappointment and natural affection, and that in a few days she would be reconciled to her fate. When night came on, she begged that Clara might sleep in a separate cabin. Her servant, however, remained with her. About midnight, she spoke to the latter, saying that she had had a bad dream, and bade her go to her daughter and bring word whether she rested quietly. The woman obeyed. The breeze that had flagged since sunset now rose again. I was on deck, enjoying our swift progress. The quiet was disturbed only by the rush of waters as they divided before the steady keel, the murmur of the moveless and full sails, the wind whistling in the shrouds, and the regular motion of the engine. The sea was gently agitated, now shewing a white crest, and now resuming an uniform hue. The clouds had disappeared, and dark ether clipped the broad ocean, in which the constellations vainly sought their accustomed mirror. Our rate could not have been less than eight knots. Suddenly, I heard a splash in the sea. The sailors on watch rushed to the side of the vessel with the cry, Someone gone overboard. It is not from deck, said the man at the helm. Something has been thrown from the aft cabin. A call for the boat to be lowered was echoed from the deck. I rushed into my sister's cabin. It was empty. With sails abaft, the engine stopped. The vessel remained unwillingly stationary, until after an hour's search, my poor Perdita was brought on board. But no care could reanimate her. No medicine caused her dear eyes to open, and the blood to flow again from her pulseless heart. One clenched hand contained a slip of paper on which was written, To Athens. To ensure her removal thither, and prevent the irrecoverable loss of her body in the wide sea, she had had the precaution to fasten a long shawl round her waist, and again to the staunchions of the cabin window. She had drifted somewhat under the keel of the vessel, and her being out of sight occasioned the delay in finding her, and thus the ill-starred girl died a victim to my senseless rashness. Thus, in early day, she left us for the company of the dead 
and preferred to share the rocky grave of Raymond before the animated scene this cheerful earth afforded and the society of loving friends. Thus, in her 29th year, she died, having enjoyed some few years of the happiness of paradise and sustaining a reverse to which her impatient spirit and affectionate disposition were unable to submit. As I marked the placid expression that had settled on her countenance in death, I felt, in spite of the pangs of remorse, in spite of heart-rending regret, that it was better to die so than to drag on long, miserable years of repining and inconsolable grief. Stress of weather drove us up the Adriatic Gulf, and our vessel being hardly fitted to weather a storm, we took refuge in the port of Ancona. Here I met Giorgio Palli, the Vice Admiral of the Greek fleet, a former friend and warm partisan of Raymond. I committed the remains of my lost Perdita to his care, for the purpose of having them transported to Hermetus, and placed in the cell her Raymond already occupied beneath the pyramid. This was all accomplished even as I wished. She reposed beside her beloved, and the tomb above was inscribed with the united names of Raymond and Perdita. I then came to a resolution of pursuing our journey to England overland. My own heart was racked by regrets and remorse. The apprehension that Raymond had departed forever, that his name, blended eternally with the past, must be erased from every anticipation of the future, had come slowly upon me. I had always admired his talents, his noble aspirations, his grand conceptions of the glory and majesty of his ambition, his utter want of mean passions, his fortitude and daring. In Greece I had learnt to love him, his very waywardness and self-abandonment to the impulses of superstition attached me to him doubly. It might be weakness, but it was the antipodes of all that was groveling and selfish. To these pangs were added the loss of Perdita, lost through my own accursed self-will and conceit. This dear one, my sole relation, whose progress I had marked from tender childhood through the varied path of life, and seen her throughout conspicuous for integrity, devotion, and true affection. For all that constitutes the peculiar graces of the female character, and beheld her at last the victim of too much loving, too constant an attachment to the perishable and lost, she, in her pride of beauty and life, had thrown aside the pleasant perception of the apparent world for the unreality of the grave, and had left poor Clara quite an orphan. I concealed from this beloved child that her mother's death was voluntary, and tried every means to awaken cheerfulness in her sorrow-stricken spirit. One of my first acts for the recovery, even of my own composure, was to bid farewell to the sea. Its hateful splash renewed again and again to my sense the death of my sister. Its roar was a dirge. In every dark hull that was tossed on its inconstant bosom, I imaged a beer that would convey to death all who trusted to its treacherous smiles. Farewell to the sea. Come, my Clara, sit beside me in this aerial bark. Quickly and gently it cleaves the azure serene, and with soft undulation glides upon the current of the air. Or, if storm shake its fragile mechanism, the green earth is below. We can descend and take shelter on the stable continent. Here aloft, the companions of the swift-winged birds, we skim through the unresisting element, fleetly and fearlessly. The light boat heaves not, nor is opposed by death-bearing waves. The ether opens before the prow, and the shadow of the globe that upholds it shelters us from the noonday sun. Beneath are the plains of Italy, or the vast undulations of the wave-like Apennines. Fertility reposes in their many folds, and woods crown the summits. The free and happy peasant, unshackled by the Austrian, bears the double harvest to the Ghana, and the refined citizens rear without dread the long, blighted tree of knowledge in this garden of the world. We were lifted above the Alpine peaks, and from their deep and brawling ravines entered the plain of fair France and after an airy journey of six days, we landed at Dieppe, furled the feathered wings, and closed the silken globe of our little pinnace. A heavy rain made this mode of travelling now incommodious. 
So we embarked in a steam packet, and after a short passage landed at Portsmouth. A strange story was rife here. A few days before, a tempest-struck vessel had appeared off the town. The hull was parched-looking and cracked, the sails rent and bent in a careless, unseamanlike manner, the shrouds tangled and broken. She drifted towards the harbour and was stranded on the sands at the entrance. In the morning, the custom house officers, together with a crowd of idlers, visited her. One only of the crew appeared to have arrived with her. He had got to shore and had walked a few paces towards the town, and then, vanquished by malady and approaching death, had fallen on the inhospitable beach. He was found stiff, his hands clenched and pressed against his breast. His skin, nearly black, his matted hair and bristly beard were signs of a long, protracted misery. It was whispered that he had died of the plague. No one ventured on board the vessel, and strange sights were averred to be seen at night, walking the deck and hanging on the masts and shrouds. She soon went to pieces. I was shown where she had been and saw her disjoined timbers tossed on the waves. The body of the man who had landed had been buried deep in the sands, and none could tell more than that the vessel was American-built, and that several months before the Fortunatas had sailed from Philadelphia, of which no tidings were afterwards received. Chapter 4 I returned to my family estate in the autumn of the year 2092. My heart had long been with them, and I felt sick with the hope and delight of seeing them again. The district which contained them appeared the abode of every kindly spirit. Happiness, love and peace walked the forest paths and tempered the atmosphere. After all the agitation and sorrow I had endured in Greece, I sought Windsor, as the storm-driven bird does the nest in which it may fold its wings in tranquility. How unwise had the wanderers been, who had deserted its shelter, entangled themselves in the web of society, and entered on what men of the world call life, that labyrinth of evil, that scheme of mutual torture. To live, according to this sense of the word, we must not only observe and learn, we must also feel. We must not be mere spectators of action. We must act. We must not describe, but be subjects of description. Deep sorrow must have been the inmate of our bosoms. Fraud must have lain in wait for us. The artful must have deceived us. Sickening doubt and false hope must have checkered our days. Hilarity and joy that lap the soul in ecstasy must at times have possessed us. Who that knows what life is would pine for this feverish species of existence. I have lived. I have spent days and nights of festivity. I have joined in ambitious hopes and exulted in victory. Now, shut the door on the world and build high the wall that is to separate me from the troubled scene enacted within its precincts. Let us live for each other and for happiness. Let us seek peace in our dear home near the inland murmur of streams and the gracious waving of trees, the beauteous vesture of earth and sublime pageantry of the skies. Let us leave life that we may live. Idris was well content with this resolve of mine. Her native sprightliness needed no undue excitement and her placid heart reposed contented on my love, the well-being of her children and the beauty of surrounding nature. Her pride and blameless ambition was to create smiles in all around her and to shed repose on the fragile existence of her brother. In spite of her tender nursing, the health of Adrian perceptibly declined. Walking, riding, the common occupations of life overcame him. He felt no pain, but seemed to tremble forever on the verge of annihilation. Yet, as he had lived on for months nearly in the same state, he did not inspire us with any immediate fear, and though he talked of death as an event most familiar to his thoughts, he did not cease to exert himself to render others happy or to cultivate his own astonishing powers of mind. Winter passed away, and spring, led by the months, awakened life in all nature. The forest was dressed in green, the young calves frisked on the new-sprung grass, 
The wind-winged shadows of light clouds sped over the green cornfields. The hermit cuckoo repeated his monotonous all hail to the season. The nightingale, bird of love and minion of the evening star, filled the woods with song. While Venus lingered in the warm sunset, and the young green of the trees lay in gentle relief along the clear horizon. Delight awoke in every heart, delight and exultation, for there was peace through all the world. The temple of universal Janus was shut, and man died not that year by the hand of man. Let this last but twelve months, said Adrian, and earth will become a paradise. The energies of man were before directed to the destruction of his species. They now aim at its liberation and preservation. Man cannot repose, and his restless aspirations will now bring forth good instead of evil. The favoured countries of the South will throw off the iron yoke of servitude. Poverty will quit us, and with that, sickness. What may not the forces, never before united, of liberty and peace achieve in this dwelling of man? Dreaming forever dreaming, Windsor, said Ryland, the old adversary of Raymond, and candidate for the protectorate at the ensuing election. Be assured that earth is not, nor ever can be heaven, while the seeds of hell are natives of her soil. When the seasons have become equal, when the air breeds no disorders, when its surface is no longer liable to blights and droughts, then sickness will cease. When men's passions are dead, poverty will depart. When love is no longer akin to hate, then brotherhood will exist. We are very far from that state at present. Not so far as you may suppose, observed a little old astronomer, by name Merivale, the poles proceed slowly but securely in an hundred thousand years. We shall all be underground, said Ryland. The pole of the earth will coincide with the pole of the ecliptic, continued the astronomer, an universal spring will be produced, and earth become a paradise. And we shall of course enjoy the benefit of the change, said Ryland contemptuously. We have strange news here, I observed. I had the newspaper in my hand, and, as usual, had turned to the intelligence from Greece. It seems that the total destruction of Constantinople, and the supposition that winter had purified the air of the fallen city, gave the Greeks courage to visit its site and begin to rebuild it. But they tell us that the curse of God is on the place, for everyone who has ventured within the walls has been tainted by the plague, that this disease has spread in Thrace and Macedonia, and now, fearing the virulence of infection during the coming heats, a cordon has been drawn on the frontiers of Thessaly and a strict quarantine exacted. This intelligence brought us back from the prospect of paradise, held out after the lapse of an hundred thousand years to the pain and misery at present existent upon earth. We talked of the ravages made last year by pestilence in every quarter of the world and of the dreadful consequences of a second visitation. We discussed the best means of preventing infection and of preserving health and activity in a large city thus afflicted, London, for instance. Merivale did not join in this conversation. Drawing near Idris, he proceeded to assure her that the joyful prospect of an earthly paradise after an hundred thousand years was clouded to him by the knowledge that in a certain period of time after, an earthly hell or purgatory would occur when the ecliptic and equator would be at right angles. Our party at length broke up. We are all dreaming this morning, said Ryland. It is as wise to discuss the probability of a visitation of the plague in our well-governed metropolis as to calculate the centuries which must escape before we can grow pineapples here in the open air. But though it seemed absurd to calculate upon the arrival of the plague in London, I could not reflect without extreme pain on the desolation this evil would cause in Greece. The English, for the most part, talked of Thrace and Macedonia, as they would of a lunar territory which, unknown to them, presented no distinct idea or interest to the minds. I had trod the soil. The faces of many of the inhabitants were familiar to me. In the towns, plains, hills and defiles of these countries, I had enjoyed unspeakable delight as I journeyed through them the year before. Some romantic village, 
some cottage or elegant abode there situated, inhabited by the lovely and the good, rose before my mental sight, and the question haunted me, is the plague there also? That same invincible monster which hovered over and devoured Constantinople, that fiend more cruel than tempest, less tame than fire, is alas unchained in that beautiful country. These reflections would not allow me to rest. The political state of England became agitated as the time drew near when the new protector was to be elected. This event excited the more interest, since it was the current report that if the popular candidate, Ryland, should be chosen, the question of the abolition of hereditary rank and other feudal relics would come under the consideration of Parliament. Not a word had been spoken during the present session on any of these topics. Everything would depend upon the choice of a protector and the elections of the ensuing year. Yet this very silence was awful, showing the deep weight attributed to the question, the fear of either party to hazard an ill-timed attack, and the expectation of a furious contention when it should begin. But although St. Stephen's did not echo with the voice which filled each heart, the newspapers teemed with nothing else, and in private companies the conversation, however remotely begun, soon verged towards this central point while voices were lowered and chairs drawn closer. The nobles did not hesitate to express their fear. The other party endeavoured to treat the matter lightly. Shame on the country, said Ryland, to lay so much stress upon words and frippery. It is a question of nothing, of the new painting of carriage panels and the embroidery of footmen's coats. Yet could England indeed doff her lordly trappings and be content with the democratic style of America? were the pride of ancestry, the patrician spirit, the gentle courtesies and refined pursuits, splendid attributes of rank, to be erased among us. We were told that this would not be the case, that we were by nature a poetical people, a nation easily duped by words, ready to array clouds in splendour and bestow honour on the dust. This spirit we could never lose, and it was to diffuse this concentrated spirit of birth that the new law was to be brought forward. We were assured that when the name and title of Englishman was the sole patent of nobility, we should all be noble. That when no man born under English sway felt another his superior in rank, courtesy and refinement would become the birthright of all our countrymen. Let not England be so far disgraced as to have it imagined that it can be without nobles, nature's true nobility, who bear their patent in their mind, who are from their cradle elevated above the rest of their species because they are better than the rest. Among a race of independent and generous and well-educated men, in a country where the imagination is empress of men's minds, there needs be no fear that we should want a perpetual succession of the high-born and lordly. That party, however, could hardly yet be considered a minority in the kingdom, who extolled the ornament of the column the Corinthian capital of polished society. They appealed to prejudices without number, to old attachments and young hopes, to the expectation of thousands who might one day become peers. They set up as a scarecrow, the spectre of all that was sordid, mechanic and base in the commercial republics. The plague had come to Athens. Hundreds of English residents returned to their own country, Raymond's beloved Athenians, the free, the noble people of the divinest town in Greece, fell like ripe corn before the merciless sickle of the adversary. Its pleasant places were deserted, its temples and palaces were converted into tombs, its energies, bent before towards the highest objects of human ambition, were now forced to converge to one point, the guarding against the innumerous arrows of the plague. At any other time, this disaster would have excited extreme compassion among us, but it was now passed over, while each mind was engaged by the coming controversy. It was not so with me, and the question of rank and right dwindled to insignificance in my eyes when I pictured the scene of suffering Athens. I heard of the death of only sons, of wives and husbands most devoted, of the rending of ties twisted with the heart's fibres of friend losing friend and young mothers mourning for their firstborn. And these moving incidents were grouped and painted in my mind by the knowledge of the persons 
by my esteem and affection for the sufferers. It was the admirers, friends, fellow soldiers of Raymond, families that had welcomed Perdita to Greece and lamented with her the loss of her lord that was swept away and went to dwell with them in the undistinguishing tomb. The plague at Athens had been preceded and caused by the contagion from the east, and the scene of havoc and death continued to be acted there on a scale of fearful magnitude. A hope that the visitation of the present year would prove the last kept up the spirits of the merchants connected with these countries, but the inhabitants were driven to despair or to a resignation which, arising from fanaticism, assumed the same dark hue. America had also received the taint, and, were it yellow fever or plague, the epidemic was gifted with a virulence before unfelt. The devastation was not confined to the towns, but spread throughout the country. The hunter died in the woods, the peasant in the cornfields, and the fisher on his native waters. A strange story was brought to us from the East, to which little credit would have been given, had not the fact been attested by a multitude of witnesses in various parts of the world. On the 21st of June, it was said that an hour before noon, a black sun arose, an orb, the size of that luminary but dark, defined, whose beams were shadows, ascended from the west. In about an hour, it had reached the meridian and eclipsed the bright parent of day. Night fell upon every country, night, sudden, rayless, entire. The stars came out, shedding their ineffectual glimmerings on the light-widowed earth. But soon, the dim orb passed from over the sun and lingered down the eastern heaven. As it descended, its dusky rays crossed the brilliant ones of the sun and deadened or distorted them. The shadows of things assumed strange and ghastly shapes. The wild animals in the woods took fright at the unknown shapes figured on the ground. They fled they knew not whither, and the citizens were filled with greater dread at the convulsion which shook lions into civil streets. Birds, strong-winged eagles, suddenly blinded, fell in the marketplaces, while owls and bats shewed themselves welcoming the early night. Gradually, the object of fear sank beneath the horizon, and to the last, shot up shadowy beams into the otherwise radiant air. Such was the tale sent us from Asia, from the eastern extremity of Europe, and from Africa, as far west as the Golden Coast. Whether this story were true or not, the effects were certain. Through Asia, from the banks of the Nile to the shores of the Caspian, from the Hellespont even to the Sea of Omen, a sudden panic was driven. The men filled the mosques. The women, veiled, hastened to the tombs and carried offerings to the dead, thus to preserve the living. The plague was forgotten in this new fear which the black sun had spread. And though the dead multiplied, and the streets of Ispahan, of Pekin, and of Delhi were strewed with pestilence-struck corpses, men passed on, gazing on the ominous sky, regardless of the death beneath their feet. The Christians sought their churches, Christian maidens, even at the Feast of Roses, clad in white, with shining veils, sought, in long procession, the places consecrated to their religion, filling the air with their hymns. While, ever and anon, from the lips of some poor mourner in the crowd, a voice of wailing burst and the rest looked up, fancying they could discern the sweeping wings of angels who passed over the earth, lamenting the disasters about to fall on man. In the sunny clime of Persia, in the crowded cities of China, amidst the aromatic groves of Kashmir, and along the southern shores of the Mediterranean, such scenes had place. Even in Greece, the tale of the Son of Darkness increased the fears and despair of the dying multitude. We, in our cloudy isle, were far removed from danger, and the only circumstance that brought these disasters at all home to us was the daily arrival of vessels from the east, crowded with emigrants, mostly English. For the Moslems, though the fear of death was spread keenly among them, still clung together, that, if they were to die, and if they were, death would as readily meet them on the homeless sea or in far England as in Persia. 
If they were to die, their bones might rest in earth made sacred by the relics of true believers. Mecca had never before been so crowded with pilgrims, yet the Arabs neglected to pillage the caravans, but humble and weaponless, they joined the procession, praying Muhammad to avert plague from their tents and deserts. I cannot describe the rapturous delight with which I turned from political brawls at home and the physical evils of distant countries to my own dear home, to the selected abode of goodness and love, to peace and the interchange of every sacred sympathy. Had I never quitted Windsor, these emotions would not have been so intense, but I had in Greece been the prey of fear and deplorable change. In Greece, after a period of anxiety and sorrow, I had seen depart two, whose very names were the symbol of greatness and virtue. But such miseries could never intrude upon the domestic circle left to me, while, secluded in our beloved forest, we passed our lives in tranquility. Some small change, indeed, the progress of years brought here, and time, as it is wont, stamped the traces of mortality on our pleasures and expectations. Idris, the most affectionate wife, sister and friend, was a tender and loving mother. The feeling was not with her as with many, a pastime. It was a passion. We had had three children. One, the second in age, died while I was in Greece. This had dashed the triumphant and rapturous emotions of maternity with grief and fear. Before this event, the little beings sprung from herself the young heirs of her transient life, seemed to have a sure lease of existence. Now she dreaded that the pitiless destroyer might snatch her remaining darlings as it had snatched their brother. The least illness caused throes of terror. She was miserable if she were at all absent from them. Her treasure of happiness she had garnered in their fragile being and kept forever on the watch, lest the insidious thief should as before steal these valued gems. She had fortunately small cause for fear. Alfred, now nine years old, was an upright, manly little fellow, with radiant brow, soft eyes, and gentle though independent disposition. Our youngest was yet in infancy, but his downy cheek was sprinkled with the roses of health, and his unwearied vivacity filled our halls with innocent laughter. Clara had passed the age which, from its mute ignorance, was the source of the fears of Idris. Clara was dear to her to all. There was so much intelligence combined with innocence, sensibility with forbearance, and seriousness with perfect good humour, a beauty so transcendent, united to such endearing simplicity, that she hung like a pearl in the shrine of our possessions, a treasure of wonder and excellence. At the beginning of winter, our Alfred, now nine years of age, first went to school at Eton. This appeared to him the primary step towards manhood, and he was proportionably pleased. Community of study and amusement developed the best parts of his character, his steady perseverance, generosity, and well-governed firmness. What deep and sacred emotions are excited in a father's bosom when he first becomes convinced that his love for his child is not a mere instinct, but worthily bestowed, and that others, less akin, participate his approbation. It was supreme happiness to Idris and myself to find that the frankness which Alfred's open brow indicated, the intelligence of his eyes, the tempered sensibility of his tones, were not delusions, but indications of talents and virtues which would grow with his growth and strengthen with his strength. At this period, the termination of an animal's love for its offspring, the true affection of the human parent commences. We no longer look on this dearest part of ourselves as a tender plant which we must cherish or a plaything for an idle hour. We build now on his intellectual faculties. We establish our hopes on his moral propensities. His weakness still imparts anxiety to this feeling. His ignorance prevents entire intimacy. But we begin to respect the future man and to endeavor to secure his esteem, even as if he were our equal. What can a parent have more at heart than the good opinion of his child? In all our transactions with him, our honor must be inviolate, the integrity of our relations untainted, 
Fate and circumstance may, when he arrives at maturity, separate us forever. But as his aegis in danger, his consolation in hardship, let the ardent youth forever bear with him through the rough path of life, love, and honor for his parents. We had lived so long in the vicinity of Eton that its population of young folks was well known to us. Many of them had been Alfred's playmates before they became his schoolfellows. We now watch this youthful congregation with redoubled interest. We mark the difference of character among the boys and endeavor to read the future man in the stripling. There is nothing more lovely to which the heart more yearns than a free-spirited boy, gentle, brave, and generous. Several of the Etonians had these characteristics. All were distinguished by a sense of honor and spirit of enterprise. In some, as they verged towards manhood, this degenerated into presumption. But the younger ones, lads a little older than our own, were conspicuous for their gallant and sweet dispositions. Here were the future governors of England, the men who, when our ardor was cold and our projects completed or destroyed forever. When our drama acted, we doffed the garb of the hour and assumed the uniform of age or of more equalizing death. Here were the beings who were to carry on the vast machine of society. Here were the lovers, husbands, fathers. Here the landlord, the politician, the soldier. Some fancied that they were even now ready to appear on the stage, eager to make one among the dramatist personae of active life. It was not long since I was like one of these beardless aspirants. When my boy shall have obtained the place I now hold, I shall have tottered into a grey-headed, wrinkled old man. Strange system, riddle of the Sphinx, most awe-striking. That thus man remains, while we the individuals pass away. Such is, to borrow the words of an eloquent and philosophic writer, the mode of existence decreed to a permanent body composed of transitory parts, wherein, by the disposition of a stupendous wisdom, Molding together the great mysterious incorporation of the human race, the whole, at one time, is never old or middle-aged or young, but in a condition of unchangeable constancy, moves on through the varied tenor of perpetual decay, fall, renovation, and progression. Willingly do I give place to thee, dear Alfred. Advance, offspring of tender love, child of our hopes, Advance a soldier on the road to which I have been the pioneer. I will make way for thee. I have already put off the carelessness of childhood, the unlined brow and springy gait of early years, that they may adorn thee. Advance, and I will despoil myself still further for thy advantage. Time shall rob me of the graces of maturity, shall take the fire from my eyes, and agility from my limbs shall steal the better part of life eager expectation and passionate love and shower them in double portion on thy dear head. Advance, avail thyself of the gift, thou and thy comrades. And in the drama you are about to act, do not disgrace those who taught you to enter on the stage and to pronounce becomingly the parts assigned to you. May your progress be uninterrupted and secure. Born during the spring tide of the hopes of man, may you lead up the summer to which no winter may succeed. Chapter 5 Some disorder had surely crept into the course of the elements, destroying their benignant influence. The wind, prince of air, raged through his kingdom, lashing the sea into fury and subduing the rebel earth into some sort of obedience. The god sends down his angry plagues from high famine and pestilence, in heaps they die. Again, in vengeance of his wrath, he falls on their great hosts and breaks their tottering walls, arrests their navies on the ocean's plain, and whelms their strength with mountains of the main. Their deadly power shook the flourishing countries of the south, and during winter, even, we, in our northern retreat, began to quake under their ill effects. That fable is unjust, which gives the superiority to the sun over the wind. Who has not seen the lightsome earth, the balmy atmosphere, and basking nature become dark, cold and ungenial when the sleeping wind has awoke in the east? 
or when the dun clouds thickly veil the sky, while exhaustless stores of rain are poured down, until the dank earth refusing to imbibe the superabundant moisture, it lies in pools on the surface. When the torch of day seems like a meteor to be quenched, who has not seen the cloud-stirring north arise, the streaked blue appear, and soon an opening made in the vapours in the eye of the wind, through which the bright azure shines. The clouds become thin, an arch is formed for ever rising upwards, till, the universal cope being unveiled, the sun pours forth its rays, reanimated and fed by the breeze. Then mighty art thou, O wind, to be throned above all other vicegerents of nature's power, whether thou comest destroying from the east, or pregnant with elementary life from the west, thee the clouds obey, the sun is subservient to thee, the shoreless ocean is thy slave. Thou sweepest over the earth, and oaks, the growth of centuries, submit to thy viewless axe. The snowdrift is scattered on the pinnacles of the Alps, the avalanche thunders down their valleys. Thou holdest the keys of the frost, and canst first chain, and then set free the streams. Under thy gentle governance the buds and leaves are born, they flourish nursed by thee. Why dost thou howl thus, O wind? By day and by night, for four long months, thy roarings have not ceased. The shores of the sea are strewn with wrecks, its keel-welcoming surface has become impossible, the earth has shed her beauty in obedience to thy command. The frail balloon dares no longer sail on the agitated air. Thy ministers, the clouds, deluge the land with rain. Rivers forsake their banks, the wild torrent tears up the mountain path, Plain and wood and verdant dell are despoiled of their loveliness. Our very cities are wasted by thee. Alas, what will become of us? It seems as if the giant waves of ocean and vast arms of the sea were about to wrench the deep-rooted island from its center and cast it, a ruin and a wreck, upon the fields of the Atlantic. What are we, the inhabitants of this globe, least among the many that people infinite space, our minds embrace infinity. The visible mechanism of our being is subject to merest accident. Day by day, we are forced to believe this. He whom a scratch has disorganized, he who disappears from apparent life under the influence of the hostile agency at work around us, had the same powers as I. I also am subject to the same laws. In the face of all this, we call ourselves lords of the creation, wielders of the elements, masters of life and death, and we allege in excuse of this arrogance that though the individual is destroyed, man continues forever. Thus, losing our identity, that of which we are chiefly conscious, we glory in the continuity of our species and learn to regard death without terror. But when any whole nation becomes the victim of the destructive powers of exterior agents, then indeed man shrinks into insignificance. He feels his tenure of life insecure, his inheritance on earth cut off. I remember, after having witnessed the destructive effects of a fire, I could not even behold a small one in a stove without a sensation of fear. The mounting flames had curled round the building as it fell and was destroyed. They insinuated themselves into the substances about them, and the impediments to their progress yielded at their touch. Could we take integral parts of this power and not be subject to its operation? Could we domesticate a cub of this wild beast and not fear its growth and maturity? Thus we began to feel, with regard to many visaged death let loose on the chosen districts of our fair habitation, and above all, with regard to the plague. We feared the coming summer. Nations, bordering on the already infected countries, began to enter upon serious plans for the better, keeping out of the enemy. We, a commercial people, were obliged to bring such schemes under consideration, and the question of contagion became matter of earnest disquisition. That the plague was not what is commonly called contagious, like the scarlet fever or extinct smallpox, was proved. It was called an epidemic. 
but the grand question was still unsettled of how this epidemic was generated and increased. If infection depended upon the air, the air was subject to infection. As for instance, a typhus fever has been brought by ships to one seaport town, yet the very people who brought it there were incapable of communicating it in a town more fortunately situated. But how are we to judge of airs and pronounce, in such a city plague will die unproductive? In such another, nature has provided for it a plentiful harvest. In the same way, individuals may escape 99 times and receive the death blow at the hundredth, because bodies are sometimes in a state to reject the infection of malady, and at others thirsty to imbibe it. These reflections made our legislators pause before they could decide on the laws to be put in force. The evil was so widespreading, so violent and immedicable, that no care, no prevention could be judged superfluous, which even added a chance to our escape. These were questions of prudence. There was no immediate necessity for an earnest caution. England was still secure. France, Germany, Italy and Spain were interposed, walls yet without a breach between us and the plague. Our vessels truly were the sport of winds and waves, even as Gulliver was the toy of the Brobdignigians. But we on our stable abode could not be hurt in life or limb by these eruptions of nature. We could not fear, we did not. Yet a feeling of awe, a breathless sentiment of wonder, a painful sense of the degradation of humanity was introduced into every heart. Nature, our mother and our friend, had turned on us a brow of menace. She shewed us plainly that, though she permitted us to assign her laws and subdue her apparent powers, yet if she put forth but a finger, we must quake. She could take our globe, fringed with mountains, girded by the atmosphere, containing the condition of our being, and all that man's mind could invent, or his force achieve. She could take the ball in her hand and cast it into space where life would be drunk up, and man and all his efforts forever annihilated. These speculations were rife among us, yet not the less we proceeded in our daily occupations and our plans whose accomplishment demanded the lapse of many years. No voice was heard telling us to hold. When foreign distresses came to be felt by us through the channels of commerce, we set ourselves to apply remedies. Subscriptions were made for the emigrants, and merchants bankrupt by the failure of trade. The English spirit awoke to its full activity, and, as it had ever done, set itself to resist the evil, and to stand in the breach which diseased nature had suffered chaos and death to make in the bounds and banks which had hitherto kept them out. At the commencement of summer, we began to feel that the mischief which had taken place in distant countries was greater than we had at first suspected. Quito was destroyed by an earthquake. Mexico laid waste by the united effects of storm, pestilence, and famine. Crowds of emigrants inundated the west of Europe, and our island had become the refuge of thousands. In the meantime, Ryland had been chosen protector. He had sought this office with eagerness under the idea of turning his whole forces to the suppression of the privileged orders of our community. His measures were thwarted, and his schemes interrupted by this new state of things. Many of the foreigners were utterly destitute, and their increasing numbers at length forbade a recourse to the usual modes of relief. Trade was stopped by the failure of the interchange of cargoes usual between us and America, India, Egypt, and Greece. A sudden break was made in the routine of our lives. In vain our protector and his partisans sought to conceal this truth. In vain, day after day, he appointed a period for the discussion of the new laws concerning hereditary rank and privilege. In vain, he endeavoured to represent the evil as partial and temporary. These disasters came home to so many bosoms and, through the various channels of commerce, were carried so entirely into every class and division of the community that of necessity they became the first question in the state, the chief subjects to which we must turn our attention. Can it be true, each asked the other with wonder and dismay, that whole countries are laid waste, whole nations annihilated by these disorders in nature? 
The vast cities of America, the fertile plains of Hindustan, the crowded abodes of the Chinese are menaced with utter ruin. Where late the busy multitudes assembled for pleasure or profit, now only the sound of wailing and misery is heard. The air is empoisoned, and each human being inhales death, even while in youth and health their hopes are in the flower. We call to mind the plague of 1348, when it was calculated that a third of mankind had been destroyed. As yet, Western Europe was uninfected. Would it always be so? Oh yes, it would. Countrymen, fear not. In the still uncultivated wilds of America, what wonder that among its other giant destroyers, plague should be numbered. It is of old a native of the East, sister of the tornado, the earthquake, and the simoon. Child of the sun, a nursling of the tropics, it would expire in these climes. It drinks the dark blood of the inhabitant of the south, but it never feasts on the pale-faced Celt. If perchance some stricken Asiatic come among us, plague dies with him, uncommunicated and innoxious. Let us weep for our brethren, though we can never experience their reverse. Let us lament over and assist the children of the garden of the earth. Late. We envied their abodes, their spicy groves, fertile plains, and abundant loveliness. But in this mortal life, extremes are always matched. The thorn grows with the rose, the poison tree and the cinnamon mingle their boughs. Persia, with its cloth of gold, marble halls, and infinite wealth, is now a tomb. The tent of the Arab is fallen in the sands, and his horse spurns the ground unbridled and unsaddled. The voice of lamentation fills the valley of Kashmir. Its dells and woods, its cool fountains and gardens of roses are polluted by the dead. In Circassia and Georgia, the spirit of beauty weeps over the ruin of its favorite temple, the form of woman. Our own distresses, though they were occasioned by the fictitious reciprocity of commerce, increased in due proportion. Bankers, merchants and manufacturers whose trade depended on exports and interchange of wealth became bankrupt. Such things, when they happen singly, affect only the immediate parties. But the prosperity of the nation was now shaken by frequent and extensive losses. Families bred in opulence and luxury were reduced to beggary. The very state of peace in which we gloried was injurious. There were no means of employing the idle, or of sending any overplus of population out of the country. Even the source of colonies was dried up, for in New Holland, Van Diemen's Land, and the Cape of Good Hope, plague raged. Oh, for some medicinal vial to purge unwholesome nature and bring back the earth to its accustomed health. Ryland was a man of strong intellect and quick and sound decision in the usual course of things but he stood aghast at the multitude of evils that gathered round us. Must he tax the landed interest to assist our commercial population? To do this, he must gain the favour of the chief landholders, the nobility of the country, and these were his vowed enemies. He must conciliate them by abandoning his favourite scheme of equalisation. He must confirm them in their manorial rights. He must sell his cherished plans for the permanent good of his country for temporary relief. He must aim no more at the dear object of his ambition. Throwing his arms aside, he must for present ends give up the ultimate object of his endeavours. He came to Windsor to consult with us, every day added to his difficulties. The arrival of fresh vessels with emigrants, the total cessation of commerce, the starving multitude that thronged around the palace of the Protectorate were circumstances not to be tampered with. The blow was struck. The aristocracy obtained all they wished, and they subscribed to a 12-month's bill which levied 20% on all the rent rolls of the country. Calm was now restored to the metropolis and to the populous cities before driven to desperation, and we returned to the consideration of distant calamities, wondering if the future would bring any alleviation to their excess. It was August, so there could be small hope of relief during the heats. On the contrary, the disease gained virulence, while starvation did its accustomed work. Thousands died unlamented, 
For beside the yet warm corpse, the mourner was stretched, made mute by death. On the 18th of this month, news arrived in London that the plague was in France and Italy. These tidings were at first whispered about town, but no one dared express aloud the soul-quailing intelligence. When anyone met a friend in the street, he only cried as he hurried on, You know! While the other, with an ejaculation of fear and horror, would answer, What will become of us? At length it was mentioned in the newspapers. The paragraph was inserted in an obscure part. We regret to state that there can be no longer a doubt of the plague having been introduced at Leghorn, Genoa and Marseille. No word of comment followed. Each reader made his own fearful one. We were as a man who hears that his house is burning and yet hurries through the streets, borne along by a lurking hope of a mistake, till he turns the corner and sees his sheltering roof enveloped in a flame. Before it had been a rumour, but now in words unerasable, in definite and undeniable print, the knowledge went forth. Its obscurity of situation rendered it the more conspicuous. The diminutive letters grew gigantic to the bewildered eye of fear. They seemed graven with a pen of iron, impressed by fire, woven in the clouds, stamped on the very front of the universe. The English, whether travellers or residents, came pouring in one great revulsive stream back on their own country, and with them crowds of Italians and Spaniards. Our little island was filled even to bursting. At first, an unusual quantity of specie made its appearance with the emigrants, but these people had no means of receiving back into their hands what they spent among us. With the advance of summer and the increase of the distemper, rents were unpaid and their remittances failed them. It was impossible to see these crowds of wretched, perishing creatures, late nurslings of luxury, and not stretch out a hand to save them. As at the conclusion of the 18th century, the English unlocked their hospitable store for the relief of those driven from their homes by political revolution. So now they were not backward in affording aid to the victims of a more wide-spreading calamity. We had many foreign friends whom we eagerly sought out and relieved from dreadful penury. Our castle became an asylum for the unhappy. A little population occupied its halls. The revenue of its possessor, which had always found a mode of expenditure congenial to his generous nature, was now attended to more parsimoniously that it might embrace a wider portion of utility. It was not, however, money, except partially, but the necessaries of life that became scarce. It was difficult to find an immediate remedy. The usual one of imports was entirely cut off. In this emergency, to feed the very people to whom we had given refuge, we were obliged to yield to the plough and the mattock our pleasure grounds and parks. Live stock diminished sensibly in the country from the effects of the great demand in the market. Even the poor deer, our antlered protégés, were obliged to fall for the sake of worthier pensioners. The labour necessary to bring the lands to this sort of culture employed and fed the offcasts of the diminished manufactories. Adrian did not rest only with the exertions he could make with regard to his own possessions. He addressed himself to the wealthy of the land. He made proposals in Parliament little adapted to please the rich, but his earnest pleadings and benevolent eloquence were irresistible. To give up their pleasure grounds to the agriculturist, to diminish sensibly the number of horses kept for the purposes of luxury throughout the country, were means obvious but unpleasing. Yet, to the honour of the English be it recorded, that although natural disinclination made them delay a while, yet when the misery of their fellow creatures became glaring, an enthusiastic generosity inspired their decrees. The most luxurious were often the first to part with their indulgences, as is common in communities, a fashion was set. The high-born ladies of the country would have deemed themselves disgraced if they had now enjoyed what they before called a necessary, the ease of a carriage. Chairs, as in olden time and Indian palanquins, were introduced for the infirm, but else it was nothing singular to see females of rank going on foot to places of fashionable resort. It was more common 
for all who possessed landed property to secede to their estates, attended by whole troops of the indigent, to cut down their woods to erect temporary dwellings and to portion out their parks, parterres and flower gardens to necessitous families. Many of these, of high rank in their own countries now, with hoe in hand, turned up the soil. It was found necessary at last to check the spirit of sacrifice and to remind those whose generosity proceeded to lavish waste that until the present state of things became permanent, of which there was no likelihood, it was wrong to carry change so far as to make a reaction difficult. Experience demonstrated that in a year or two pestilence would cease. It were well that in the meantime we should not have destroyed our fine breeds of horses or have utterly changed the face of the ornamented portion of the country. It may be imagined that things were in a bad state indeed before this spirit of benevolence could have struck such deep roots. The infection had now spread in the southern provinces of France, but that country had so many resources in the way of agriculture that the rush of population from one part of it to another and its increase through foreign emigration was less felt than with us. The panic struck appeared of more injury than disease and its natural concomitants. Winter was hailed, a general and never failing physician. The embrowning woods and swollen rivers, the evening mists and morning frosts were welcomed with gratitude. The effects of purifying cold were immediately felt and the lists of mortality abroad were curtailed each week. Many of our visitors left us. Those whose homes were far in the south fled delightedly from our northern winter and sought their native land, secure of plenty even after their fearful visitation. We breathed again. What the coming summer would bring we knew not, but the present months were our own, and our hopes of a cessation of pestilence were high. Chapter 6 I have lingered thus long on the extreme bank, the wasting shoal that stretched into the stream of life, dallying with the shadow of death. Thus long I have cradled my heart in retrospection of past happiness, when hope was. Why not forever thus? I am not immortal, and the thread of my history might be spun out to the limits of my existence, but the same sentiment that first led me to pour tray scenes replete with tender recollections now bids me hurry on. The same yearning of this warm, panting heart that has made me in written words record my vagabond youth, my serene manhood, and the passions of my soul makes me now recoil from further delay. I must complete my work. Here then I stand, as I said, beside the fleet waters of the flowing years, and now away. Spread the sail and strain with oar, hurrying by dark impending crags adown steep rapids even to the sea of desolation I have reached. Yet one moment, one brief interval before I put from shore. Once, once again let me fancy myself as I was in 2094 in my abode at Windsor. Let me close my eyes and imagine that the immeasurable boughs of its oaks still shadow me, its castle walls are near. Let fancy portray the joyous scene of the 20th of June, such as even now my aching heart recalls it. Circumstances had called me to London. Here I heard talk that symptoms of the plague had occurred in hospitals of that city. I returned to Windsor. My brow was clouded, my heart heavy. I entered the little park, as was my custom, at the Frogmore Gate on my way to the castle. A great part of these grounds had been given to cultivation, and strips of potato land and corn were scattered here and there. The rooks cawed loudly in the trees above, mixed with their hoarse cries, I heard a lively strain of music. It was Alfred's birthday. The young people, the Etonians and children of the neighbouring gentry held a mock fair, to which all the country people were invited. The park was speckled by tents, whose flaunting colours and gaudy flags, waving in the sunshine, added to the gaiety of the scene. On a platform erected beneath the terrace, a number of the younger part of the assembly were dancing. I leaned against a tree to observe them. The band played the wild eastern air of Weber introduced in Abon Hassan. Its volatile notes gave wings to the feet of the dancers, while the lookers-on unconsciously beat time. 
At first, the tripping measure lifted my spirit with it, and for a moment, my eyes gladly followed the mazes of the dance. The revulsion of thought passed like keen steel to my heart. Ye are all going to die, I thought. Already your tomb is built up around you. A while, because you are gifted with agility and strength, you fancy that you live, but frail is the bower of flesh that encaskets life, dissoluble the silver cord that binds you to it. The joyous soul, charioted from pleasure to pleasure by the graceful mechanism of well-formed limbs, will suddenly feel the axle tree give way, and spring and wheel dissolve in dust. Not one of you, O oh, fated crowd, can escape. Not one, not my own ones, not my Idris and her babes, horror and misery. Already the gay dance vanished, the green sward was strewn with corpses, the blue air above became fetid with deathly exhalations. Shriek, ye clarions, ye loud trumpets howl, pile dirge on dirge, rouse the funereal chords, let the air ring with dire wailing, let wild discord rush on the wings of the wind. Already I hear it, while guardian angels, attendant on humanity, their task achieved, hasten away and their departure is announced by melancholy strains. Faces all unseemly with weeping forced open my lids, faster and faster. Many groups of these woe-begone countenances thronged around, exhibiting every variety of wretchedness. Well-known faces mingled with the distorted creations of fancy. Ashy pale, Raymond and Perdita sat apart, looking on with sad smiles. Adrian's countenance flitted across, tainted by death. Idris, with eyes languidly closed and livid lips, was about to slide into the wide grave. The confusion grew. Their looks of sorrow changed to mockery. They nodded their heads in time to the music, whose clang became maddening. I felt that this was insanity. I sprang forward to throw it off. I rushed into the midst of the crowd. Idris saw me. With light step, she advanced as I folded her in my arms, feeling, as I did, that I thus enclosed what was to me a world, yet frail as the water drop which the noonday sun will drink from the water lily's cup. Tears filled my eyes, unwont to be thus moistened. The joyful welcome of my boys, the soft gratulation of Clara, the pressure of Adrian's hand contributed to unman me. I felt that they were near, that they were safe, yet methought this was all deceit. The earth reeled, the firm enrooted trees moved. Dizziness came over me. I sank to the ground. My beloved friends were alarmed. Nay, they expressed their alarm so anxiously that I dared not pronounce the word plague that hovered on my lips, lest they should construe my perturbed looks into a symptom and see infection in my languor. I had scarcely recovered, and with feigned hilarity had brought back smiles into my little circle when we saw Ryland approach. Ryland had something the appearance of a farmer, of a man whose muscles and full-grown stature had been developed under the influence of vigorous exercise and exposure to the elements. This was to a great degree the case, for though a large landed proprietor, yet being a projector and of an ardent and industrious disposition, he had on his own estate given himself up to agricultural labours. When he went as ambassador to the northern states of America, he, for some time, planned his entire migration, and went so far as to make several journeys far westward on that immense continent for the purpose of choosing the site of his new abode. Ambition turned his thoughts from these designs. Ambition, which labouring through various lets and hindrances, had now led him to the summit of his hopes in making him Lord Protector of England. His countenance was rough but intelligent. His ample brow and quick grey eyes seemed to look out over his own plans and the opposition of his enemies. His voice was stentorian. His hand stretched out in debate, seemed by its gigantic and muscular form to warn his hearers that words were not his only weapons. Few people had discovered some cowardice and much infirmity of purpose under this imposing exterior. No man could crush a butterfly on the wheel with better effect. No man better cover a speedy retreat from a powerful adversary. 
This had been the secret of his secession at the time of Lord Raymond's election. In the unsteady glance of his eye, in his extreme desire to learn the opinions of all, in the feebleness of his handwriting, these qualities might be obscurely traced, but they were not generally known. He was now our Lord Protector. He had canvassed eagerly for this post. His protectorate was to be distinguished by every kind of innovation on the aristocracy. This, his selected task, was exchanged for the far different one of encountering the ruin caused by the convulsions of physical nature. He was incapable of meeting these evils by any comprehensive system. He had resorted to expedient after expedient, and could never be induced to put a remedy in force till it came too late to be of use. Certainly the Ryland that advanced towards us now bore small resemblance to the powerful, ironical, seemingly fearless canvasser for the first rank among Englishmen. Our native oak, as his partisans called him, was visited truly by a nipping winter. He scarcely appeared half his usual height, his joints were unknit, his limbs would not support him, his face was contracted, his eye wandering. Debility of purpose and dastard fear were expressed in every gesture. In answer to our eager questions, one word alone fell, as it were involuntarily, from his convulsed lips. The plague. Where? Everywhere. We must fly. All fly. But whither? No man can tell. There is no refuge on earth. It comes on us like a thousand packs of wolves. We must all fly. Where shall you go? Where can any of us go? These words were syllabled trembling by the Iron Man. Adrian replied, Whither indeed would you fly? We must all remain and do our best to help our suffering fellow creatures. Help, said Ryland. There is no help. Great God who talks of help. All the world has the plague. Then to avoid it, we must quit the world, observed Adrian with a gentle smile. Ryland groaned, cold drops stood on his brow. It was useless to oppose his paroxysm of terror, but we soothed and encouraged him, so that after an interval he was better able to explain to us the ground of his alarm. It had come sufficiently home to him. One of his servants, while waiting on him, had suddenly fallen down dead. The physician declared that he died of the plague. We endeavoured to calm him, but our own hearts were not calm. I saw the eye of Idris wander from me to her children with an anxious appeal to my judgment. Adrian was absorbed in meditation. For myself, I own that Ryland's words rang in my ears. All the world was infected. In what uncontaminated seclusion could I save my beloved treasures until the shadow of death had passed from over the earth? We sunk into silence a silence that drank in the doleful accounts and prognostications of our guest. We had receded from the crowd, and ascending the steps of the terrace, sought the castle. Our change of cheer struck those nearest to us, and by means of Ryland's servants, the report soon spread that he had fled from the plague in London. The sprightly parties broke up, they assembled in whispering groups. The spirit of gaiety was eclipsed, the music ceased. The young people left their occupations and gathered together. The lightness of heart, which had dressed them in masquerade habits, had decorated their tents and assembled them in fantastic groups, appeared a sin against and a provocative to the awful destiny that had laid its palsying hand upon hope and life. The merriment of the hour was an unholy mockery of the sorrows of man. The foreigners whom we had among us, who had fled from the plague in their own country, now saw their last asylum invaded, and, fear making them garrulous, they described to eager listeners the miseries they had beheld in cities visited by the calamity, and gave fearful accounts of the insidious and irremediable nature of the disease. We had entered the castle. Idris stood at a window that overlooked the park. Her maternal eyes sought her own children among the young crowd. An Italian lad had got an audience about him, and with animated gestures was describing some scene of horror. Alfred stood immovable before him, his whole attention absorbed. Little Evelyn had endeavoured to draw Clara away to play with him, but the Italian's tale arrested her. She crept near, 
her lustrous eyes fixed on the speaker, either watching the crowd in the park or occupied by painful reflection, we were all silent. Ryland stood by himself in an embrasure of the window. Adrian paced the hall, revolving some new and overpowering idea. Suddenly he stopped and said, I have long expected this. Could we in reason expect that this island should be exempt from the universal visitation? The evil is come home to us, and we must not shrink from our fate. What are your plans, my Lord Protector, for the benefit of our country? For heaven's love, Windsor, cried Ryland. Do not mock me with that title. Death and disease level all men. I neither pretend to protect nor govern an hospital. Such will England quickly become. Do you then intend, now in time of peril, to recede from your duties? Duties? Speak rationally, my lord. When I am a plague-spotted corpse, where will my duties be? Every man for himself. The devil take the protectorship, say I, if it expose me to danger. Faint-hearted man, cried Adrian indignantly. Your countrymen put their trust in you, and you betray them. I betray them, said Ryland. The plague betrays me, faint-hearted. It is well, shut up in your castle out of danger, to boast yourself out of fear. Take the protectorship who will. Before God, I renounce it. And before God, replied his opponent fervently, do I receive it. No one will canvass for this honour now. None envy my danger or labours. Deposit your powers in my hands. Long have I fought with death, and much, he stretched out his thin hand, much have I suffered in the struggle. It is not by flying, but by facing the enemy that we can conquer. If my last combat is now about to be fought, and I am to be worsted, so let it be. But come, Ryland, recollect yourself. Men have hitherto thought you magnanimous and wise. Will you cast aside these titles? Consider the panic your departure will occasion. Return to London. I will go with you. Encourage the people by your presence. I will incur all the danger. Shame, shame, if the first magistrate of England be foremost to renounce his duties. Meanwhile, among our guests in the park, all thoughts of festivity had faded. As summer flies are scattered by rain, so did this congregation, late noisy and happy, in sadness and melancholy murmurs break up, dwindling away apace. With the set sun and the deepening twilight, the park became nearly empty. Adrian and Ryland were still in earnest discussion. We had prepared a banquet for our guests in the lower hall of the castle, and thither Idris and I repaired to receive and entertain the few that remained. There is nothing more melancholy than a merry meeting thus turned to sorrow. The gala dresses, the decorations, gay as they might otherwise be, receive a solemn and funereal appearance. If such change be painful from lighter causes, it weighed with intolerable heaviness from the knowledge that the earth's desolator had at last, even as an archfiend, lightly overleaped the boundaries our precautions raised, and at once enthroned himself in the full and beating heart of our country. Idris sat at the top of the half-empty hall. Pale and tearful, she almost forgot her duties as hostess. Her eyes were fixed on her children. Alfred's serious air shewed that he still revolved the tragic story related by the Italian boy. Evelyn was the only mirthful creature present. He sat on Clara's lap, and making matter of glee from his own fancies, laughed aloud. The vaulted roof echoed again his infant tone. The poor mother, who had brooded long over and suppressed the expression of her anguish, now burst into tears and, folding her babe in her arms, hurried from the hall. Clara and Alfred followed, while the rest of the company, in confused murmur, which grew louder and louder, gave voice to their many fears. The younger part gathered round me to ask my advice, and those who had friends in London were anxious beyond the rest to ascertain the present extent of disease in the metropolis. I encouraged them with such thoughts of cheer as presented themselves. I told them exceedingly few deaths had yet been occasioned by pestilence, and gave them hopes as we were the last visited, so the calamity might have lost its most venomous power before it had reached us. The cleanliness, habits of order, and the manner in which our cities were built, 
were all in our favour. As it was an epidemic, its chief force was derived from pernicious qualities in the air, and it would probably do little harm where this was naturally salubrious. At first, I had spoken only to those nearest me, but the whole assembly gathered about me, and I found that I was listened to by all. My friends, I said, our risk is common. Our precautions and exertions shall be common also. If manly courage and resistance can save us, we will be saved. We will fight the enemy to the last. Plague shall not find us a ready prey. We will dispute every inch of ground, and, by methodical and inflexible laws, pile invincible barriers to the progress of our foe. Perhaps in no part of the world has she met with so systematic and determined an opposition. Perhaps no country is naturally so well protected against our invader, nor has nature anywhere been so well assisted by the hand of man. We will not despair. We are neither cowards nor fatalists. But, believing that God has placed the means for our preservation in our own hands, we will use those means to our utmost. Remember that cleanliness, sobriety, and even good humor and benevolence are our best medicines. There was little I could add to this general exhortation, for the plague, though in London, was not among us. I dismissed the guests, therefore, and they went thoughtful, more than sad, to await the events in store for them. I now sought Adrian, anxious to hear the result of his discussion with Ryland. He had in part prevailed. The Lord Protector consented to return to London for a few weeks, during which time things should be so arranged as to occasion less consternation at his departure. Adrian and Idris were together, the sadness with which the former had first heard that the plague was in London had vanished. The energy of his purpose informed his body with strength. The solemn joy of enthusiasm and self-devotion illuminated his countenance, and the weakness of his physical nature seemed to pass from him, as the cloud of humanity did in the ancient fable from the divine lover of Semele. He was endeavoring to encourage his sister and to bring her to look on his intent in a less tragic light than she was prepared to do, and with passionate eloquence he unfolded his designs to her. Let me, at the first word, he said, relieve your mind from all fear on my account. I will not task myself beyond my powers, nor will I needlessly seek danger. I feel that I know what ought to be done, and as my presence is necessary for the accomplishment of my plans, I will take a special care to preserve my life. I am now going to undertake an office fitted for me. I cannot intrigue or work a tortuous path through the labyrinth of men's vices and passions, but I can bring patience and sympathy and such aid as art affords to the bed of disease. I can raise from earth the miserable orphan and awaken to new hopes the shut heart of the mourner. I can enchain the plague in limits and set a term to the misery it would occasion. Courage, forbearance, and watchfulness are the forces I bring towards this great work. Oh, I shall be something now. From my birth I have aspired like the eagle, but unlike the eagle, my wings have failed, and my vision has been blinded. Disappointment and sickness have hitherto held dominion over me. Twin born with me, my wood, was forever enchained by the shall not of these my tyrants. A shepherd boy that tends a silly flock on the mountains was more in the scale of society than I. Congratulate me then that I have found fitting scope for my powers. I have often thought of offering my services to the pestilence-stricken towns of France and Italy, but fear of paining you and expectation of this catastrophe withheld me. To England and to Englishmen I dedicate myself. If I can save one of her mighty spirits from the deadly shaft, if I can ward disease from one of her smiling cottages, I shall not have lived in vain. Strange ambition this, yet such was Adrian. He appeared given up to contemplation, averse to excitement, a lowly student, a man of visions, but afford him worthy theme, and, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. So did he spring up from listlessness and unproductive thought to the highest pitch of virtuous action. With him went enthusiasm, 
the high-wrought resolve, the eye that without blenching could look at death. With us remained sorrow, anxiety, and unendurable expectation of evil. The man, says Lord Bacon, who hath wife and children, has given hostages to fortune. Vain was all philosophical reasoning, vain all fortitude, vain, vain, a reliance on probable good. I might heap high the scale with logic, courage, and resignation, but let one fear for Idris and our children enter the opposite one, and overweighed, it kicked the beam. The plague was in London. Fools that we were not long ago to have foreseen this. We wept over the ruin of the boundless continents of the East and the desolation of the Western world, while we fancied that the little channel between our island and the rest of the earth was to preserve us alive among the dead. It were no mighty leap me things from Calais to Dover. The eye easily discerns the sister land. They were united once, and the little path that runs between looks in a map but as a trodden footway through high grass. Yet this small interval was to save us. The sea was to rise a wall of adamant, without disease and misery, within a shelter from evil, a nook of the garden of paradise, a particle of celestial soil which no evil could invade. Truly we were wise in our generation to imagine all these things. But we are awake now, the plague is in London, the air of England is tainted, and her sons and daughters strew the unwholesome earth. And now the sea, late our defence, seems our prison bound. Hemmed in by its gulfs, we shall die like the famished inhabitants of a besieged town. Other nations have a fellowship in death, but we, shut out from all neighbourhood, must bury our own dead, and little England become a wide, wide tomb. This feeling of universal misery assumed concentration and shape when I looked on my wife and children, and the thought of danger to them possessed my whole being with fear. How could I save them? I revolved a thousand and a thousand plans. They should not die. First I would be gathered to nothingness, ere infection should come anear these idols of my soul. I would walk barefoot through the world to find an uninfected spot, I would build my home on some wave-tossed plank, drifted about on the barren, shoreless ocean. I would betake me with them to some wild beast's den, where a tiger's cubs, which I would slay, had been reared in health. I would seek the mountain eagle's airy, and live years suspended in some inaccessible recess of a sea-bounding cliff, no labour too great, no scheme too wild, if it promised life to them. O oh, ye heartstrings of mine, could ye be torn asunder, and my soul not spend itself in tears of blood for sorrow? Idris, after the first shock, regained a portion of fortitude. She studiously shut out all prospect of the future, and cradled her heart in present blessings. She never for a moment lost sight of her children, but while they in health sported about her, she could cherish contentment and hope. A strange and wild restlessness came over me, the more intolerable, because I was forced to conceal it. My fears for Adrian were ceaseless. August had come, and the symptoms of plague increased rapidly in London. It was deserted by all who possessed the power of removing, and he, the brother of my soul, was exposed to the perils from which all but slaves enchained by circumstance fled. He remained to combat the fiend his side unguarded, his toils unshared, infection might even reach him, and he'd die unattended and alone. By day and night these thoughts pursued me. I resolved to visit London, to see him, to quiet these agonizing throes by the sweet medicine of hope or the opiate of despair. It was not until I arrived at Brentford that I perceived much change in the face of the country. The better sort of houses were shut up, the busy trade of the town palsied, there was an air of anxiety among the few passengers I met, and they looked wonderingly at my carriage, the first they had seen pass towards London, since pestilence sat on its high places and possessed its busy streets. I met several funerals, they were slenderly attended by mourners and were regarded by the spectators as omens of direst import. Some gazed on these processions with wild eagerness. 
Others fled timidly. Some wept aloud. Adrian's chief endeavor, after the immediate succor of the sick, had been to disguise the symptoms and progress of the plague from the inhabitants of London. He knew that fear and melancholy forebodings were powerful assistants to disease, that desponding and brooding care rendered the physical nature of man peculiarly susceptible of infection. No unseemly sights were therefore discernible. The shops were in general open, the concourse of passengers in some degree kept up. But although the appearance of an infected town was avoided, to me, who had not beheld it since the commencement of the visitation, London appeared sufficiently changed. There were no carriages, and grass had sprung high in the streets. The houses had a desolate look. Most of the shutters were closed, and there was a ghast and frightened stare in the persons I met, very different from the usual business-like demeanor of the Londoners. My solitary carriage attracted notice as it rattled along towards the protectoral palace, and the fashionable streets leading to it wore a still more dreary and deserted appearance. I found Adrian's antechamber crowded, it was his hour for giving audience. I was unwilling to disturb his labors and waited, watching the ingress and egress of the petitioners. They consisted of people of the middling and lower classes of society, whose means of subsistence failed with the cessation of trade and of the busy spirit of money-making in all its branches, peculiar to our country. There was an air of anxiety sometimes of terror in the newcomers, strongly contrasted with the resigned and even satisfied mien of those who had had audience. I could read the influence of my friend in their quickened motions and cheerful faces. Two o'clock struck, after which none were admitted. Those who had been disappointed went sullenly or sorrowfully away while I entered the audience chamber. I was struck by the improvement that appeared in the health of Adrian. He was no longer bent to the ground like an over-nursed flower of spring, that shooting up beyond its strength is weighed down even by its own coronal of blossoms. His eyes were bright, his countenance composed, an air of concentrated energy was diffused over his whole person, much unlike its former languor. He sat at a table with several secretaries who were arranging petitions or registering the notes made during that day's audience. Two or three petitioners were still in attendance. I admired his justice and patience. Those who possessed a power of living out of London, he advised immediately to quit it, affording them the means of so doing. Others, whose trade was beneficial to the city, or who possessed no other refuge, he provided with advice for better avoiding the epidemic. Relieving overloaded families, supplying the gaps made in others by death. Order, comfort, and even health rose under his influence as from the touch of a magician's wand. I am glad you are come, he said to me, when we were at last alone. I can only spare a few minutes and must tell you much in that time. The plague is now in progress. It is useless closing one's eyes to the fact. The deaths increase each week. What will come, I cannot guess. As yet, thank God I am equal to the government of the town, and I look only to the present. Ryland, whom I have so long detained, has stipulated that I shall suffer him to depart before the end of this month. The deputy appointed by Parliament is dead. Another, therefore, must be named. I have advanced my claim, and I believe that I shall have no competitor. Tonight the question is to be decided, as there is a call of the House for the purpose. You must nominate me, Lionel. Ryland, for shame, cannot show himself. But you, my friend, will do me this service. How lovely is devotion. Here was a youth, royally sprung, bred in luxury, by nature averse to the usual struggles of a public life. And now, in time of danger, at a period when to live was the utmost scope of the ambitious, he, the beloved and heroic Adrian, made, in sweet simplicity, an offer to sacrifice himself for the public good. The very idea was generous and noble, but beyond this, his unpretending manner, his entire want of the assumption of a virtue, rendered his act ten times more touching. I would have withstood his request, but I had seen the good he diffused. I felt that his resolves were not to be shaken, so with an heavy heart, I consented to do as he asked. 
He grasped my hand affectionately. Thank you, he said. You have relieved me from a painful dilemma and are, as you ever were, the best of my friends. Farewell. I must now leave you for a few hours. Go you and converse with Ryland. Although he deserts his post in London, he may be of the greatest service in the north of England by receiving and assisting travellers and contributing to supply the metropolis with food. Awaken him, I entreat you, to some sense of duty. Adrian left me, as I afterwards learned, upon his daily task of visiting the hospitals and inspecting the crowded parts of London. I found Ryland much altered, even from what he had been when he visited Windsor. Perpetual fear had jaundiced his complexion and shriveled his whole person. I told him of the business of the evening, and a smile relaxed the contracted muscles. He desired to go. Each day he expected to be infected by pestilence. Each day he was unable to resist the gentle violence of Adrian's detention. The moment Adrian should be legally elected his deputy, he would escape to safety. Under this impression he listened to all I said, and elevated almost to joy by the near prospect of his departure, he entered into a discussion concerning the plans he should adopt in his own county, forgetting, for the moment, his cherished resolution of shutting himself up from all communication in the mansion and grounds of his estate. In the evening, Adrian and I proceeded to Westminster. As we went, he reminded me of what I was to say and do, yet, strange to say, I entered the chamber without having once reflected on my purpose. Adrian remained in the coffee room, while I, in compliance with his desire, took my seat in St. Stephen's S. There reigned unusual silence in the chamber. I had not visited it since Raymond's protectorate, a period conspicuous for a numerous attendance of members, for the eloquence of the speakers and the warmth of the debate. The benches were very empty, those by custom occupied by the hereditary members were vacant. The city members were there, the members for the commercial towns, few landed proprietors, and not many of those who entered Parliament for the sake of a career. The first subject that occupied the attention of the House was an address from the Lord Protector, praying them to appoint a deputy during a necessary absence on his part. A silence prevailed, till one of the members coming to me whispered that the Earl of Windsor had sent him word that I was to move his election, in the absence of the person who had been first chosen for this office. Now, for the first time, I saw the full extent of my task, and I was overwhelmed by what I had brought on myself. Ryland had deserted his post through fear of the plague, from the same fear Adrian had no competitor. And I, the nearest kinsman of the Earl of Windsor, was to propose his election. I was to thrust this selected and matchless friend into the post of danger. Impossible. The die was cast. I would offer myself as candidate. The few members who were present had come more for the sake of terminating the business by securing a legal attendance than under the idea of a debate. I had risen mechanically. My knees trembled, irresolution hung on my voice as I uttered a few words on the necessity of choosing a person adequate to the dangerous task in hand. But when the idea of presenting myself in the room of my friend intruded, the load of doubt and pain was taken from off me. My words flowed spontaneously. My utterance was firm and quick. I adverted to what Adrian had already done. I promised the same vigilance in furthering all his views. I drew a touching picture of his vacillating health. I boasted of my own strength. I prayed them to save even from himself this scion of the noblest family in England. My alliance with him was the pledge of my sincerity. My union with his sister, my children, his presumptive heirs, were the hostages of my truth. This unexpected turn in the debate was quickly communicated to Adrian. He hurried in and witnessed the termination of my impassioned harangue. I did not see him. My soul was in my words. My eyes could not perceive that which was, while a vision of Adrian's form, tainted by pestilence and sinking in death, floated before them. He seized my hand as I concluded. Unkind, he cried. You have betrayed me. Then, springing forwards with the air of one who had a right to command, he claimed the place of deputy as his own. He had bought it, he said, with danger, and paid for it with toil. 
His ambition rested there, and after an interval devoted to the interests of his country, was I to step in and reap the profit. Let them remember what London had been when he arrived. The panic that prevailed brought famine, while every moral and legal tie was loosened. He had restored order. This had been a work which required perseverance, patience and energy, and he had neither slept nor waked but for the good of his country. Would they dare wrong him thus? Would they wrest his hard-earned reward from him to bestow it on one, who, never having mingled in public life, would come a tyro to the craft in which he was an adept? He demanded the place of deputy as his right. Ryland had shown that he preferred him. Never before had he, who was born even to the inheritance of the throne of England, never had he asked favour or honour from those now his equals, but who might have been his subjects. Would they refuse him? Could they thrust back from the path of distinction and laudable ambition, the heir of their ancient kings, and heap another disappointment on a fallen house? No one had ever before heard Adrian allude to the rights of his ancestors. None had ever before suspected that power or the suffrage of the many could in any manner become dear to him. He had begun his speech with vehemence. He ended with unassuming gentleness, making his appeal with the same humility, as if he had asked to be the first in wealth, honour and power among Englishmen, and not, as was the truth, to be the foremost in the ranks of loathsome toils and inevitable death. A murmur of approbation rose after his speech. Oh, do not listen to him, I cried. He speaks false, false to himself. I was interrupted, and silence being restored, we were ordered, as was the custom, to retire during the decision of the house. I fancied that they hesitated, and that there was some hope for me. I was mistaken. Hardly had we quitted the chamber before Adrian was recalled and installed in his office of Lord Deputy to the Protector. We returned together to the palace. Why, Lionel, said Adrian, what did you intend? You could not hope to conquer, and yet you gave me the pain of a triumph over my dearest friend. This is mockery, I replied. You devote yourself. You, the adored brother of Idris, the being of all the world contains dearest to our hearts, you devote yourself to an early death. I would have prevented this. My death would be a small evil, or rather I should not die while you cannot hope to escape. As to the likelihood of escaping, said Adrian, ten years hence the cold stars may shine on the graves of all of us, but as to my peculiar liability to infection, I could easily prove, both logically and physically, that in the midst of contagion I have a better chance of life than you. This is my post. I was born for this, to rule England in anarchy, to save her in danger, to devote myself for her, the blood of my forefathers cries aloud in my veins and bids me be first among my countrymen. Or, if this mode of speech offend you, let me say that my mother, the proud queen, instilled early into me a love of distinction, and all that, if the weakness of my physical nature and my peculiar opinions had not prevented such a design, might have made me long since struggle for the lost inheritance of my race. But now, my mother, or, if you will, my mother's lessons, awaken within me. I cannot lead on to battle. I cannot, through intrigue and faithlessness, rear again the throne upon the wreck of English public spirit. But I can be the first to support and guard my country, now that terrific disasters and ruin have laid strong hands upon her. That country and my beloved sister are all I have. I will protect the first. The latter I commit to your charge. If I survive and she be lost, I were far better dead. Preserve her. For her own sake I know that you will. If you require any other spur, think that, in preserving her, you preserve me. Her faultless nature, one sum of perfections, is wrapped up in her affections. If they were hurt, she would droop like an unwatered floweret, and the slightest injury they receive is a nipping frost to her. Already she fears for us. She fears for the children she adores, and for you, the father of these, her lover, husband, protector, 
and you must be near her to support and encourage her. Return to Windsor then, my brother, for such you are by every tie. Fill the double place my absence imposes on you, and let me, in all my sufferings here, turn my eyes towards that dear seclusion, and say, there is peace. Chapter 7 I did proceed to Windsor, but not with the intention of remaining there. I went but to obtain the consent of Idris, and then to return and take my station beside my unequalled friend, to share his labours and save him, if so it must be, at the expense of my life. Yet I dreaded to witness the anguish which my resolve might excite in Idris. I had vowed to my own heart never to shadow her countenance even with transient grief and should I prove recreant at the hour of greatest need. I had begun my journey with anxious haste. Now I desire to draw it out through the course of days and months. I long to avoid the necessity of action. I strove to escape from thought, vainly, futurity, like a dark image in a phantasmagoria, came nearer and more near, till it clasped the whole earth in its shadow. A slight circumstance induced me to alter my usual route and to return home by Egham and Bishopgate. I alighted at Perdita's ancient abode, her cottage, and sending forward the carriage, determined to walk across the park to the castle. This spot, dedicated to sweetest recollections, the deserted house and neglected garden were well adapted to nurse my melancholy. In our happiest days, Perdita had adorned her cottage with every aid art might bring to that which nature had selected to favour. In the same spirit of exaggeration, she had, on the event of her separation from Raymond, caused it to be entirely neglected. It was now in ruin. The deer had climbed the broken palings and reposed among the flowers. Grass grew on the threshold and the swinging lattice creaking to the wind gave signal of utter desertion. The sky was blue above, and the air impregnated with fragrance by the rare flowers that grew among the weeds. The trees moved overhead, awakening nature's favourite melody, but the melancholy appearance of the choked paths and weed-grown flower beds dimmed even this gay summer scene. The time when in proud and happy security we assembled at this cottage was gone. Soon the present hours would join those past, and shadows of future ones rose dark and menacing from the womb of time, their cradle and their beer. For the first time in my life I envied the sleep of the dead, and thought with pleasure of one's bed under the sod, where grief and fear have no power. I passed through the gap of the broken paling. I felt, while I disdained, the choking tears. I rushed into the depths of the forest. O oh, death and change, rulers of our life, where are ye that I may grapple with you? What was there in our tranquility that excited your envy, in our happiness that ye should destroy it? We were happy, loving, and beloved. The horn of Amalthea contained no blessing unshowered upon us, but alas! As I wandered on, thus ruminating, a number of country people passed me. They seemed full of careful thought, and a few words of their conversation that reached me induced me to approach and make further inquiries. A party of people flying from London, as was frequent in those days, had come up the Thames in a boat. No one at Windsor would afford them shelter, so, going a little further up, they remained all night in a deserted hut near Bolter's Lock. They pursued their way the following morning, leaving one of their company behind them, sick of the plague. This circumstance once spread abroad, none dared approach within half a mile of the infected neighbourhood, and the deserted wretch was left to fight with disease and death in solitude, as he best might. I was urged by compassion to hasten to the hut for the purpose of ascertaining his situation and administering to his wants. As I advanced, I met knots of country people talking earnestly of this event. Distant as they were from the apprehended contagion, fear was impressed on every countenance. I passed by a group of these terrorists in a lane in the direct road to the hut. One of them stopped me, and conjecturing that I was ignorant of the circumstance, told me not to go on, for that an infected person lay but at a short distance. I know it, I replied and I am going to see in what condition the poor fellow is. 
A murmur of surprise and horror ran through the assembly. I continued, This poor wretch is deserted, dying, succorless. In these unhappy times, God knows how soon any or all of us may be in like want. I am going to do as I would be done by. But you will never be able to return to the castle. Lady Idris, his children, in confused speech were the words that struck my ear. Do you not know, my friends, I said, that the Earl himself, now Lord Protector, visits daily not only those probably infected by this disease, but the hospitals and pest houses, going near and even touching the sick. Yet he was never in better health. You labor under an entire mistake as to the nature of the plague, but do not fear. I do not ask any of you to accompany me, nor to believe me, until I return safe and sound from my patient. So I left them and hurried on. I soon arrived at the hut. The door was ajar. I entered, and one glance assured me that its former inhabitant was no more. He lay on a heap of straw, cold and stiff, while a pernicious effluvia filled the room, and various stains and marks served to shew the virulence of the disorder. I had never before beheld one killed by pestilence. While every mind was full of dismay at its effects, a craving for excitement had led us to peruse Defoe's account and the masterly delineations of the author of Arthur Mervyn. The pictures drawn in these books were so vivid that we seemed to have experienced the results depicted by them. But cold were the sensations excited by words, burning though they were, and describing the death and misery of thousands compared to what I felt in looking on the corpse of this unhappy stranger. This, indeed, was the plague. I raised his rigid limbs, I marked the distortion of his face, and the stony eyes lost to perception. As I was thus occupied, chill horror congealed my blood, making my flesh quiver and my hair to stand on end. Half insanely I spoke to the dead, so the plague killed you, I muttered. How came this? Was the coming painful? You look as if the enemy had tortured before he murdered you. And now I leapt up precipitately and escaped from the hut before nature could revoke her laws and inorganic words be breathed in answer from the lips of the departed. On returning through the lane, I saw at a distance the same assemblage of persons which I had left, they hurried away as soon as they saw me. My agitated mien added to their fear of coming near one who had entered within the verge of contagion. At a distance from facts, one draws conclusions which appear infallible, which yet when put to the test of reality, vanish like unreal dreams. I had ridiculed the fears of my countrymen when they related to others. Now that they came home to myself, I paused. The Rubicon, I felt, was past, and it behoved me well to reflect what I should do on this hither side of disease and danger. According to the vulgar superstition, my dress, my person, the air I breathed, bore in it mortal danger to myself and others. Should I return to the castle, to my wife and children, with this taint upon me? Not surely if I were infected, but I felt certain that I was not, a few hours would determine the question. I would spend these in the forest, in reflection on what was to come and what my future actions were to be. In the feeling communicated to me by the sight of one struck by the plague, I forgot the events that had excited me so strongly in London. New and more painful prospects, by degrees, were cleared of the mist which had hitherto veiled them. The question was no longer whether I should share Adrian's toils and danger, but in what manner I could in Windsor and the neighbourhood imitate the prudence and zeal which, under his government, produced order and plenty in London, and how, now pestilence had spread more widely, I could secure the health of my own family. I spread the whole earth out as a map before me. On no one spot of its surface could I put my finger and say, here is safety. In the south, the disease, virulent and immedicable, had nearly annihilated the race of man. Storm and inundation, poisonous winds and blights filled up the measure of suffering. In the north it was worse. 
the lesser population gradually declined, and famine and plague kept watch on the survivors who, helpless and feeble, were ready to fall an easy prey into their hands. I contracted my view to England. The overgrown metropolis, the great heart of mighty Britain, was pulseless. Commerce had ceased. All resort for ambition or pleasure was cut off. The streets were grass-grown. The houses empty. The few that from necessity remained seemed already branded with the taint of inevitable pestilence. In the larger manufacturing towns, the same tragedy was acted on a smaller yet more disastrous scale. There was no Adrian to superintend and direct, while whole flocks of the poor were struck and killed. Yet we were not all to die. No truly, though thinned, the race of man would continue, and the great plague would, in after years, become matter of history and wonder. Doubtless this visitation was for extent unexampled, more need that we should work hard to dispute its progress. Ere this men have gone out in sport, and slain their thousands and tens of thousands. But now man had become a creature of price. The life of one of them was of more worth than the so-called treasures of kings. Look at his thought-endued countenance, his graceful limbs, his majestic brow, his wondrous mechanism. The type and model of this best work of God is not to be cast aside as a broken vessel. He shall be preserved, and his children and his children's children carry down the name and form of man to latest time. Above all, I must guard those entrusted by nature and fate to my especial care. And surely, if among all my fellow creatures I were to select those who might stand forth examples of the greatness and goodness of man, I could choose no other than those allied to me by the most sacred ties. Some from among the family of man must survive, and these should be among the survivors. That should be my task. To accomplish it my own life were a small sacrifice. There then, in that castle, in Windsor Castle, birthplace of Idris and my babes, should be the haven and retreat for the wrecked bark of human society. Its forest should be our world, its garden afford us food. Within its walls I would establish the shaken throne of health. I was an outcast and a vagabond when Adrian gently threw over me the silver net of love and civilization and linked me inextricably to human charities and human excellence. I was one who, though an aspirant after good and an ardent lover of wisdom, was yet unenrolled in any list of worth when Idris, the princely born, who was herself the personification of all that was divine in woman, she who walked the earth like a poet's dream as a carved goddess endued with sense or pictured saint stepping from the canvas, she, the most worthy, chose me and gave me herself a priceless gift. During several hours I continued thus to meditate, till hunger and fatigue brought me back to the passing hour, then marked by long shadows cast from the descending sun. I had wandered towards Bracknell, far to the west of Windsor. The feeling of perfect health which I enjoyed assured me that I was free from contagion. I remembered that Idris had been kept in ignorance of my proceedings. She might have heard of my return from London and my visit to Bolter's Lock, which, connected with my continued absence, might tend greatly to alarm her. I returned to Windsor by the long walk, and passing through the town towards the castle, I found it in a state of agitation and disturbance. It is too late to be ambitious, says Sir Thomas Brown. We cannot hope to live so long in our names, as some have done in their persons. One face of Janus holds no proportion to the other. Upon this text, many fanatics arose, who prophesied that the end of time was come. The spirit of superstition had birth from the wreck of our hopes, and antics wild and dangerous were played on the great theatre, while the remaining particle of futurity dwindled into a point in the eyes of the prognosticators. Weak-spirited women died of fear as they listened to their denunciations. Men of robust form and seeming strength fell into idiocy and madness, racked by the dread of coming eternity. A man of this kind was now pouring forth his eloquent despair among the inhabitants of Windsor. The scene of the morning and my visit to the dead, which had been spread abroad, had alarmed the country people. 
so they had become fit instruments to be played upon by a maniac. The poor wretch had lost his young wife and lovely infant by the plague. He was a mechanic, and, rendered unable to attend to the occupation which supplied his necessities, famine was added to his other miseries. He left the chamber which contained his wife and child, wife and child no more, but dead earth upon the earth. Wild with hunger, watching and grief, his diseased fancy made him believe himself sent by heaven to preach the end of time to the world. He entered the churches and foretold to the congregations their speedy removal to the vaults below. He appeared like the forgotten spirit of the time in the theatres and bade the spectators go home and die. He had been seized and confined. He had escaped and wandered from London among the neighbouring towns, and, with frantic gestures and thrilling words, he unveiled to each their hidden fears and gave voice to the soundless thought they dared not syllable. He stood under the arcade of the town hall of Windsor, and from this elevation harangued a trembling crowd. Hear, O ye inhabitants of the earth, he cried. Hear thou, all-seeing but most pitiless heaven. Hear thou too, O tempest-tossed heart, which breathes out these words, yet faints beneath their meaning. Death is among us. The earth is beautiful and flower-bedecked, but she is our grave. The clouds of heaven weep for us. The pageantry of the stars is but our funeral torchlight. Grey-headed men, ye hoped for yet a few years in your long-known abode, but the lease is up you must remove. Children, ye will never reach maturity. Even now the small grave is dug for ye. Mothers, clasp them in your arms. One death embraces you. Shuddering, he stretched out his hands, his eyes cast up, seemed bursting from their sockets, while he appeared to follow shapes, to us invisible, in the yielding air. There they are, he cried, the dead. They rise in their shrouds and pass in silent procession towards the far land of their doom. Their bloodless lips move not, their shadowy limbs are void of motion, while still they glide onwards. We come he exclaimed, springing forwards. For what should we wait? Haste, my friends, apparel yourselves in the court dress of death. Pestilence will usher you to his presence. Why thus long? They, the good, the wise, and the beloved, are gone before. Mothers, kiss you last. Husbands, protectors no more, lead on the partners of your death. Come, oh, come, while the dear ones are yet in sight for soon they will pass away, and we never, never shall join them more. From such ravings as these, he would suddenly become collected, and with unexaggerated but terrific words, paint the horrors of the time, describe with minute detail the effects of the plague on the human frame, and tell heartbreaking tales of the snapping of dear affinities, the gasping horror of despair over the deathbed of the last beloved, so that groans and even shrieks burst from the crowd. One man in particular stood in front, his eyes fixed on the prophet, his mouth open, his limbs rigid, while his face changed to various colours, yellow, blue and green, through intense fear. The maniac caught his glance and turned his eye on him. One has heard of the gaze of the rattlesnake, which allures the trembling victim till he falls within his jaws. The maniac became composed, his person rose higher, authority beamed from his countenance. He looked on the peasant who began to tremble while he still gazed, his knees knocked together, his teeth chattered. He at last fell down in convulsions. That man has the plague, said the maniac calmly. A shriek burst from the lips of the poor wretch, and then sudden motionlessness came over him. It was manifest to all that he was dead. Cries of horror filled the place. Everyone endeavoured to effect his escape. In a few minutes, the marketplace was cleared. The corpse lay on the ground, and the maniac, subdued and exhausted, sat beside it, leaning his gaunt cheek upon his thin hand. Soon, some people, deputed by the magistrates, came to remove the body. The unfortunate being saw a jailer in each. He fled precipitately while I passed onwards to the castle. Death, cruel and relentless, had entered these beloved walls. 
an old servant who had nursed Idris in infancy and who lived with us more on the footing of a revered relative than a domestic, had gone a few days before to visit a daughter, married and settled in the neighbourhood of London. On the night of her return, she sickened of the plague. From the haughty and unbending nature of the Countess of Windsor, Idris had few tender filial associations with her. This good woman had stood in the place of a mother and her very deficiencies of education and knowledge, by rendering her humble and defenceless, endeared her to us. She was the especial favorite of the children. I found my poor girl, there is no exaggeration in the expression, wild with grief and dread. She hung over the patient in agony, which was not mitigated when her thoughts wandered towards her babes, for whom she feared infection. My arrival was like the newly discovered lamp of a lighthouse to sailors who are weathering some dangerous point. She deposited her appalling doubts in my hands. She relied on my judgment and was comforted by my participation in her sorrow. Soon our poor nurse expired, and the anguish of suspense was changed to deep regret, which though at first more painful, yet yielded with greater readiness to my consolations. Sleep the sovereign balm, at length steeped her tearful eyes in forgetfulness. She slept, and quiet prevailed in the castle, whose inhabitants were hushed to repose. I was awake, and during the long hours of dead night, my busy thoughts worked in my brain, like ten thousand mill-wheels, rapid, acute, untamable. All slept, all England slept, and from my window, commanding a wide prospect of the star-illumined country, I saw the land stretched out in placid rest. I was awake, alive, while the brother of death possessed my race. What if the more potent of these fraternal deities should obtain dominion over it? The silence of midnight, to speak truly, though apparently a paradox, rung in my ears. The solitude became intolerable. I placed my hand on the beating heart of Idris. I bent my head to catch the sound of her breath, to assure myself that she still existed. For a moment, I doubted whether I should not awake her, so effeminate and horror ran through my frame. Great God, would it one day be thus? One day all extinct, save myself, should I walk the earth alone? Were these warning voices whose inarticulate and oracular sense forced belief upon me? Yet I would not call them voices of warning that announced to us only the inevitable. As the sun, ere it is risen, sometimes paints its image in the atmosphere. So often do the spirits of great events stride on before the events, and in today already walks tomorrow. Chapter 8 After a long interval, I am again impelled by the restless spirit within me to continue my narration, but I must alter the mode which I have hitherto adopted. The details contained in the foregoing pages apparently trivial, yet each slightest one weighing like lead in the depressed scale of human afflictions. This tedious dwelling on the sorrows of others, while my own were only in apprehension. This slowly laying bare of my soul's wounds. This journal of death. This long, drawn and tortuous path leading to the ocean of countless tears awakens me again to keen grief. I had used this history as an opiate, while it described my beloved friends, fresh with life and glowing with hope, active assistance on the scene, I was soothed. There will be a more melancholy pleasure in painting the end of all. But the intermediate steps, the climbing the wall, raised up between what was and is, while I still looked back nor saw the concealed desert beyond, is a labour past my strength. Time and experience have placed me on an height from which I can comprehend the past as a whole, and in this way I must describe it, bringing forward the leading incidents and disposing light and shade so as to form a picture in whose very darkness there will be harmony. It would be needless to narrate those disastrous occurrences for which a parallel might be found in any slighter visitation of our gigantic calamity. Does the reader wish to hear of the pest houses, where death is the comforter, of the mournful passage of the death cart, of the insensibility of the worthless, and the anguish of the loving heart, of harrowing shrieks and silence dire, 
of the variety of disease, desertion, famine, despair, and death. There are many books which can feed the appetite craving for these things. Let them turn to the accounts of Boccaccio, Defoe, and Brown. The vast annihilation that has swallowed all things, the voiceless solitude of the once busy earth, the lonely state of singleness which hems me in, has deprived even such details of their stinging reality, and mellowing the lurid tints of past anguish with poetic hues, I am able to escape from the mosaic of circumstance by perceiving and reflecting back the grouping and combined colouring of the past. I had returned from London possessed by the idea, with the intimate feeling that it was my first duty to secure, as well as I was able, the well-being of my family, and then to return and take my post beside Adrian. The events that immediately followed on my arrival at Windsor changed this view of things. The plague was not in London alone, it was everywhere. It came on us, as Ryland had said, like a thousand packs of wolves, howling through the winter night, gaunt and fierce. When once disease was introduced into the rural districts, its effects appeared more horrible, more exigent, and more difficult to cure than in towns. There was a companionship in suffering there, and the neighbours keeping constant watch on each other, and inspired by the active benevolence of Adrian, succour was afforded and the path of destruction smoothed. But in the country, among the scattered farmhouses, in lone cottages, in fields and barns, tragedies were acted harrowing to the soul, unseen, unheard, unnoticed. Medical aid was less easily procured, food was more difficult to obtain, and human beings, unwithheld by shame, for they were unbeheld of their fellows, ventured on deeds of greater wickedness or gave way more readily to their abject fears. Deeds of heroism also occurred, whose very mention swells the heart and brings tears into the eyes. Such is human nature that beauty and deformity are often closely linked. In reading history, we are chiefly struck by the generosity and self-devotion that follow close on the heels of crime, veiling with supernal flowers the stain of blood. Such acts were not wanting to adorn the grim train that waited on the progress of the plague. The inhabitants of Berkshire and Bucks had been long aware that the plague was in London, in Liverpool, Bristol, Manchester, York, in short, in all the more populous towns of England. They were not, however, the less astonished and dismayed when it appeared among themselves. They were impatient and angry in the midst of terror. They would do something to throw off the clinging evil, and while in action, they fancied that a remedy was applied. The inhabitants of the smaller towns left their houses, pitched tents in the fields, wandering separate from each other careless of hunger or the sky's inclemency, while they imagined that they avoided the death-dealing disease. The farmers and cottagers, on the contrary, struck with the fear of solitude and madly desirous of medical assistance, flocked into the towns. But winter was coming, and with winter, hope. In August, the plague had appeared in the country of England, and during September, it made its ravages. Towards the end of October, it dwindled away, and was in some degree replaced by a typhus of hardly less virulence. The autumn was warm and rainy, the infirm and sickly died off, happier they. Many young people, flushed with health and prosperity, made pale by wasting malady, became the inhabitants of the grave. The crop had failed, the bad corn and want of foreign wines added vigour to disease. Before Christmas, half England was under water. The storms of the last winter were renewed, but the diminished shipping of this year caused us to feel less the tempests of the sea. The flood and storms did more harm to continental Europe than to us, giving, as it were, the last blow to the calamities which destroyed it. In Italy, the rivers were unwatched by the diminished peasantry, and like wild beasts from their lair when the hunters and dogs are afar, did Tiber, Arno and Po rush upon and destroy the fertility of the plains. Whole villages were carried away. Rome and Florence and Pisa were overflowed, and their marble palaces, late mirrored in tranquil streams, had their foundations shaken by their winter-gifted power. 
In Germany and Russia, the injury was still more momentous. But frost would come at last, and with it, a renewal of our lease of earth. Frost would blunt the arrows of pestilence and enchain the furious elements, and the land would in spring throw off her garment of snow, released from her menace of destruction. It was not until February that the desired signs of winter appeared. For three days the snow fell, ice stopped the current of the rivers, and the birds flew out from crackling branches of the frost-whitened trees. On the fourth morning, all vanished. A southwest wind brought up rain, the sun came out, and mocking the usual laws of nature seemed even at this early season to burn with solstitial force. It was no consolation that with the first winds of March the lanes were filled with violets, the fruit trees covered with blossoms, that the corn sprung up and the leaves came out, forced by the unseasonable heat. We feared the balmy air, we feared the cloudless sky, the flower-covered earth, and delightful woods, for we looked on the fabric of the universe no longer as our dwelling, but our tomb and the fragrant land smelled to the apprehension of fear like a wide churchyard. Yet notwithstanding these disadvantages, winter was breathing time, and we exerted ourselves to make the best of it. Plague might not revive with the summer, but if it did, it should find us prepared. It is a part of man's nature to adapt itself through habit, even to pain and sorrow. Pestilence had become a part of our future, our existence. It was to be guarded against, like the flooding of rivers, the encroachments of ocean, or the inclemency of the sky. After long suffering and bitter experience, some panacea might be discovered. As it was, all that received infection died. All, however, were not infected and it became our part to fix deep the foundations and raise high the barrier between contagion and the sane, to introduce such order as would conduce to the well-being of the survivors and as would preserve hope and some portion of happiness to those who were spectators of the still-renewed tragedy. Adrian had introduced systematic modes of proceeding in the metropolis, which, while they were unable to stop the progress of death, yet prevented other evils, vice and folly, from rendering the awful fate of the hour still more tremendous. I wish to imitate his example, but men are used to. Move all together, if they move at all, and I could find no means of leading the inhabitants of scattered towns and villages, who forgot my words as soon as they heard them not, and veered with every baffling wind that might arise from an apparent change of circumstance. I adopted another plan. Those writers who have imagined a reign of peace and happiness on earth have generally described a rural country where each small township was directed by the elders and wise men. This was the key of my design. Each village, however small, usually contains a leader, one among themselves whom they venerate, whose advice they seek in difficulty, and whose good opinion they chiefly value. I was immediately drawn to make this observation by occurrences that presented themselves to my personal experience. In the village of Little Marlow, an old woman ruled the community. She had lived for some years in an almshouse, and on fine Sundays her threshold was constantly beset by a crowd, seeking her advice and listening to her admonitions. She had been a soldier's wife, and had seen the world. Infirmity, induced by fevers caught in unwholesome quarters, had come on her before its time, and she seldom moved from her little cot. The plague entered the village, and, while fright and grief deprived the inhabitants of the little wisdom they possessed, old Martha stepped forward and said, Before now I have been in a town where there was the plague. And you escaped? No, but I recovered. After this, Martha was seated more firmly than ever on the regal seat, elevated by reverence and love. She entered the cottages of the sick. She relieved their wants with her own hand. She betrayed no fear and inspired all who saw her with some portion of her own native courage. She attended the markets. She insisted upon being supplied with food for those who were too poor to purchase it. She shewed them how the well-being of each included the prosperity of all. She would not permit the gardens to be neglected, nor the very flowers in the cottage lattices to droop from want of care. 
Hope, she said, was better than a doctor's prescription, and everything that could sustain and enliven the spirits of more worth than drugs and mixtures. It was the sight of little Marlow and my conversations with Martha that led me to the plan I formed. I had before visited the manor houses and gentlemen's seats and often found the inhabitants actuated by the purest benevolence, ready to lend their utmost aid for the welfare of their tenants. But this was not enough. The intimate sympathy generated by similar hopes and fears, similar experience and pursuits, was wanting here. The poor perceived that the rich possessed other means of preservation than those which could be partaken of by themselves, seclusion, and, as far as circumstances permitted, freedom from care. They could not place reliance on them, but turned with tenfold dependence to the succour and advice of their equals. I resolved, therefore, to go from village to village, seeking out the rustic archon of the place, and by systematising their exertions and enlightening their views, increase both their power and their use among their fellow cottagers. Many changes also now occurred in these spontaneous regal elections. Depositions and abdications were frequent, while in the place of the old and prudent, the ardent youth would step forward, eager for action, regardless of danger. Often, too, the voice to which all listened was suddenly silenced, the helping hand cold, the sympathetic eye closed, and the villagers feared still more the death that had selected a choice victim, shivering in dust the heart that had beat for them, reducing to incommunicable annihilation the mind forever occupied with projects for their welfare. Whoever labours for man must often find ingratitude, watered by vice and folly, spring from the grain which he has sown. Death, which had in our younger days walked the earth like a thief that comes in the night, now, rising from his subterranean vault, girt with power, with dark banner floating, came a conqueror. Many saw, seated above his viceregal throne, a supreme providence, who directed his shafts and guided his progress, and they bowed their heads in resignation, or at least in obedience. Others perceived only a passing casualty. They endeavoured to exchange terror for heedlessness, and plunged into licentiousness, to avoid the agonising throes of worst apprehension. Thus, while the wise, the good, and the prudent were occupied by the labours of benevolence, the truce of winter produced other effects among the young, the thoughtless, and the vicious. During the colder months, there was a general rush to London in search of amusement. The ties of public opinion were loosened. Many were rich, heretofore poor. Many had lost father and mother, the guardians of their morals, their mentors and restraints. It would have been useless to have opposed these impulses by barriers, which would only have driven those actuated by them to more pernicious indulgences. The theatres were open and thronged, dance and midnight festival were frequented, in many of these decorum was violated, and the evils which hitherto adhered to an advanced state of civilization were doubled. The student left his books, the artist his study, the occupations of life were gone, but the amusements remained. Enjoyment might be protracted to the verge of the grave. All factitious colouring disappeared. Death rose like night, and protected by its murky shadows the blush of modesty, the reserve of pride, the decorum of prudery were frequently thrown aside as useless veils. This was not universal. Among better natures, anguish and dread, the fear of eternal separation and the awful wonder produced by unprecedented calamity drew closer the ties of kindred and friendship. Philosophers opposed their principles as barriers to the inundation of profligacy or despair and the only ramparts to protect the invaded territory of human life. The religious, hoping now for their reward, clung fast to their creeds as the rafts and planks which over the tempest-vexed sea of suffering would bear them in safety to the harbour of the unknown continent. The loving heart, obliged to contract its view, bestowed its overflow of affection in triple portion on the few that remained. Yet, even among these, the present, as an unalienable possession, became all of time to which they dared commit the precious freight of their hopes. 
The experience of immemorial time had taught us formally to count our enjoyments by years and extend our prospect of life through a lengthened period of progression and decay. The long road threaded a vast labyrinth, and the valley of the shadow of death in which it terminated was hid by intervening objects. But an earthquake had changed the scene. Under our very feet the earth yawned, deep and precipitous. The gulf below opened to receive us, while the hours charioted us towards the chasm. But it was winter now, and months must elapse before we are hurled from our security. We became ephemera, to whom the interval between the rising and setting sun was as a long-drawn year of common time. We should never see our children ripen into maturity, nor behold their downy cheeks roughen, their blithe hearts subdued by passion or care. But we had them now. They lived, and we lived. What more could we desire? With such schooling did my poor Idris try to hush thronging fears, and in some measure succeeded. It was not as in summer time, when each hour might bring the dreaded fate, until summer we felt sure and this certainty, short-lived as it must be, yet for a while satisfied her maternal tenderness. I know not how to express or communicate the sense of concentrated, intense, though evanescent transport that imparadised us in the present hour. Our joys were dearer because we saw their end. They were keener because we felt, to its fullest extent, their value. They were purer because their essence was sympathy as a meteor is brighter than a star, did the felicity of this winter contain in itself the extracted delights of a long, long life. How lovely is spring! As we looked from Windsor Terrace on the sixteen fertile counties spread beneath, speckled by happy cottages and wealthier towns, all looked as in former years, heart-cheering and fair. The land was ploughed, the slender blades of wheat broke through the dark soil, the fruit trees were covered with buds, the husbandman was abroad in the fields, the milkmaid tripped home with well-filled pails, the swallows and martins struck the sunny pools with their long, pointed wings, the new-dropped lambs reposed on the young grass, the tender growth of leaves, lifts its sweet head into the air and feeds a silent space with ever-sprouting green. Man himself seemed to regenerate, and feel the frost of winter yield to an elastic and warm renewal of life. Reason told us that care and sorrow would grow with the opening year. But how to believe the ominous voice breathed up with pestiferous vapours from fear's dim cavern, while nature, laughing and scattering from her green lap flowers and fruits and sparkling waters, invited us to join the gay mask of young life she led upon the scene? Where was the plague? Here! Everywhere, one voice of horror and dismay exclaimed, when in the pleasant days of a sunny May, the destroyer of man brooded again over the earth, forcing the spirit to leave its organic chrysalis and to enter upon an untried life. With one mighty sweep of its potent weapon, all caution, all care, all prudence were levelled low. Death sat at the tables of the great, stretched itself on the cottager's pallet, seized the dastard who fled, quelled the brave man who resisted. Despondency entered every heart, sorrow dimmed every eye. Sights of woe now became familiar to me, and were I to tell all of anguish and pain that I witnessed of the despairing moans of age, and the more terrible smiles of infancy in the bosom of horror my reader, his limbs quivering and his hair on end, would wonder how I did not, seized with sudden frenzy, dash myself from some precipice, and so close my eyes forever on the sad end of the world. But the powers of love, poetry, and creative fancy will dwell even beside the sick of the plague, with the squalid, and with the dying. A feeling of devotion, of duty, of a high and steady purpose elevated me. A strange joy filled my heart. In the midst of saddest grief, I seemed to tread air, while the spirit of good shed round me an ambrosial atmosphere which blunted the sting of sympathy and purified the air of sighs. If my wearied soul flagged in its career, I thought of my loved home, of the casket that contained my treasures, of the kiss of love and the filial caress. 
while my eyes were moistened by purest dew, and my heart was at once softened and refreshed by thrilling tenderness. Maternal affection had not rendered Idris selfish. At the beginning of our calamity, she had, with thoughtless enthusiasm, devoted herself to the care of the sick and helpless. I checked her, and she submitted to my rule. I told her how the fear of her danger palsied my exertions, how the knowledge of her safety strung my nerves to endurance. I shewed her the dangers which her children incurred during her absence, and she at length agreed not to go beyond the enclosure of the forest. Indeed, within the walls of the castle, we had a colony of the unhappy, deserted by their relatives and in themselves helpless, sufficient to occupy her time and attention while ceaseless anxiety for my welfare and the health of her children, however she strove to curb or conceal it, absorbed all her thoughts and undermined the vital principle. After watching over and providing for their safety, her second care was to hide from me her anguish and tears. Each night I returned to the castle and found their repose and love awaiting me. Often. I waited beside the bed of death till midnight, and through the obscurity of rainy, cloudy nights rode many miles, sustained by one circumstance only, the safety and sheltered repose of those I loved. If some scene of tremendous agony shook my frame and fevered my brow, I would lay my head on the lap of Idris, and the tumultuous pulses subsided into a temperate flow, her smile could raise me from hopelessness. Her embrace bathed my sorrowing heart in calm peace. Summer advanced, and crowned with the sun's potent rays, plague shot her unerring shafts over the earth. The nations beneath their influence bowed their heads and died. The corn that sprung up in plenty lay in autumn rotting on the ground, while the melancholy wretch who had gone out to gather bread for his children lay stiff and plague-struck in the furrow. The green woods waved their boughs majestically, while the dying were spread beneath their shade, answering the solemn melody with inharmonious cries. The painted birds flitted through the shades, the careless deer reposed unhurt upon the fern, the oxen and the horses strayed from their unguarded stables and grazed among the wheat, for death fell on man alone. With summer and mortality grew our fears. My poor love and I looked at each other and our babes. We will save them, Idris, I said. I will save them. Years hence, we shall recount to them our fears, then passed away with their occasion. Though they only should remain on the earth, still they shall live, nor shall their cheeks become pale, nor their sweet voices languish. Our eldest, in some degree, understood the scenes passing around, and at times he with serious looks questioned me concerning the reason of so vast a desolation. But he was only ten years old, and the hilarity of youth soon chased unreasonable care from his brow. Evelyn, a laughing cherub, a gamesome infant, without idea of pain or sorrow, would, shaking back his light curls from his eyes, make the halls re-echo with his merriment, and in a thousand artless ways attract our attention to his play. Clara, our lovely gentle Clara, was our stay, our solace, our delight. She made it her task to attend the sick, comfort the sorrowing, assist the aged, and partake the sport and awaken the gaiety of the young. She flitted through the rooms like a good spirit, dispatched from the celestial kingdom to illumine our dark hour with alien splendor. Gratitude and praise marked where her footsteps had been. Yet, when she stood in unassuming simplicity before us, playing with our children, or with girlish assiduity performing little kind offices for Idris, one wondered in what fair lineament of her pure loveliness, in what soft tone of her thrilling voice, so much of heroism, sagacity, and active goodness resided. The summer passed tediously, for we trusted that winter would at least check the disease. That it would vanish altogether was an hope too dear, too heartfelt to be expressed. When such a thought was heedlessly uttered, the hearers, with a gush of tears and passionate sobs, bore witness how deep their fears were, how small their hopes. 
For my own part, my exertions for the public good permitted me to observe more closely than most others the virulence and extensive ravages of our sightless enemy. A short month has destroyed a village, and where in May the first person sickened, in June the paths were deformed by unburied corpses, the houses tenantless, no smoke arising from the chimneys, and the housewife's clock marked only the hour when death had been triumphant. From such scenes I have sometimes saved a deserted infant, sometimes led a young and grieving mother from the lifeless image of her firstborn, or drawn the sturdy labourer from childish weeping over his extinct family. July is gone, August must pass, and by the middle of September we may hope. Each day was eagerly counted, and the inhabitants of towns, desirous to leap this dangerous interval, plunged into dissipation and strove by riot and what they wished to imagine to be pleasure, to banish thought and opiate despair. None but Adrian could have tamed the motley population of London, which, like a troop of unbitted steeds rushing to their pastures, had thrown aside all minor fears through the operation of the fear paramount. Even Adrian was obliged in part to yield, that he might be able, if not to guide, at least to set bounds to the license of the times. The theatres were kept open, every place of public resort was frequented, though he endeavoured so to modify them as might best quiet the agitation of the spectators, and at the same time prevent a reaction of misery when the excitement was over. Tragedies deep and dire were the chief favourites. Comedy brought with it too great a contrast to the inner despair. When such were attempted, it was not unfrequent for a comedian, in the midst of the laughter occasioned by his disproportioned buffoonery, to find a word or thought in his part that jarred with his own sense of wretchedness and burst from mimic merriment into sobs and tears, while the spectators, seized with irresistible sympathy, wept, and the pantomimic revelry was changed to a real exhibition of tragic passion. It was not in my nature to derive consolation from such scenes, from theatres whose buffoon laughter and discordant mirth awaken distempered sympathy, or where fictitious tears and wailings mock the heartfelt grief within, from festival or crowded meeting, where hilarity sprung from the worst feelings of our nature, or such enthrallment of the better ones as impressed it with garish and false varnish, from assemblies of mourners in the guise of revellers. Once, however, I witnessed a scene of singular interest at one of the theatres, where nature overpowered art, as an overflowing cataract will tear away the puny manufacture of a mock cascade, which had before been fed by a small portion of its waters. I had come to London to see Adrian. He was not at the palace, and though the attendants did not know whither he had gone, they did not expect him till late at night. It was between six and seven o'clock, a fine summer afternoon, and I spent my leisure hours in a ramble through the empty streets of London, now turning to avoid an approaching funeral, now urged by curiosity to observe the state of a particular spot. My wanderings were instinct with pain, for silence and desertion characterised every place I visited, and the few beings I met were so pale and woe-begone so marked with care and depressed by fear, that weary of encountering only signs of misery, I began to retread my steps towards home. I was now in Holborn, and passed by a public house filled with uproarious companions, whose songs, laughter and shouts were more sorrowful than the pale looks and silence of the mourner. Such an one was near, hovering round this house. The sorry plight of her dress displayed her poverty, she was ghastly pale, and continued approaching, first the window and then the door of the house, as if fearful, yet longing to enter. A sudden burst of song and merriment seemed to sting her to the heart. She murmured, Can he have the heart? And then mustering her courage, she stepped within the threshold. The landlady met her in the passage. The poor creature asked, Is my husband here? Can I see George? See him cried the woman. Yes, if you go to him. Last night he was taken with the plague, and we sent him to the hospital. The unfortunate inquirer staggered against a wall. A faint cry escaped her. Oh, were you cruel enough 
she exclaimed. To send him there? The landlady, meanwhile, hurried away, but a more compassionate barmaid gave her a detailed account, the sum of which was that her husband had been taken ill after a night of riot and sent by his boon companions with all expedition to St. Bartholomew's Hospital. I had watched this scene, for there was a gentleness about the poor woman that interested me. She now tottered away from the door, walking as well as she could down Holborn Hill, but her strength soon failed her. She leaned against a wall, and her head sunk on her bosom, while her pallid cheek became still more white. I went up to her and offered my services. She hardly looked up. You can do me no good, she replied. I must go to the hospital if I do not die before I get there. There were still a few hackney coaches accustomed to stand about the streets, more truly from habit than for use. I put her in one of these and entered with her that I might secure her entrance into the hospital. Our way was short and she said little, except interrupted ejaculations of reproach that he had left her, exclamations on the unkindness of some of his friends, and hope that she would find him alive. There was a simple, natural earnestness about her that interested me in her fate, especially when she assured me that her husband was the best of men, had been so till want of business during these unhappy times had thrown him into bad company. He could not bear to come home, she said, only to see our children die. A man cannot have the patience a mother has with her own flesh and blood. We were set down at St. Bartholomew's S and entered the wretched precincts of the House of Disease. The poor creature clung closer to me as she saw with what heartless haste they bore the dead from the wards and took them into a room whose half-open door displayed a number of corpses, horrible to behold by one unaccustomed to such scenes. We were directed to the ward where her husband had been first taken and still was, the nurse said, if alive. My companion looked eagerly from one bed to the other, till at the end of the ward she espied on a wretched bed a squalid, haggard creature writhing under the torture of disease. She rushed towards him. She embraced him, blessing God for his preservation. The enthusiasm that inspired her with this strange joy blinded her to the horrors about her, but they were intolerably agonizing to me. The ward was filled with an effluvia that caused my heart to heave with painful qualms. The dead were carried out, and the sick brought in with like indifference. Some were screaming with pain, others laughing from the influence of more terrible delirium. Some were attended by weeping, despairing relations, others called aloud with thrilling tenderness or reproach on the friends who had deserted them while the nurses went from bed to bed incarnate images of despair, neglect, and death. I gave gold to my luckless companion. I recommended her to the care of the attendants. I then hastened away, while the tormentor, the imagination, busied itself in picturing my own loved ones stretched on such beds, attended thus. The country afforded no such mass of horrors. Solitary wretches died in the open fields, and I have found a survivor in a vacant village, contending at once with famine and disease. But the assembly of pestilence, the banqueting hall of death, was spread only in London. I rambled on, oppressed, distracted by painful emotions. Suddenly I found myself before Drury Lane Theatre. The play was Macbeth. The first actor of the age was there to exert his powers to drug with irreflection the auditors. Such a medicine I yearned for, so I entered. The theatre was tolerably well filled. Shakespeare, whose popularity was established by the approval of four centuries, had not lost his influence even at this dread period, but was still Ut Magus, the wizard to rule our hearts and govern our imaginations. I came in during the interval between the third and fourth act. I looked round on the audience. The females were mostly of the lower classes, but the men were of all ranks, come hither to forget a while the protracted scenes of wretchedness which awaited them at their miserable homes. The curtain drew up, and the stage presented the scene of the witch's cave. The wildness and supernatural machinery of Macbeth was a pledge that it could contain little directly connected with our present circumstances. 
Great pains had been taken in the scenery to give the semblance of reality to the impossible. The extreme darkness of the stage, whose only light was received from the fire under the cauldron, joined to a kind of mist that floated about it, rendered the unearthly shapes of the witches obscure and shadowy. It was not three decrepit old hags that bent over their pot, throwing in the grim ingredients of the magic charm, but forms frightful, unreal, and fanciful. The entrance of Hecate and the wild music that followed took us out of this world. The cavern shape the stage assumed, the beetling rocks, the glare of the fire, the misty shades that crossed the scene at times, the music in harmony with all witch-like fancies, permitted the imagination to revel without fear of contradiction or reproof from reason or the heart. The entrance of Macbeth did not destroy the illusion, for he was actuated by the same feelings that inspired us, and while the work of magic proceeded, we sympathized in his wonder and his daring, and gave ourselves up with our whole souls to the influence of scenic delusion. I felt the beneficial result of such excitement in a renewal of those pleasing flights of fancy to which I had long been a stranger. The effect of this scene of incantation communicated a portion of its power to that which followed. We forgot that Malcolm and Macduff were mere human beings, acted upon by such simple passions as warmed our own breasts. By slow degrees, however, we were drawn to the real interest of the scene. A shudder like the swift passing of an electric shock ran through the house when Ross exclaimed, in answer to, Stand Scotland where it did. Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave, where nothing, but who knows nothing, is once seen to smile, where sighs and groans and shrieks that rent the air are made, not marked, where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy. The dead man's knell is there scarce asked for who, and good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps, dying or ere they sicken. Each word struck the sense as our life's passing bell. We feared to look at each other, but bent our gaze on the stage as if our eyes could fall innocuous on that alone. The person who played the part of Ross suddenly became aware of the dangerous ground he trod. He was an inferior actor, but truth now made him excellent. As he went on to announce to Macduff the slaughter of his family, he was afraid to speak, trembling from apprehension of a burst of grief from the audience, not from his fellow mime. Each word was drawn out with difficulty. Real anguish painted his features. His eyes were now lifted in sudden horror, now fixed in dread upon the ground. This shoe of terror increased ours. We gasped with him. Each neck was stretched out. Each face changed with the actor's changes. At length, while Macduff, who, attending to his part, was unobservant of the high-wrought sympathy of the house, cried with well-acted passion, All my pretty ones, did you say all? Oh, hell, kite. All what? All my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop. A pang of tameless grief wrenched every heart. A burst of despair was echoed from every lip. I had entered into the universal feeling. I had been absorbed by the terrors of Ross. I re-echoed the cry of Macduff, and then rushed out as from an hell of torture to find calm in the free air and silent street. Free the air was not, or the street silent. Oh, how I longed then for the dear soothings of maternal nature, as my wounded heart was still further stung by the roar of heartless merriment from the public house, by the sight of the drunkard reeling home, having lost the memory of what he would find there in oblivious debauch, and by the more appalling salutations of those melancholy beings to whom the name of home was a mockery. I ran on at my utmost speed until I found myself I knew not how close to Westminster Abbey and was attracted by the deep and swelling tone of the organ. I entered with soothing awe the lighted chancel and listened to the solemn religious chaunt which spoke peace and hope to the unhappy. The notes, freighted with man's dearest prayers, re-echoed through the dim aisles and the bleeding of the soul's wounds was staunched by heavenly balm. 
in spite of the misery I deprecated and could not understand, in spite of the cold hearths of wide London and the corpse-strewn fields of my native land, in spite of all the variety of agonizing emotions I had that evening experienced, I thought that in reply to our melodious adjurations, the Creator looked down in compassion and promise of relief. The awful peal of the heaven-winged music seemed fitting voice wherewith to commune with the Supreme. Calm was produced by its sound, and by the sight of many other human creatures offering up prayers and submission with me. A sentiment approaching happiness followed the total resignation of one's being to the guardianship of the world's ruler. Alas, with the failing of this solemn strain, the elevated spirit sank again to earth. Suddenly, one of the choristers died. He was lifted from his desk, the vaults below were hastily opened. He was consigned with a few muttered prayers to the darksome cavern, abode of thousands who had gone before now wide yawning to receive even all who fulfilled the funeral rites. In vain I would then have turned from this scene to darkened aisle or lofty dome, echoing with melodious praise. In the open air alone I found relief. Among nature's beauteous works, her God reassumed his attribute of benevolence, and again I could trust that he who built up the mountains, planted the forests, and poured out the rivers would erect another state for lost humanity, where we might awaken again to our affections, our happiness, and our faith. Fortunately for me, those circumstances were of rare occurrence that obliged me to visit London, and my duties were confined to the rural district which our lofty castle overlooked, and here labour stood in the place of pastime, to occupy such of the country people as were sufficiently exempt from sorrow or disease. My endeavours were directed towards urging them to their usual attention to their crops and to the acting as if pestilence did not exist. The mower's scythe was at times heard, yet the joyless haymakers, after they had listlessly turned the grass, forgot to cart it. The shepherd, when he had sheared his sheep, would let the wool lie to be scattered by the winds, deeming it useless to provide clothing for another winter. At times, however, the spirit of life was awakened by these employments. The sun, the refreshing breeze, the sweet smell of the hay, the rustling leaves and prattling rivulets brought repose to the agitated bosom and bestowed a feeling akin to happiness on the apprehensive. Nor, strange to say, was the time without its pleasures. Young couples who had loved long and hopelessly suddenly found every impediment removed and wealth pour in from the death of relatives. The very danger drew them closer. The immediate peril urged them to seize the immediate opportunity. Wildly and passionately, they sought to know what delights existence afforded before they yielded to death and, snatching their pleasures with rough strife, thorough the iron gates of life, they defied the conquering pestilence to destroy what had been or to erase even from their deathbed thoughts the sentiment of happiness which had been theirs. One instance of this kind came immediately under our notice, where a high-born girl had in early youth given her heart to one of meaner extraction. He was a schoolfellow and friend of her brother's, and usually spent a part of the holidays at the mansion of the Duke her father. They had played together as children, been the confidants of each other's little secrets, mutual aids and consolers in difficulty and sorrow. Love had crept in, noiseless, terrorless at first, till each felt their life bound up in the other, and at the same time knew that they must part. Their extreme youth and the purity of their attachment made them yield with less resistance to the tyranny of circumstances. The father of the fair Juliet separated them, but not until the young lover had promised to remain absent, only till he had rendered himself worthy of her, and she had vowed to preserve her virgin heart, his treasure, till he returned to claim and possess it. Plague came, threatening to destroy at once the aim of the ambitious and the hopes of love. Long, the Duke of El, derided the idea that there could be danger while he pursued his plans of cautious seclusion, and he so far succeeded that it was not till this second summer that the destroyer, at one fell stroke, overthrew his precautions, his security, and his life. Poor Juliet saw one by one, father, mother, brothers, and sisters, 
sicken and die. Most of the servants fled on the first appearance of disease. Those who remained were infected mortally. No neighbor or rustic ventured within the verge of contagion. By a strange fatality, Juliet alone escaped, and she to the last waited on her relatives and smoothed the pillow of death. The moment at length came when the last blow was given to the last of the house. The youthful survivor of her race sat alone among the dead. There was no living being near to soothe her or withdraw her from this hideous company. With the declining heat of a September night, a whirlwind of storm, thunder and hail rattled round the house and with ghastly harmony sung the dirge of her family. She sat upon the ground absorbed in wordless despair when through the gusty wind and bickering rain she thought she heard her name called. Whose could that familiar voice be? Not one of her relations, for they lay glaring on her with stony eyes. Again her name was syllabled, and she shuddered as she asked herself, Am I becoming mad, or am I dying, that I hear the voices of the departed? A second thought passed, swift as an arrow, into her brain. She rushed to the window, and a flash of lightning shewed to her the expected vision, her lover in the shrubbery beneath. Joy lent her strength to descend the stairs, to open the door, and then she fainted in his supporting arms. A thousand times she reproached herself, as with a crime, that she should revive to happiness with him. The natural clinging of the human mind to life and joy was in its full energy in her young heart. She gave herself impetuously up to the enchantment. They were married, and in their radiant features I saw incarnate, for the last time, the spirit of love, of rapturous sympathy, which once had been the life of the world. I envied them, but felt how impossible it was to imbibe the same feeling now that years had multiplied my ties in the world. Above all, the anxious mother, my own beloved and drooping Idris, claimed my earnest care. I could not reproach the anxiety that never for a moment slept in her heart, but I exerted myself to distract her attention from too keen an observation of the truth of things, of the near and nearer approaches of disease, misery and death, of the wild look of our attendants as intelligence of another and yet another death reached us. For to the last, something new occurred that seemed to transcend in horror all that had gone before. Wretched beings crawled to die under our suckering roof. The inhabitants of the castle decreased daily, while the survivors huddled together in fear, and, as in a famine-struck boat, the sport of the wild, interminable waves, each looked in the other's face to guess on whom the death lot would next fall. All this I endeavoured to veil, so that it might least impress my Idris. Yet, as I have said, my courage survived even despair. I might be vanquished, but I would not yield. One day, it was the 9th of September, seemed devoted to every disaster, to every harrowing incident. Early in the day, I heard of the arrival of the aged grandmother of one of our servants at the castle. This old woman had reached her hundredth year. Her skin was shriveled, her form was bent and lost in extreme decrepitude, but as still from year to year she continued in existence, outliving many younger and stronger, she began to feel as if she were to live forever. The plague came, and the inhabitants of her village died. Clinging with the dastard feeling of the aged to the remnant of her spent life, she had, on hearing that the pestilence had come into her neighborhood, barred her door and closed her casement, refusing to communicate with any. She would wander out at night to get food, and returned home, pleased that she had met no one, that she was in no danger from the plague. As the earth became more desolate, her difficulty in acquiring sustenance increased. At first her son, who lived near, had humoured her by placing articles of food in her way. At last he died. But even though threatened by famine, her fear of the plague was paramount, and her greatest care was to avoid her fellow creatures. She grew weaker each day, and each day she had further to go. The night before, she had reached Datchet, and prowling about, had found a baker's shop open and deserted. Laden with spoil, she hastened to return, 
and lost her way. The night was windless, hot and cloudy. Her load became too heavy for her, and one by one she threw away her loaves, still endeavouring to get along, though her hobbling fell into lameness and her weakness at last into inability to move. She lay down among the tall corn and fell asleep. Deep in midnight, she was awaked by a rustling near her. She would have started up, but her stiff joints refused to obey her will. A low moan close to her ear followed, and the rustling increased. She heard a smothered voice breathe out, Water! Water! Several times, and then again a sigh heaved from the heart of the sufferer. The old woman shuddered. She contrived at length to sit upright, but her teeth chattered, and her knees knocked together. Close, very close, lay a half-naked figure, just discernible in the gloom, and the cry for water and the stifled moan were again uttered. Her motions at length attracted the attention of her unknown companion. Her hand was seized with a convulsive violence that made the grasp feel like iron, the fingers like the keen teeth of a trap. At last you are come, were the words given forth, but this exertion was the last effort of the dying. The joints relaxed, the figure fell prostrate, one low moan, the last, marked the moment of death. Morning broke, and the old woman saw the corpse marked with the fatal disease close to her. Her wrist was livid with the hold loosened by death. She felt struck by the plague. Her aged frame was unable to bear her away with sufficient speed, and now, believing herself infected, she no longer dreaded the association of others. But as swiftly as she might, came to her granddaughter at Windsor Castle, there to lament and die. The sight was horrible. Still, she clung to life and lamented her mischance with cries and hideous groans. While the swift advance of the disease shewed, what proved to be the fact that she could not survive many hours. While I was directing that the necessary care should be taken of her, Clara came in. She was trembling and pale, and when I anxiously asked her the cause of her agitation, she threw herself into my arms, weeping and exclaiming, Uncle, dearest uncle, do not hate me forever. I must tell you, for you must know, that Evelyn, poor little Evelyn, her voice was choked by sobs. The fear of so mighty a calamity as the loss of our adored infant made the current of my blood pause with chilly horror. But the remembrance of the mother restored my presence of mind. I sought the little bed of my darling. He was oppressed by fever, but I trusted, I fondly and fearfully trusted, that there were no symptoms of the plague. He was not three years old, and his illness appeared only one of those attacks incident to infancy. I watched him long, his heavy, half-closed lids, his burning cheeks and restless twining of his small fingers, the fever was violent, the torpor complete, enough, without the greater fear of pestilence, to awaken alarm. Idris must not see him in this state. Clara, though only twelve years old, was rendered through extreme sensibility so prudent and careful that I felt secure in entrusting the charge of him to her, and it was my task to prevent Idris from observing their absence. I administered the fitting remedies and left my sweet niece to watch beside him and bring me notice of any change she should observe. I then went to Idris, contriving in my way plausible excuses for remaining all day in the castle and endeavouring to disperse the traces of care from my brow. Fortunately, she was not alone. I found Merivel, the astronomer, with her. He was far too long-sighted in his view of humanity to heed the casualties of the day, and lived in the midst of contagion unconscious of its existence. This poor man, learned as Laplace, guileless and unforeseeing as a child, had often been on the point of starvation. He, his pale wife, and numerous offspring, while he neither felt hunger nor observed distress. His astronomical theories absorbed him. Calculations were scrawled with coal on the bare walls of his garret. A hard-earned guinea or an article of dress was exchanged for a book without remorse. He neither heard his children cry nor observed his companion's emaciated form, 
and the excess of calamity was merely to him as the occurrence of a cloudy night, when he would have given his right hand to observe a celestial phenomenon. His wife was one of those wondrous beings, to be found only among women, with affections not to be diminished by misfortune. Her mind was divided between boundless admiration for her husband and tender anxiety for her children. She waited on him, worked for them, and never complained, though care rendered her life one long-drawn, melancholy dream. He had introduced himself to Adrian by a request he made to observe some planetary motions from his glass. His poverty was easily detected and relieved. He often thanked us for the books we lent him and for the use of our instruments, but never spoke of his altered abode or change of circumstances. His wife assured us that he had not observed any difference except in the absence of the children from his study, and to her infinite surprise, he complained of this unaccustomed quiet. He came now to announce to us the completion of his essay on the pericyclical motions of the Earth's axis and the procession of the equinoctial points. If an old Roman of the period of the Republic had returned to life and talked of the impending election of some laurel-crowned consul or of the last battle with Mithridates, his ideas would not have been more alien to the times than the conversation of Merivel. Man, no longer with an appetite for sympathy, clothed his thoughts in visible signs, nor were there any readers left, while each one, having thrown away his sword with opposing shield alone, awaited the plague, Merivel talked of the state of mankind six thousand years hence. He might with equal interest to us have added a commentary to describe the unknown and unimaginable lineaments of the creatures who would then occupy the vacated dwelling of mankind. We had not the heart to undeceive the poor old man, and at the moment I came in, he was reading parts of his book to Idris, asking what answer could be given to this or that position. Idris could not refrain from a smile as she listened. She had already gathered from him that his family was alive and in health. Though not apt to forget the precipice of time on which she stood, yet I could perceive that she was amused for a moment by the contrast between the contracted view we had so long taken of human life and the seven-league strides with which Merivel paced a coming eternity. I was glad to see her smile, because it assured me of her total ignorance of her infant's danger. But I shuddered to think of the revulsion that would be occasioned by a discovery of the truth. While Merivel was talking, Clara softly opened a door behind Idris and beckoned me to come with a gesture and look of grief. A mirror betrayed the sign to Idris. She started up. To suspect evil, to perceive that, Alfred being with us, the danger must regard her youngest darling, to fly across the long chambers into his apartment was the work but of a moment. There she beheld her Evelyn lying fever-stricken and motionless. I followed her and strove to inspire more hope than I could myself entertain, but she shook her head mournfully. Anguish deprived her of presence of mind. She gave up to me and Clara the physicians and nurses' parts, she sat by the bed, holding one little burning hand, and with glazed eyes fixed on her babe, passed the long day in one unvaried agony. It was not the plague that visited our little boy so roughly, but she could not listen to my assurances. Apprehension deprived her of judgment and reflection. Every slight convulsion of her child's features shook her frame. If he moved, she dreaded the instant crisis. If he remained still, she saw death in his torpor, and the cloud on her brow darkened. The poor little thing's fever increased towards night. The sensation is most dreary, to use no stronger term, with which one looks forward to passing the long hours of night beside a sick bed, especially if the patient be an infant, who cannot explain its pain, and whose flickering life resembles the wasting flame of the watchlight whose narrow fire is shaken by the wind, and on whose edge devouring darkness hovers. With eagerness one turns toward the east, with angry impatience one marks the unchequered darkness. The crowing of a cock, that sound of glee during daytime, comes wailing and untunable, the creaking of rafters and slight stir of invisible insect is heard and felt as the signal and type of desolation. 
Clara, overcome by weariness, had seated herself at the foot of her cousin's bed, and in spite of her efforts, slumber weighed down her lids. Twice or thrice she shook it off, but at length she was conquered and slept. Idris sat at the bedside, holding Evelyn's hand. We were afraid to speak to each other. I watched the stars. I hung over my child. I felt his little pulse. I drew near the mother. Again I receded. At the turn of morning a gentle sigh from the patient attracted me. The burning spot on his cheek faded. His pulse beat softly and regularly. Torpor yielded to sleep. For a long time I dared not hope, but when his unobstructed breathing and the moisture that suffused his forehead were tokens no longer to be mistaken of the departure of mortal malady, I ventured to whisper the news of the change to Idris, and at length succeeded in persuading her that I spoke truth. But neither this assurance nor the speedy convalescence of our child could restore her, even to the portion of peace she before enjoyed. Her fear had been too deep, too absorbing, too entire to be changed to security. She felt as if during her past calm she had dreamed but was now awake. She was. As one in some lone watchtower on the deep, awakened from soothing visions of the home he loves, trembling to hear the wrathful billows roar, as one who has been cradled by a storm and awakes to find the vessel sinking. Before she had been visited by pangs of fear, now she never enjoyed an interval of hope. No smile of the heart ever irradiated her fair countenance. Sometimes she forced one, and then gushing tears would flow, and the sea of grief close above these wrecks of past happiness. Still, while I was near her, she could not be in utter despair. She fully confided herself to me. She did not seem to fear my death or revert to its possibility. To my guardianship, she consigned the full freight of her anxieties, reposing on my love as a wind-nipped fawn by the side of a doe, as a wounded nestling under its mother's wing, as a tiny shattered boat quivering still beneath some protecting willow tree. While I, not proudly as in days of joy, yet tenderly and with glad consciousness of the comfort I afforded, drew my trembling girl close to my heart and tried to ward every painful thought or rough circumstance from her sensitive nature. One other incident occurred at the end of this summer. The Countess of Windsor, ex-Queen of England, returned from Germany. She had at the beginning of the season quitted the vacant city of Vienna and unable to tame her haughty mind to anything like submission, she had delayed at Hamburg. And when at last she came to London, many weeks elapsed before she gave Adrian notice of her arrival. In spite of her coldness and long absence, he welcomed her with sensibility, displaying such affection as sought to heal the wounds of pride and sorrow, and was repulsed only by her total apparent want of sympathy. Idris heard of her mother's return with pleasure. Her own maternal feelings were so ardent that she imagined her parent must now, in this waste world, have lost pride and harshness, and would receive with delight her filial attentions. The first check to her duteous demonstrations was a formal intimation from the fallen majesty of England that I was in no manner to be intruded upon her. She consented, she said, to forgive her daughter and acknowledge her grandchildren. Larger concessions must not be expected. To me, this proceeding appeared, if so light a term may be permitted, extremely whimsical. Now that the race of man had lost in fact all distinction of rank, this pride was doubly fortuitous. Now that we felt a kindred, fraternal nature with all who bore the stamp of humanity, this angry reminiscence of times forever gone was worse than foolish. Idris was too much taken up by her own dreadful fears to be angry, hardly grieved for she judged that insensibility must be the source of this continued rancor. This was not altogether the fact, but predominant self-will assumed the arms and mask of callous feeling, and the haughty lady disdained to exhibit any token of the struggle she endured, while the slave of pride, she fancied that she sacrificed her happiness to immutable principle. False was all this. False all but the affections of our nature, and the links of sympathy with pleasure or pain. There was but one good and one evil in the world, 
life and death, the pomp of rank, the assumption of power, the possessions of wealth vanished like morning mist. One living beggar had become of more worth than a national peerage of dead lords, alas the day, than of dead heroes, patriots, or men of genius. There was much of degradation in this, for even vice and virtue had lost their attributes. Life, life, the continuation of our animal mechanism, was the alpha and omega of the desires, the prayers the prostrate ambition of human race. Chapter 9 Half England was desolate when October came, and the equinoctial winds swept over the earth, chilling the ardours of the unhealthy season. The summer, which was uncommonly hot, had been protracted into the beginning of this month, when on the 18th a sudden change was brought about from summer temperature to winter frost. Pestilence then made a pause in her death-dealing career. Gasping, not daring to name our hopes, yet full even to the brim with intense expectation, we stood as a shipwrecked sailor stands on a barren rock islanded by the ocean, watching a distant vessel, fancying that now it nears, and then again that it is bearing from sight. This promise of a renewed lease of life turned rugged natures to melting tenderness, and by contrast, filled the soft with harsh and unnatural sentiments. When it seemed destined that all were to die, we were reckless of the how and when, now that the virulence of the disease was mitigated and it appeared willing to spare some, each was eager to be among the elect and clung to life with dastard tenacity. Instances of desertion became more frequent and even murders, which made the hearer sick with horror, where the fear of contagion had armed those nearest in blood against each other. But these smaller and separate tragedies were about to yield to a mightier interest, and while we were promised calm from infectious influences, a tempest arose wilder than the winds, a tempest bred by the passions of man, nourished by his most violent impulses, unexampled and dire. A number of people from North America, the relics of that populous continent, had set sail for the east with mad desire of change, leaving their native plains for lands not less afflicted than their own. Several hundreds landed in Ireland about the 1st of November and took possession of such vacant habitations as they could find, seizing upon the superabundant food and the stray cattle. As they exhausted the produce of one spot, they went on to another. At length, they began to interfere with the inhabitants, and strong in their concentrated numbers, ejected the natives from their dwellings and robbed them of their winter store. A few events of this kind roused the fiery nature of the Irish, and they attacked the invaders. Some were destroyed, the major part escaped by quick and well-ordered movements, and danger made them careful, their numbers ably arranged, the very deaths among them concealed. Moving on in good order, and apparently given up to enjoyment, they excited the envy of the Irish. The Americans permitted a few to join their band, and presently the recruits outnumbered the strangers, nor did they join with them, nor imitate the admirable order which, preserved by the transatlantic chiefs, rendered them at once secure and formidable. The Irish followed their track in disorganized multitudes, each day increasing, each day becoming more lawless. The Americans were eager to escape from the spirit they had roused, and reaching the eastern shores of the island, embarked for England. Their incursion would hardly have been felt had they come alone, but the Irish, collected in unnatural numbers, began to feel the inroads of famine, and they followed in the wake of the Americans for England also. The crossing of the sea could not arrest their progress. The harbours of the desolate seaports of the west of Ireland were filled with vessels of all sizes, from the man of war to the small fisher's boat, which lay sailorless and rotting on the lazy deep. The emigrants embarked by hundreds, and unfurling their sails with rude hands, made strange havoc of buoy and cordage. Those who modestly betook themselves to the smaller craft, for the most part, achieved their watery journey in safety. Some in the true spirit of reckless enterprise, went on board a ship of an hundred and twenty guns. The vast hull drifted with the tide out of the bay, 
and after many hours, its crew of landsmen contrived to spread a great part of her enormous canvas. The wind took it, and while a thousand mistakes of the helmsman made her present her head now to one point, and now to another, the vast fields of canvas that formed her sails flapped with a sound like that of a huge cataract, or such as a sea-like forest may give forth when buffeted by an equinoctial north wind. The portholes were open, and with every sea which as she lurched washed her decks, they received whole tons of water. The difficulties were increased by a fresh breeze which began to blow, whistling among the shrouds, dashing the sails this way and that, and rending them with horrid split and such whirr as may have visited the dreams of Milton when he imagined the winnowing of the arch-fiend's van-like wings which increased the uproar of wild chaos. These sounds were mingled with the roaring of the sea, the splash of the chafed billows round the vessel's sides, and the gurgling up of the water in the hold. The crew, many of whom had never seen the sea before, felt indeed as if heaven and earth came ruining together as the vessel dipped her bows in the waves or rose high upon them. Their yells were drowned in the clamour of elements and the thunder rivings of their unwieldy habitation. They discovered at last that the water gained on them and they betook themselves to their pumps. They might as well have laboured to empty the ocean by bucketfuls. As the sun went down, the gale increased. The ship seemed to feel her danger. She was now completely waterlogged and presented other indications of settling before she went down. The bay was crowded with vessels, whose crews, for the most part, were observing the uncouth sportings of this huge, unwieldy machine. They saw her gradually sink, the waters now rising above her lower decks. They could hardly wink before she had utterly disappeared, nor could the place where the sea had closed over her be at all discerned. Some few of her crew were saved, but the greater part, clinging to her cordage and masts, went down with her to rise only when death loosened their hold. This event caused many of those who were about to sail to put foot again on firm land, ready to encounter any evil rather than to rush into the yawning jaws of the pitiless ocean. But these were few in comparison to the numbers who actually crossed. Many went up as high as Belfast to ensure a shorter passage, and then journeying south through Scotland, they were joined by the poorer natives of that country and all poured with one consent into England. Such incursions struck the English with affright in all those towns where there was still sufficient population to feel the change. There was room enough indeed in our hapless country for twice the number of invaders, but their lawless spirit instigated them to violence. They took a delight in thrusting the possessors from their houses, in seizing on some mansion of luxury where the noble dwellers secluded themselves in fear of the plague, enforcing these of either sex to become their servants and purveyors, till, the ruin complete in one place, they removed their locust visitation to another. When unopposed, they spread their ravages wide. In cases of danger, they clustered, and by dint of numbers overthrew their weak and despairing foes. They came from the east and the north, and directed their course without apparent motive, but unanimously towards our unhappy metropolis. Communication had been to a great degree cut off through the paralyzing effects of pestilence, so that the van of our invaders had proceeded as far as Manchester and Derby before we received notice of their arrival. They swept the country like a conquering army, burning, laying waste, murdering. The lower and vagabond English joined with them, some few of the Lord's Lieutenant who remained endeavoured to collect the militia, but the ranks were vacant, panic seized on all, and the opposition that was made only served to increase the audacity and cruelty of the enemy. They talked of taking London, conquering England, calling to mind the long detail of injuries which had for many years been forgotten. Such vaunts displayed their weakness rather than their strength, yet still they might do extreme mischief which, ending in their destruction, would render them at last objects of compassion and remorse. We were now taught how, in the beginning of the world, mankind clothed their enemies in impossible attributes, 
and how details proceeding from mouth to mouth might, like Virgil's ever-growing rumour, reach the heavens with her brow and clasp Hesperus and Lucifer with her outstretched hands. Gorgon and centaur, dragon and iron-hoofed lion, vast sea monster and gigantic hydra were but types of the strange and appalling accounts brought to London concerning our invaders. Their landing was long unknown, but having now advanced within an hundred miles of London, the country people flying before them arrived in successive troops, each exaggerating the numbers, fury and cruelty of the assailants. Tumult filled the before quiet streets, women and children deserted their homes, escaping they knew not whither. Fathers, husbands and sons stood trembling, not for themselves, but for their loved and defenceless relations. As the country people poured into London, the citizens fled southwards. They climbed the higher edifices of the town, fancying that they could discern the smoke and flames the enemy spread around them. As Windsor lay, to a great degree, in the line of march from the west, I removed my family to London, assigning the tower for their sojourn and joining Adrian, acted as his lieutenant in the coming struggle. We employed only two days in our preparations, and made good use of them. Artillery and arms were collected. The remnants of such regiments as could be brought through many losses into any show of muster were put under arms with that appearance of military discipline which might encourage our own party and seem most formidable to the disorganized multitude of our enemies. Even music was not wanting. Banners floated in the air and the shrill, fife and loud trumpet breathed forth sounds of encouragement and victory. A practiced ear might trace an undue faltering in the step of the soldiers, but this was not occasioned so much by fear of the adversary as by disease, by sorrow and by fatal prognostications which often weighed most potently on the brave and quelled the manly heart to abject subjection. Adrian led the troops. He was full of care. It was small relief to him that our discipline should gain us success in such a conflict. While plague still hovered to equalize the conqueror and the conquered, it was not victory that he desired, but bloodless peace. As we advanced, we were met by bands of peasantry, whose almost naked condition, whose despair and horror, told at once the fierce nature of the coming enemy. The senseless spirit of conquest and thirst of spoil blinded them, while with insane fury they deluged the country in ruin. The sight of the military restored hope to those who fled, and revenge took place of fear. They inspired the soldiers with the same sentiment. Languor was changed to ardor, the slow step converted to a speedy pace, while the hollow murmur of the multitude, inspired by one feeling, and that deadly, filled the air, drowning the clang of arms and sound of music. Adrian perceived the change and feared that it would be difficult to prevent them from wreaking their utmost fury on the Irish. He rode through the lines, charging the officers to restrain the troops, exhorting the soldiers, restoring order and quieting in some degree the violent agitation that swelled every bosom. We first came upon a few stragglers of the Irish at St. Albans. They retreated and joining others of their companions still fell back till they reached the main body. Tidings of an armed and regular opposition recalled them to a sort of order. They made Buckingham their headquarters and scouts were sent out to ascertain our situation. We remained for the night at Luton. In the morning, a simultaneous movement caused us each to advance. It was early dawn, and the air, impregnated with freshest odour, seemed in idle mockery to play with our banners, and bore onwards towards the enemy the music of the bands, the neighings of the horses, and regular step of the infantry. The first sound of martial instruments that came upon our undisciplined foe inspired surprise, not unmingled with dread. It spoke of other days, of days of concord and order. It was associated with times when plague was not, and man lived beyond the shadow of imminent fate. The pause was momentary. Soon we heard their disorderly clamour, the barbarian shouts, the untimed step of thousands coming on in disarray. 
Their troops now came pouring on us from the open country or narrow lanes. A large extent of unenclosed fields lay between us. We advanced to the middle of this and then made a halt. Being somewhat on superior ground, we could discern the space they covered. When their leaders perceived us drawn out in opposition, they also gave the word to halt and endeavoured to form their men into some imitation of military discipline. The first ranks had muskets. Some were mounted, but their arms were such as they had seized during their advance. Their horses, those they had taken from the peasantry. There was no uniformity and little obedience, but their shouts and wild gestures showed the untamed spirit that inspired them. Our soldiers received the word and advanced to quickest time, but in perfect order. Their uniform dresses, the gleam of their polished arms, their silence and looks of sullen hate were more appalling than the savage clamour of our innumerous foe. Thus coming nearer and nearer each other, the howls and shouts of the Irish increased. The English proceeded in obedience to their officers until they came near enough to distinguish the faces of their enemies. The sight inspired them with fury, with one cry that rent heaven and was re-echoed by the furthest lines, they rushed on. They disdained the use of the bullet, but with fixed bayonet dashed among the opposing foe, while the ranks opening at intervals, the matchmen lighted the cannon, whose deafening roar and blinding smoke filled up the horror of the scene. I was beside Adrian. A moment before, he had again given the word to halt and had remained a few yards distant from us in deep meditation. He was forming swiftly his plan of action to prevent the effusion of blood. The noise of cannon, the sudden rush of the troops and yell of the foe startled him. With flashing eyes he exclaimed, Not one of these must perish. And plunging the rowels into his horse's sides, he dashed between the conflicting bands. We, his staff, followed him to surround and protect him. Obeying his signal, however, we fell back somewhat. The soldiery, perceiving him, paused in their onset. He did not swerve from the bullets that passed near him, but rode immediately between the opposing lines. Silence succeeded to clamour. About fifty men lay on the ground, dying or dead. Adrian raised his sword in act to speak. By whose command? he cried, addressing his own troops. Do you advance? Who ordered your attack? Fall back! These misguided men shall not be slaughtered while I am your general. Sheathe your weapons. These are your brothers. Commit not fratricide. Soon the plague will not leave one for you to glut your revenge upon. Will you be more pitiless than pestilence? As you honour me, as you worship God, in whose image those also are created, as your children and friends are dear to you, shed not a drop of precious human blood. He spoke with outstretched hand and winning voice, and then turning to our invaders with a severe brow, he commanded them to lay down their arms. Do you think, he said, that because we are wasted by plague, you can overcome us? The plague is also among you, and when you are vanquished by famine and disease, the ghosts of those you have murdered will arise to bid you not hope in death. Lay down your arms, barbarous and cruel men, Men whose hands are stained with the blood of the innocent, whose souls are weighed down by the orphan's cry. We shall conquer, for the right is on our side. Already your cheeks are pale, the weapons fall from your nerveless grasp. Lay down your arms, fellow men. Brethren, pardon, succor, and brotherly love await your repentance. You are dear to us, because you wear the frail shape of humanity, each one among you will find a friend and host among these forces. Shall man be the enemy of man, while plague, the foe to all, even now is above us, triumphing in our butchery, more cruel than her own? Each army paused. On our side, the soldiers grasped their arms firmly and looked with stern glances on the foe. These had not thrown down their weapons, more from fear than the spirit of contest. They looked at each other, each wishing to follow some example given him, but they had no leader. Adrian threw himself from his horse and approaching one of those just slain. He was a man, he cried, and he is dead. Oh, quickly bind up the wounds of the fallen, let not one die. 
Let not one more soul escape through your merciless gashes to relate before the throne of God the tale of fratricide. Bind up their wounds, restore them to their friends. Cast away the hearts of tigers that burn in your breasts. Throw down those tools of cruelty and hate. In this pause of exterminating destiny, let each man be brother, guardian, and stay to the other. Away with those blood-stained arms, and hasten some of you to bind up these wounds. As he spoke, he knelt on the ground and raised in his arms a man from whose side the warm tide of life gushed. The poor wretch gasped. So still had I the host become that his moans were distinctly heard, and every heart, late fiercely bent on universal massacre, now beat anxiously in hope and fear for the fate of this one man. Adrian tore off his military scarf and bound it round the sufferer. It was too late. The man heaved a deep sigh. His head fell back. His limbs lost their sustaining power. He is dead, said Adrian, as the corpse fell from his arms on the ground, and he bowed his head in sorrow and awe. The fate of the world seemed bound up in the death of this single man. On either side, the bands threw down their arms. Even the veterans wept and our party held out their hands to their foes, while a gush of love and deepest amity filled every heart. The two forces mingling, unarmed and hand in hand, talking only how each might assist the other, the adversaries conjoined, each repenting, the one side their former cruelties, the other their late violence. They obeyed the orders of the general to proceed towards London. Adrian was obliged to exert his utmost prudence first to allay the discord, and then to provide for the multitude of the invaders. They were marched to various parts of the southern counties, quartered in deserted villages. A part were sent back to their own island, while the season of winter so far revived our energy that the passes of the country were defended and any increase of numbers prohibited. On this occasion, Adrian and Idris met after a separation of nearly a year. Adrian had been occupied in fulfilling a laborious and painful task. He had been familiar with every species of human misery and had forever found his powers inadequate, his aid of small avail. Yet the purpose of his soul, his energy and ardent resolution prevented any reaction of sorrow. He seemed born anew and virtue, more potent than Median alchemy, endued him with health and strength. Idris hardly recognized the fragile being whose form had seemed to bend even to the summer breeze in the energetic man whose very excess of sensibility rendered him more capable of fulfilling his station of pilot in storm-tossed England. It was not thus with Idris. She was uncomplaining, but the very soul of fear had taken its seat in her heart. She had grown thin and pale, her eyes filled with involuntary tears, her voice was broken and low. She tried to throw a veil over the change which she knew her brother must observe in her, but the effort was ineffectual, and when alone with him, with a burst of irrepressible grief, she gave vent to her apprehensions and sorrow. She described in vivid terms the ceaseless care that with still renewing hunger ate into her soul. She compared this gnawing of sleepless expectation of evil to the vulture that fed on the heart of Prometheus. Under the influence of this eternal excitement and of the interminable struggles she endured to combat and conceal it, she felt, she said, as if all the wheels and springs of the animal machine worked at double rate and were fast consuming themselves. Sleep was not sleep, for her waking thoughts, bridled by some remains of reason, and by the sight of her children happy and in health, were then transformed to wild dreams. All her terrors were realized, all her fears received their dread fulfillment. To this state there was no hope, no alleviation, unless the grave should quickly receive its destined prey, and she be permitted to die before she experienced a thousand living deaths in the loss of those she loved. Fearing to give me pain, she hid as best she could the excess of her wretchedness, but meeting thus her brother after a long absence, she could not restrain the expression of her woe, but with all the vividness of imagination with which misery is always replete, she poured out the emotions of her heart to her beloved and sympathizing Adrian. 
Her present visit to London tended to augment her state of inquietude by shewing in its utmost extent the ravages occasioned by pestilence. It hardly preserved the appearance of an inhabited city. Grass sprung up thick in the streets. The squares were weed-grown, the houses were shut up, while silence and loneliness characterized the busiest parts of the town. Yet in the midst of desolation, Adrian had preserved order, and each one continued to live according to law and custom, human institutions thus surviving as it were divine ones, and while the decree of population was abrogated, property continued sacred. It was a melancholy reflection, and in spite of the diminution of evil produced, it struck on the heart as a wretched mockery. All idea of resort for pleasure, of theatres and festivals, had passed away. Next summer, said Adrian, as we parted on our return to Windsor, will decide the fate of the human race. I shall not pause in my exertions until that time, but if plague revives with the coming year, all contest with her must cease, and our only occupation be the choice of a grave. I must not forget one incident that occurred during this visit to London. The visits of Merivale to Windsor, before frequent, had suddenly ceased. At this time, where but a hair's line separated the living from the dead, I feared that our friend had become a victim to the all-embracing evil. On this occasion, I went, dreading the worst, to his dwelling, to see if I could be of any service to those of his family who might have survived. The house was deserted, and had been one of those assigned to the invading strangers quartered in London. I saw his astronomical instruments put to strange uses, his globes defaced, his papers covered with abstruse calculations destroyed. The neighbours could tell me little, till I lighted on a poor woman who acted as nurse in these perilous times. She told me that all the family were dead, except Merivale himself, who had gone mad. Mad, she called it. Yet on questioning her further, it appeared that he was possessed only by the delirium of excessive grief. This old man, tottering on the edge of the grave, and prolonging his prospect through millions of calculated years, this visionary who had not seen starvation in the wasted forms of his wife and children, or plague in the horrible sights and sounds that surrounded him. This astronomer, apparently dead on earth, and living only in the motion of the spheres, loved his family with unapparent but intense affection. Through long habit they had become a part of himself, his want of worldly knowledge, his absence of mind and infant guilelessness made him utterly dependent on them. It was not till one of them died that he perceived their danger. One by one they were carried off by pestilence, and his wife, his helpmate and supporter, more necessary to him than his own limbs and frame, which had hardly been taught the lesson of self-preservation, the kind companion whose voice always spoke peace to him, closed her eyes in death. The old man felt the system of universal nature which he had so long studied and adored slide from under him, and he stood among the dead and lifted his voice in curses. No wonder that the attendant should interpret as frenzy the harrowing maledictions of the grief-struck old man. I had commenced my search late in the day, a November day, that closed in early with pattering rain and melancholy wind. As I turned from the door, I saw Merivale, or rather the shadow of Merivale, attenuated and wild, pass me and sit on the steps of his home. The breeze scattered the grey locks on his temples, the rain drenched his uncovered head, he sat hiding his face in his withered hands. I pressed his shoulder to awaken his attention, but he did not alter his position. Merivale, I said, it is long since we have seen you. You must return to Windsor with me. Lady Idris desires to see you. You will not refuse her request. Come home with me. He replied in a hollow voice, Why deceive a helpless old man? Why talk hypocritically to one half-crazed? Windsor is not my home, my true home I have found, the home that the Creator has prepared for me. His accent of bitter scorn thrilled me. Do not tempt me to speak, he continued. My words would scare you. In an universe of cowards, I dare think, among the churchyard tombs, among the victims of his merciless tyranny, I dare reproach the supreme evil. How can he punish me 
Let him bear his arm and transfix me with lightning. This is also one of his attributes. And the old man laughed. He rose, and I followed him through the rain to a neighboring churchyard. He threw himself on the wet earth. Here they are, he cried, beautiful creatures, breathing, speaking, loving creatures. She who by day and night cherish the age-worn lover of her youth, they, parts of my flesh, my children, here they are. Call them, scream their names through the night. They will not answer. He clung to the little heaps that marked the graves. I ask but one thing. I do not fear his hell, for I have it here. I do not desire his heaven. Let me but die and be laid beside them. Let me but, when I lie dead, feel my flesh as it moulders, mingle with theirs. Promise. And he raised himself painfully and seized my arm. Promise to bury me with them. So God help me and mine as I promise, I replied, on one condition. Return with me to Windsor. To Windsor, he cried with a shriek. Never. From this place I never go. My bones, my flesh, I myself are already buried here, and what you see of me is corrupted clay like them. I will lie here and cling here till rain and hail and lightning and storm ruining on me make me one in substance with them below. In a few words I must conclude this tragedy. I was obliged to leave London, and Adrian undertook to watch over him. The task was soon fulfilled. Age, grief, and inclement weather all united to hush his sorrows and bring repose to his heart whose beats were agony. He died embracing the sod which was piled above his breast when he was placed beside the beings whom he regretted with such wild despair. I returned to Windsor at the wish of Idris, who seemed to think that there was greater safety for her children at that spot, and because, once having taken on me the guardianship of the district, I would not desert it while an inhabitant survived. I went also to act in conformity with Adrian's plans which was to congregate in masses what remained of the population, for he possessed the conviction that it was only through the benevolent and social virtues that any safety was to be hoped for the remnant of mankind. It was a melancholy thing to return to this spot so dear to us as the scene of a happiness rarely before enjoyed, here to mark the extinction of our species and trace the deep, unerasable footsteps of disease over the fertile and cherished soil. The aspect of the country had so far changed that it had been impossible to enter on the task of sowing seed and other autumnal labours. That season was now gone, and winter had set in with sudden and unusual severity. Alternate frosts and thaws succeeding to floods rendered the country impassable. Heavy falls of snow gave an arctic appearance to the scenery. The roofs of the houses peeped from the white mass. The lowly cot and stately mansion, alike deserted, were blocked up, their thresholds uncleared. The windows were broken by the hail, while the prevalence of a northeast wind rendered outdoor exertions extremely painful. The altered state of society made these accidents of nature sources of real misery. The luxury of command and the attentions of servitude were lost. It is true that the necessaries of life were assembled in such quantities as to supply to superfluity the wants of the diminished population. But still, much labour was required to arrange these, as it were, raw materials. And depressed by sickness and fearful of the future, we had not energy to enter boldly and decidedly on any system. I can speak for myself. Want of energy was not my failing. The intense life that quickened my pulses and animated my frame had the effect not of drawing me into the mazes of active life, but of exalting my lowliness and of bestowing majestic proportions on insignificant objects. I could have lived the life of a peasant in the same way. My trifling occupations were swelled into important pursuits. My affections were impetuous and engrossing passions, and nature with all her changes was invested in divine attributes. The very spirit of the Greek mythology inhabited my heart. I deified the uplands, glades and streams I had sight of Proteus coming from the sea. 
and heard old Triton blow his wreathed horn. Strange that while the earth preserved her monotonous course, I dwelt with ever-renewing wonder on her antique laws, and now that with eccentric wheels she rushed into an untried path, I should feel this spirit fade. I struggled with despondency and weariness, but like a fog, they choked me. Perhaps after the labours and stupendous excitement of the past summer, the calm of winter and the almost menial toils it brought with it were by natural reaction doubly irksome. It was not the grasping passion of the preceding year which gave life and individuality to each moment. It was not the aching pangs induced by the distresses of the times. The utter inutility that had attended all my exertions took from them their usual effects of exhilaration, and despair rendered abortive the balm of self-applause. I longed to return to my old occupations, but of what use were they? To read were futile, to write vanity indeed. The earth, late wide circus for the display of dignified exploits, vast theatre for a magnificent drama, now presented a vacant space, an empty stage. For actor or spectator there was no longer aught to say or hear. Our little town of Windsor, in which the survivors from the neighbouring counties were chiefly assembled, wore a melancholy aspect. Its streets were blocked up with snow, the few passengers seemed palsied and frozen by the ungenial visitation of winter. To escape these evils was the aim and scope of all our exertions. Families late devoted to exalting and refined pursuits, rich, blooming and young, with diminished numbers and care-fraught hearts, huddled over a fire, grown selfish and groveling through suffering. Without the aid of servants, it was necessary to discharge all household duties. Hands unused to such labour must knead the bread, or in the absence of flour, the statesman or perfumed courtier must undertake the butcher's office. Poor and rich were now equal, or rather the poor were the superior, since they entered on such tasks with alacrity and experience. While ignorance, inaptitude and habits of repose rendered them fatiguing to the luxurious, galling to the proud, disgustful to all whose minds, bent on intellectual improvement, held it their dearest privilege to be exempt from attending to mere animal wants. But in every change, goodness and affection can find field for exertion and display. Among some, these changes produced a devotion and sacrifice of self at once graceful and heroic. It was a sight for the lovers of the human race to enjoy, to behold, as in ancient times, the patriarchal modes in which the variety of kindred and friendship fulfilled their duteous and kindly offices. Youths, nobles of the land, performed for the sake of mother or sister the services of menials with amiable cheerfulness. They went to the river to break the ice and draw water. They assembled on foraging expeditions, or axe in hand, felled the trees for fuel. The females received them on their return with the simple and affectionate welcome known before only to the lowly cottage, a clean hearth and bright fire, the supper ready cooked by beloved hands, gratitude for the provision for tomorrow's meal, strange enjoyments for the high-born English, yet they were now their sole hard-earned and dearly prized luxuries. None was more conspicuous for this graceful submission to circumstances, noble humility, and ingenious fancy to adorn such acts with romantic colouring than our own Clara. She saw my despondency and the aching cares of Idris. Her perpetual study was to relieve us from labour and to spread ease and even elegance over our altered mode of life. We still had some attendants spared by disease and warmly attached to us. But Clara was jealous of their services. She would be sole handmaid of Idris, sole minister to the wants of her little cousins. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as our employing her in this way. She went beyond our desires, earnest, diligent, and unwearied. Abra was ready ere we called her name, and though we called another, Abra came. It was my task each day to visit the various families assembled in our town, and when the weather permitted, I was glad to prolong my ride, 
and to muse in solitude over every changeful appearance of our destiny, endeavouring to gather lessons for the future from the experience of the past. The impatience with which, while in society, the ills that afflicted my species inspired me were softened by loneliness, when individual suffering was merged in the general calamity, strange to say, less afflicting to contemplate. Thus often, pushing my way with difficulty through the narrow snow-block town, I crossed the bridge and passed through Eton. No youthful congregation of gallant-hearted boys thronged the portal of the college. Sad silence pervaded the busy schoolroom and noisy playground. I extended my ride towards Salt Hill, on every side impeded by the snow. Were those the fertile fields I loved? Was that the interchange of gentle upland and cultivated dale, once covered with waving corn, diversified by stately trees, watered by the meandering Thames? One sheet of white covered it, while bitter recollection told me that cold as the winter-clothed earth were the hearts of the inhabitants. I met troops of horses, herds of cattle, flocks of sheep wandering at will, here throwing down a hayrick and nestling from cold in its heart, which afforded them shelter and food, there having taken possession of a vacant cottage. Once on a frosty day, pushed on by restless, unsatisfying reflections, I sought a favourite haunt, a little wood not far distant from Salt Hill. A bubbling spring prattles over stones on one side, and a plantation of a few elms and beeches hardly deserve, and yet continue the name of wood. This spot had for me peculiar charms. It had been a favourite resort of Adrian. It was secluded, and he often said that in boyhood his happiest hours were spent here. Having escaped the stately bondage of his mother, he sat on the rough hewn steps that led to the spring, now reading a favourite book, now musing, with speculation beyond his years, on the still unravelled skein of morals or metaphysics. A melancholy foreboding assured me that I should never see this place more, so with careful thought I noted each tree every winding of the streamlet and irregularity of the soil that I might better call up its idea in absence. A robin red breast dropped from the frosty branches of the trees upon the congealed rivulet. Its panting breast and half-closed eyes shewed that it was dying. A hawk appeared in the air. Sudden fear seized the little creature. It exerted its last strength, throwing itself on its back, raising its talons in impotent defence against its powerful enemy. I took it up and placed it in my breast. I fed it with a few crumbs from a biscuit. By degrees it revived. Its warm, fluttering heart beat against me. I cannot tell why I detail this trifling incident, but the scene is still before me. The snow-clad fields seen through the silvered trunks of the beeches, the brook, in days of happiness alive with sparkling waters now choked by ice, the leafless trees fantastically dressed in hoar-frost, the shapes of summer leaves imaged by winter's frozen hand on the hard ground, the dusky sky, drear cold and unbroken silence, while close in my bosom my feathered nursling lay warm and safe, speaking its content with a light chirp. Painful reflections thronged, stirring my brain with wild commotion. Cold and death-like as the snowy fields was all earth, misery-stricken the lifetide of the inhabitants. Why should I oppose the cataract of destruction that swept us away? Why string my nerves and renew my wearied efforts? Ah, why? But that my firm courage and cheerful exertions might shelter the dear mate whom I chose in the spring of my life, Though the throbbings of my heart be replete with pain, though my hopes for the future are chill, still, while your dear head, my gentlest love, can repose in peace on that heart, and while you derive from its fostering care, comfort, and hope, my struggles shall not cease. I will not call myself altogether vanquished. One fine February day, when the sun had reassumed some of its genial power, I walked in the forest with my family. It was one of those lovely winter days which assert the capacity of nature to bestow beauty on barrenness. The leafless trees spread their fibrous branches against the pure sky, 
Their intricate and pervious tracery resembled delicate seaweed. The deer were turning up the snow in search of the hidden grass. The white was made intensely dazzling by the sun, and trunks of the trees, rendered more conspicuous by the loss of preponderating foliage, gathered around like the labyrinthine columns of a vast temple. It was impossible not to receive pleasure from the sight of these things. Our children, freed from the bondage of winter, bounded before us, pursuing the deer, or rousing the pheasants and partridges from their coverts. Idris leant on my arm. Her sadness yielded to the present sense of pleasure. We met other families on the long walk, enjoying, like ourselves, the return of the genial season. At once, I seemed to awake. I cast off the clinging sloth of the past months. Earth assumed a new appearance, and my view of the future was suddenly made clear. I exclaimed, I have now found out the secret. What secret? In answer to this question, I described our gloomy winter life, our sordid cares, our menial labours. This northern country, I said, is no place for our diminished race. When mankind were few, it was not here that they battled with the powerful agents of nature and were enabled to cover the globe with offspring. We must seek some natural paradise, some garden of the earth, where our simple wants may be easily supplied and the enjoyment of a delicious climate compensate for the social pleasures we have lost. If we survive this coming summer, I will not spend the ensuing winter in England, neither I nor any of us. I spoke without much heed, and the very conclusion of what I said brought with it other thoughts. Should we, any of us, survive the coming summer? I saw the brow of Idris clouded. I again felt that we were enchained to the car of fate, over whose courses we had no control. We could no longer say, this we will do, and this we will leave undone. A mightier power than the human was at hand to destroy our plans or to achieve the work we avoided. It were madness to calculate upon another winter. This was our last. The coming summer was the extreme end of our vista, and when we arrived there, instead of a continuation of the long road, a gulf yawned into which we must of force be precipitated. The last blessing of humanity was wrested from us. We might no longer hope. Can the madman, as he clanks his chains, hope? Can the wretch, led to the scaffold, who when he lays his head on the block, marks the double shadow of himself and the executioner whose uplifted arm bears the axe, hope? Can the shipwrecked mariner, who spent with swimming, he is close behind the splashing waters, divided by a shark, which pursues him through the Atlantic. Hope? Such hope as theirs we also may entertain. Old fable tells us that this gentle spirit sprung from the box of Pandora, else crammed with evils. But these were unseen and null, while all admired the inspiriting loveliness of young hope. Each man's heart became her home. She was enthroned sovereign of our lives, here and hereafter. She was deified and worshipped, declared incorruptible and everlasting. But like all other gifts of the Creator to man, she is mortal. Her life has attained its last hour. We have watched over her, nursed her flickering existence. Now she has fallen at once from youth to decrepitude, from health to immedicinable disease. Even as we spend ourselves in struggles for her recovery, she dies. To all nations the voice goes forth, hope is dead. We are but mourners in the funeral train, and what immortal essence or perishable creation will refuse to make one in the sad procession that attends to its grave the dead comforter of humanity? Does not the sun call in his light, and day, like a thin exhalation, melt away? both wrapping up their beams in clouds to be themselves close mourners at this obsequy. Hey, sci-fi horror fans, that concludes Volume 2 of The Last Man. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss Volume 3, which will come out in November. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. A huge shout-out goes to our official members of the channel. We appreciate you all. Craving for another classic sci-fi tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.